Chapter One of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Saloni Mori. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter One. I sail as second mate in the Saracen. I will pass by all the explanations concerning the reasons of my going to sea, as I do not desire to forfeit your kind patience by letting the story stand. Enough if I say that after I had been fairly well grounded in English, arithmetic, and the like, which plain education I have never wearied of improving by reading everything good that came in my way, I was bound apprentice to a respectable man named Joshua Cox, of Whitby, and served my time in his vessel, the Laughing Susan, a brave, nimble brigantine. We traded to Riga, Stockholm, and Baltic ports, and often to Rotterdam, where having a quick ear, which has sometimes served me for playing upon the fiddle for my mates to dance or sing to, I picked up enough of Dutch to enable me to hold my own in conversing with a Hollander, or Hans Butterbox as those people used to be called. That is to say, I had sufficient words at command to qualify me to follow what was said and to answer so as to be intelligible. The easier, since uncouth as that language is, there is so much of it resembling ours in sound that many words in it might easily pass for portions of our tongue grossly and ludicrously articulated. Why I mention this will hereafter appear. When my apprenticeship term had expired, I made two voyages as second mate, and then obtained an appointment to that post in a ship named the Saracen, for a voyage to the East Indies. This was anno 1796. I was then two and twenty years of age, a tall, well-built young fellow with tawny hair, of the mariner's complexion from the high suns I had sailed under, and the hardening gales I had stared into, with dark blue eyes filled with the light of an easy and naturally merry heart white teeth very regular and a glad expression as though forsooth i found something gay and to like in all that i looked at indeed it was a saying with my mother that jeff meaning jeffrey that jeff's appearance was as though a very little joke would set the full measure of his spirits overflowing the master of the saracen was one jacob skevington and the mate's name christopher hall we sailed from gravesend for with whitby i was now done in the month of April, 1796. We were told to look to ourselves when we should arrive in the neighborhood of the Cape of Good Hope, for it was rumored that the Dutch, with the help of the French, were likely to send a squadron to recover Cape Town that had fallen into the hands of the British in the previous September. However, at the time of our lifting our anchor off Gravesend, the Cape settlement lay on the other side of the globe, Whatever danger there might be there was too remote to cast the least faint shadow upon us. Besides, the sailor was so used to the perils of the enemy and the chase that nothing could put an element of uneasiness into his plain shipboard life, short of the assurance of his own or his captain's eyes that the sail that had hauled his wind and was fast growing upon the sea line was undeniably an enemy ship, heavily armed and big enough to cannonade him into staves. So with resolved spirits, which many of us had cheered and hardened by a few farewell drams, for of all parts of the seafaring life, the saying goodbye to those we love, and whom the God of heaven alone knows whether we shall ever clasp to our breasts again, is the hardest. We plied the capstan with a will, raising the anchor to a chorus that fetched an echo from the river's bank, up and down the reach, and then sheeting home our topsails, dragging upon the halyards with piercing, far-sounding songs, we gathered the weight of the pleasant sunny wind into those spacious hollows, and in a few minutes had started upon our long journey. End of chapter 1all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begeman, Somerville, South Carolina. 
the death ship by william clark russell chapter two we meet and speak the lovely nancy snow for days and days after we had cleared the channel and entered upon those deep waters which off soundings sway in brilliant blue billows sometimes paling into faint azure or weltering in dyes as purely dark as the violet according as the mood of the sky is nothing whatever of consequence befell we were forty of a company captain skevington was a stout but sedate sailor who had used the sea for many years and had confronted so many perils there was scarce an ocean danger you could name about which he could not talk from personal experience he was likewise a man of education and intelligence with a manner about him at times not very intelligible though his temper was always excellent and his skill as a seaman equal to every call made upon it we carried six twelve-pounders and four brass swivels and a plentiful store of small arms and ammunition our ship was five years old a good sailor handsomely found in all respects of sails and tackling so that any prospect we might contemplate of falling in with privateers and such gentry troubled us little since with a brave ship and nimble heels high hot hearts english cannon and jolly british beef for the working of them the mariner need never doubt that the lord will own him wherever he may go and whatever he may do we crossed the equator in longitude thirty degrees west then braced up to the trade wind that healed us with a brisk gale in five degrees south latitude and so skirted the sea in that great african bight twixt cape palmas and the cape of good hope formerly called and very properly i think the ethiopic ocean for though to be sure it is all atlantic ocean yet methinks it is as fully entitled to a distinctive appellation as is the bay of biscay that is equally one sea with that which rolls into it one morning in july we being then somewhat south of the latitude of the island of st helena a seaman who was on the topsail yard hailed the deck and cried out there was a sail right ahead we waited with much expectation and some anxiety for the stranger to approach near enough to enable us to gather her character or even her nationality for the experienced eye will always observe a something in the ships of the dutch and french nations to distinguish the flags they belong to it was soon evident that she was standing directly for us shown by the speed with which her sails rose but when her hull was fairly exposed captain skevington after a careful examination of her declared her to be a vessel of about two hundred tons probably a snow her mainmast being in one with her foremast and so we stood on leaving it to her to be wary if she chose after a little the english ensign was seen to flutter at her fore topgallant masthead to this signal we instantly replied by hoisting our color and shortly after midday arriving abreast of each other we backed our topsail yard she doing the like and so we lay steady upon the calm sea and so close that we could see the faces of her people over the rail and hear the sound though not the words of the voice of the master giving his orders it was captain skevington's intention to board her as he suspected she was from the indies 
and capable therefore of giving us some hints concerning the dutch into whose waters in a manner of speaking we were now entering accordingly the jolly boat was lowered and pulled away for the stranger that proved to be the snow lovely nancy of plymouth name of cruel omen as i shall always deem it though i must ever love the name of nancy as being that of a fair-haired sister who died in her fifteenth year i know not why i should have stood looking very longingly at that plymouth ship whilst our captain was on board her for though to be sure we had now been at sea since april whilst she was homeward bound yet i was well satisfied with the saracen and all on board i was glad to be getting a living and earning in wages money enough to put away my dream being to save so much as would procure me an interest in a ship for out of such slender beginnings have sprung many renowned merchant princes in this country but so it was my heart yearned for that snow as though i had a sweetheart on board even mr hall the mate a plain literal practical seaman with as much sentiment in him as you may find in the first dutchman you meet in the amsterdam fish market even he noticed my wistful eyes and clapping me on the back cried out why fenton my lad i believe you'd be glad to go home in that little wagon yonder if the captain would let ye i believe i would sir i replied and yet if i could i don't know that i would either he laughed and turned away ridiculing what he reckoned a piece of ladylike sentiment and that it was no more i dare say i was as sure as he though i wished the depression at the devil for it caused me to feel whilst it was chapter three of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina the death ship by william clark russell chapter three the captain and i talk of the death ship after three-quarters of an hour or thereabouts captain skevington returned we then trimmed to our course again and ere long the plymouth snow was astern of us rolling her spread of canvas in a saluting way that was like a flourish of farewell whilst the jolly boat was being hoisted the captain stood gazing at the snow with a very thoughtful face and then burying his hands in his pockets he took several turns up and down the deck with his head bowed and his whole manner not a little grave he presently went to the mate and talked with him but it looked as though mr hall found little to raise concern in what the captain said as he often smiled and once or twice broke into a laugh that seemed to provoke a kind of remonstrance from the master who yet acted as though he were but half in earnest too but they stood too far away for me to catch a syllable of their talk it was my watch below at eight o'clock that evening i was sitting alone in the cabin sipping a glass of rum and water ready to go to bed when i had swallowed the dose there was but one lamp hanging from a midship beam and the cabin was somewhat darksome the general gloom was deepened by the bulkhead being of a sombre walnut color without any relief such as probably would have been furnished had we carried passengers from table-glass or silver or such furniture 
i mentioned these matters because they gave their complexion to the talk i am now to repeat presently down into this interior through the companion hatch comes captain skevington i drained my glass and rose to withdraw stop a minute fenton says he what have you been drinking there i told him another drop can't hurt you said he you have four hours to sleep it off in with which he called to the boy to bring him a bottle of brandy from his cabin he bid me help myself whilst he lighted a pipe of tobacco and then said the master of the snow we met to-day warns us to keep a bright lookout for the dutch he told me that yesterday he spoke an american ship that was short of flour and learnt from the yankee though how jonathan got the news i don't know but there's a dutch squadron making for the cape in charge of admiral lucas and that among the ships is the dordrecht of sixty-six guns and two forty-gun frigates but should we fall in with them will they meddle with us do you think sir said i beyond question he answered then said i there is nothing for it but to keep a sharp lookout we have heels anyway he smoked his pipe with a serious face as though not heeding me then looking at me steadfastly he exclaimed fenton you've been a bit of a reader in your time i believe did your appetite that way ever bring you to dip into magic necromancy the black art and the like of such stuff he asked me this with a certain strangeness of expression in his eyes and i thought it proper to fall into his humor so i replied that in the course of my reading i might have come across hints of such things but that i had given them too little attention to qualify me to reason about them or to form an opinion i recollect when i was a lad said he passing my answer by so to speak hearing an old lady that was related to my mother tell of a trick that was formerly practised and credited to a person stood at a grave and invoked the dead who made answer i smiled thinking that only an old woman would talk like thus stop cried he but without temper she said it was common for a necromancer to invoke and obtain replies but that though answers were returned they were not spoken by the dead but by the devil the proof being that death is a separation of the soul from the body that the immortal soul cannot inhabit the corpse that is mere dust that therefore the dead cannot speak themselves but that the voices which seem to proceed from them are uttered by the evil one why the evil one said i because he delights in whatever is out of nature and in doing violence to the harmonious fabric of the universe that sounds like a good argument sir said i still smiling but continued he suppose the case of men now living though by the laws of nature they should have died long since would you say that they exist as a corpse does when invoked that is by the possession and voice of the devil or that they are informed by the same souls which were in them when they uttered their first cry in this life why sir i answered seeing that the soul is immortal there is no reason why it should not go on inhabiting the clay it belongs to so long as that clay continues to possess the physical power to be moved and controlled by it that's a shrewd view said he seemingly well pleased but see here my lad our bodies are built to last threescore and ten years some linger to a hundred 
but so few beyond that every month of continued being renders them more and more a sort of prodigies as the end of a long life approaches say a life of ninety years there is such decay such dry rot that the whole frame is but one remove from ashes now suppose there should be men living who are known to be at least a hundred and fifty years old nay add an average of forty to each man and call them one hundred and ninety years old but who yet exhibit no signs of mortality would not you say that the bounds of nature having been long since passed their bodies are virtually corpses imitating life by a semblance of soul that is properly the voice and possession of the devil how about methuselah and others of those ancient times i'm talking of to-day he answered tis like turning up the soil to work back into ancient history you come across things which there's no making anything of but what man is there now living who has reached to a hundred and ninety cried i still struck by his look yet in spite of that wondering at his gravity for there was a determination in his manner of reasoning that made me see he was in earnest well said he smoking very slowly the master of that snow one samuel bullock of rotherhith whom i recollect as a mate of a privateer some time since told me that when he was off the agulas bank he made out a sail upon his starboard bow braced up and standing west sou west there was something so unusual and surprising about her rig that the probability of her being an enemy went clean out of his mind and he held on influenced by the sort of curiosity a man might feel who follows a sheeted figure at night not liking the job yet constrained to it by sheer force of unnatural relish twas the first dog watch the sun drawing down but daylight was yet abroad when the stranger was within hail upon their starboard quarter keeping a close luff yet points off on account of the antique fit of her canvas bullock as he talked fell a-trembling though no stouter-hearted man sails the ocean and i could see the memory of the thing working in him like a bloody conscience he cried out may the bountiful god grant that my ship reaches home in safety i said what vessel was she think you why captain says he what but the vessel which tis god's will should continue sailing about these seas i started to hear this and asked if he saw any of the crew he replied that only two men were to be seen one steering at a long tiller on the poop deck and the other pacing near him on the weather side i seized the glass said he and knelt down that those i viewed should not observe me and plainly catched the face of him who walked how did bullock describe him sir said i he said he wore a great beard and was very tall and that he was like a man that had died and that when dug up preserved his death-bed aspect he was like such a corpse artificially animated and most terrible to behold from his suggestions of death in life i pressed him to tell me more but he is a person scanty of words for the want of learning however his fears were the clearest relation he could give me of what he had seen it was the phantom ship he saw you think sir said i i am sure he bid me dread the sight of it more than the combined navies of the french and the dutch 
the apparition was encountered in latitude twenty miles south of thirty six degrees tis a spectre to be shunned fenton though it cost us every rag of sail we own to keep clear then what you would say captain said i is that the people who work that ship have ceased to be living men by reason of their great age which exceeds by many years our body's capacity of wear and tear and that they are actually corpses influenced by the devil who is warranted by the same divine permission we find recorded in the book of job to pursue frightful and unholy ends it is the only rational view he answered if the phantom ship be still afloat and navigated by a crew they cannot be men in the sense that this ship's company are men well sir said i cheerfully i reckon it will be all one whether they be fiends or flesh and blood miraculously wrought to last unto the world's end for it is a million to nothing that we don't meet her the southern ocean is a mighty sea a ship is but a little speck and once we get the madagascar coast on our bow we shall be out of the death ship's preserves however to my surprise i found that he maintained a very earnest posture of mind in this matter to begin with he did not in the least question the existence of the dutch craft he had never beheld her but he knew those who had and related tales of dismal issues of such encounters the notion that the crew were corpses animated into a mocking similitude of life was strongly infixed in his mind and he obliged me to tell him all that i could remember of magical ghostly supernatural circumstances i had read about or heard of until i noticed it was half an hour after nine and that at this rate my watch on deck would come round before i had had a wink of sleep however though i went to my cabin it was not to rest i lay for nearly two hours wide awake no doubt the depression i had marked in myself had exactly fitted my mind for such fancies as the captain had talked about it was indeed impossible that i should soberly accept his extraordinary view touching the endevilment of the crew of the death ship moreover i hope i am too good a christian to believe in that satyr which was the coinage of crazy fanatical heads in the dark ages that cheaply imagined foul fiend created to terrify the weak-minded with a vision of split hoofs legs like a beast's a barbed tail flaming eyes and nostrils discharging the sickening fumes of sulphur but concerning the phantom ship herself the flying dutchman as she had been styled tis a spectre that has too often crossed the path of the mariner to admit of its existence being questioned if there be spirits on land why not at sea too there are scores who believe in apparitions not on the evidence of their own eyes they may never have beheld such a sight but on the testimony of witnesses sound in their religion and of unassailable integrity and why should we not accept the assurance of plain honest sailors that there may be occasionally encountered off the agulas bank and upon the southern and eastern coast of the african extremity a wild and ancient fabric rigged after a fashion long fallen into disuse and manned by a crew figured as presenting something of the aspect of death 
in their unholy and monstrous vitality i turned this matter freely over in my mind as i lay in my little cabin my thoughts finding a melancholy musical setting in the melodious sobbing of water washing past under the open port and snatching distressful impulses from the gloom about me that was rendered cloud-like by the moon who was climbing above our mastheads and clothing the vast placid scene outside with the beauty of her icy light and then at seven bells fell asleep but was called half an hour later at midnight to relieve chapter four of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the death ship by william clark russell chapter four we are chased and nearly captured we talked occasionally of the phantom ship after this for a few days the captain on one occasion to my surprise producing an old volume on magic and sorcery which it seems he had along with an odd collection of books in his cabin and arguing and reasoning out of it but he never spoke of this thing in the presence of the mate who to be sure was a simple downright man without the least imaginable flavor of imagination to render sapid the lean austerity of his thoughts and who therefore as you may suppose as little credited the stories told of the dutchman's ship as the ebrew jew believes in our lord hence as there were but the captain and me to keep this shuttlecock of a fancy flying it fluttered before long to the ground perhaps the quicker because on the sunday following our speaking with the plymouth snow there happened a piece of work sharp and real enough to drive all ideas of visions and phantasms out of our heads it was ten o'clock in the morning when a sail was descried broad on the larboard beam it was not long before we made out that the vessel down in the eastern quarter was steering large and at the time the appearance of her canvas assured us of this she slackened away her larboard braces to head up for us hauling upon a bowline with a suddenness that left her intention to parley with us questionless we hoisted the english ensign and held on a bit viewing her with an intentness that brought many of our eyes to a squint then the captain observing that she showed no colors and was a big ship put his helm up for a run no sooner had we braced in our yards when the fellow behind us squared away too and threw out lower and topmast studding sails with a rapidity that satisfied us she was a man of war apparently a liner this notion joined to the belief that she was a dutchman was start enough for us all our small company were not likely to hold their own against the disciplined masses of a two or three decker even though she should prove a spaniard our guns were too few to do anything with tiers of batteries heavy enough to blow us out of water so as there was nothing for it but a fair trial of speed we sprung to our work like hounds newly unleashed got her dead before it ran out studding sail booms on both sides and sent the sails aloft soaking wet for the serviceableness of the weight the wetness would give and stationing men in the tops and cross trees we whipped up buckets of water to them with which they drenched the canvas till our cloths must have looked as dark as a collier's to the ship astern of us it was very slow work at first and we were thankful for that for every hour carried us nearer to the night into which the moon now entered so late and glowed with such little power even when she had floated high 
that we could count after sundown upon several hours of darkness but it was not long before it became evident to us all that spite of the ceaseless wetting of our sails the ship in our wake was growing then satisfied of her superiority and convinced of our nationality she let fly a forecastle gun at us of the ball of which we saw nothing and hoisted the dutch colors at her four royal masthead where at all events we could not fail to distinguish the flag confound such luck cries skevington at this how can our apple bows contend with those pyramids of sails there what's to be done he says as if thinking aloud it's clear she's our master in running and i fear she'll be more than our match on a bowline with the weather gauge too and yet by the thunder of heaven mr hall it does go against the current of any sort of english blood to haul down that piece of bunting there says he casting his eyes at the peak where our flag was blowing to the command of a dutchman's cannon the wind's coming away more easterly said the mate with a slow turning of his gaze into the quarter he mentioned and it'll be breezing up presently if there's any signification in the darker blue of the sea that way it happened as he said but the dutchman got the first slant of it and you saw the harder pulling of his canvas in the rounded rigidity of light upon the cloths whilst the dusky line of the wind followed by the flashings of the small seas whose leaping heads it showered into spray was yet approaching our languid ship whose lower and heavy canvas often flapped in the weak air a couple of shot came flying after us from the man-of-war's bow chasers ere the breeze swept to our spars and now the silvery line of the white water that her stem was hewing up and sending in a brilliant whirl past her was easy do be seen ay twas even possible to make out the very lines of her reef points upon the forecourse and topsail whilst through the glass you could discern groups of men stationed upon her forecastle and mark some quarter-deck figure now and again impatiently bound on to the rail and overhang it like a davit with an arm round a backstay in his eagerness to see how fast they were coming up with us the excitement of this chase was deep in us when the captain gave orders to train a couple of guns aft and to continue firing at the pursuing craft which was done the powder smoke blowing like prodigious glistening cobwebs into our canvas forward meanwhile the english colors flew heartily at our peak whilst preventer braces were clapped on the swinging booms and other gear added to give strength aloft for the wind was increasing as if by magic the ribbed clouds had broken up and large bodies of vapor were sailing overhead with many ivory white shoulders crowding upon the horizon and the strain upon the studding sail tacks was extremely heavy but you saw that it was captain skevington's intention to make the saracen drag what she could not carry and to let what chose blow away before he started a rope yarn whilst we had that monster astern there sticking to our skirts and by this time it was manifest that with real weight in the wind our heels were pretty nearly as keen as hers which made us hope that should the breeze freshen yet we might eventually get away well at three o'clock it was blowing down right hard though the weather was fine the heavens mottled the clouds being compacted and sailing higher stormy in complexion and moving slowly the sea had grown hollow and was most gloriously violet in color with plumes of snow which curled to the gale on the head of each liquid courser the sun was over our fore top-gallant yard-arm and showered down his glory so as to form a golden weltering road for us to steer beside the ship behind catched his light and looked to be chasing us on wings of yellow silk but never since her keel had been laid had the saracen been so driven 
the waters boiled up to the black-faced turban figure under the bow sprit and from aft i could sometimes observe the glassy curve of the bow sea arching away for fathoms forward showing plain through the head-rails a couple of hands hung grinding upon the wheel with set teeth and the sinews in their naked arms stood out like cords others were at the relieving tackles and through it we pelted raising about us a bubbled spuming and hissing surface that might have answered to the passage of a whirlwind repeatedly firing at the dutch man-of-war when the heave of the surge gave us the chance and noticing the constant flash in his bows and the white smother that blew along with him though the balls of neither appeared to touch the other of us yet that we should have been ultimately overhauled and brought to a stand i fully believe but for a providential disaster for no matter how dark the dusk may have drawn around at sundown the dutchman was too close to us to miss the loom of the great press of canvas we should be forced to carry at least so i hold and then again there was the consideration of the wind failing us with the coming of the stars for we were still in the gentle parallels but let all have been as it might i had just noted the lightning-like wink of one of the enemy's forechasers when to my exceeding amazement ere the ball of smoke could be shredded into lengths by the gale i observed the whole fabric of the dutchman's towering foremast with the great course swelling topsail topgallant sail and royal and the four topmast staysail and jibs melt away as an icicle approached by flame and in a breath it seemed the huge ship swung round pitching and foaming after the manner of a harpooned whale with her broadside to us exhibiting the whole forepart of her most grievously and astonishingly wrecked a mighty cheer went up from our decks at the sight and there was a deal of clapping of hands and laughter captain skevington seized the telescope and talked as he worked away with it a rotten foremast by the thunder of heaven he cried using his favorite adjuration it could be nothing else no shot our guns throw could work such havoc by the height that's left standing the spar has fetched away close under the top and the mess the mess for a whole hour after this we touched not a rope leaving our ship to rush from the dutchman straight as an arrow from a bow but lord the storming aloft the fierce straining of our canvas till tacks and guys sheets and braces rang out upon the wind like the clanking of bells to a strain upon them tauter than that of harp strings the boiling noises of the seas all about our bow and under our counter where the great bodies of foam roared away into our wake as the white torrent raves along its bed from the foot of a high cataract there was an excitement in this speed and triumph of escape from what must have proved a heavy and inglorious disaster to us all which put fire into the blood and never could i have imagined how sentient a ship is how participant of what stirs the minds of those she carries until i marked the magnificent eagerness of our vessel's flight her headlong domination of the large billows which underran her and the marble-hard distension of her sails reminding you of the tense cheeks of one who holds his breath in a run for his life distance and the sinking of the sun and the shadows which throng sharply upon his heels in these climes left the horizon in course bare to our most searching gaze we then shortened sail and under easy canvas we put our helm a lee and stood northwards on a bowline until midnight when we rounded in upon our weather braces and steered easterly 
captain skevington suspecting that the dutchman would make all haste to refit and head south under some jury contrivance in the expectation that as we were bound that way when he fell in with us so we should haul to our course afresh when we lost sight of him yet in the end we saw him no more and what ship he was i never contrived to learn but certainly it was an extraordinary escape though whether due to our shot or to his foremast being rotten or to its having been sprung and badly fished or to some earlier wound during an engagement Chapter 5 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 5. We arrive at Table Bay and proceed thence on our voyage. But though, after this piece of severe reality, Captain Skevington had very little to say about such elusive and visionary matters as had before engaged us, it was clear from some words which he let fall that he regarded our meeting with the Dutch battleship as a sort of reflected ill luck from the snow that had passed the phantom Dutchman, and the idea possessing him as indeed it had seized upon me that the lovely nancy was sure to meet with misadventure and might have the power of injuring the fortune of any vessel that spoke with her intimately as we had caused him to navigate the ship with extraordinary wariness a man was constantly kept aloft to watch the horizon and repeatedly hailed from the deck that we might know he was awake to his work other sharp-eyed seamen were stationed on the forecastle at night every light was screened so that we moved along like a blot of liquid pitch upon the darkness on several occasions i heard captain skevington say that he would sooner have parted with twenty guineas than have boarded or had anything to do with the snow happily the adventure with the dutchman led the seamen to suppose that the master's anxiety wholly concerned the ships of the enemy for had it got forward that the lovely nancy had sighted vanderdecken's craft off the agulhas i don't question that they would have concluded our meeting with the snow boded no good to us that we were likely ourselves to encounter the spectral ship if indeed she were a phantasm and not a substantial fabric as i myself deemed and so perhaps have refused to work the saracen beyond table bay at that settlement it was necessary we should call for water fresh provisions and the like and on the sixth of july in the year seventeen ninety six we safely entered the bay and let go our anchor nothing of the least consequence to us having happened since we were chased the weather being fine with light winds ever since the strong breeze before which we had run died away after eighty-one days of sea and sky the meanest land would have offered a noble refreshment to our gaze judge then of the delight we found in beholding the royal and ample scenery of as fair and spacious a haven as this globe has to offer but as captain george shelvock in the capital account he wrote of his voyage round the world in seventeen eighteen there points out the cape of good hope by which he must intend table bay has been so often described that says he i can say nothing of it that has not been said by most who have been here before we lay very quietly for a fortnight feeling perfectly secure as you may conclude when i tell you that 
just round the corner that is to say in simon's bay there were anchored no less than fourteen british ships of war in command of vice-admiral sir george elphinstone of which two were seventy-fours whilst five mounted sixty-four guns each meeting one of the captains of this squadron captain skevington told him how we had been chased by a dutch liner and he replied he did not doubt it was one of the vessels who were coming to retake if they could the settlement we had captured from the nation that had established the place but i do not think the notion probable as the dutch ships did not show themselves off saldana bay for some weeks after we had sailed this however is a matter of no moment whatever we filled our water casks laid in a plentiful stock of tobacco vegetables hogs poultry and such produce as the country yielded and on the morning of the eighteenth of july hove short with a crew diminished by the loss of one man only a boatswain's mate named turner who because we suffered none of the men to go ashore for dread of their deserting the ship slipped down the cable on the night of our departure and swam to the beach naked with some silver pieces tied round him in a handkerchief behold the character of the sailor for a few hours of such drunken jollity as he may obtain in the tavern and amid low company he will be content to forfeit all he has in the world it was known that this man turner had a wife and two children at home dependent upon his earnings yet no thoughts of them could suppress his deplorable restless spirit but i afterwards heard he was punished even beyond his deserts for being pretty near spent by his swim he lay down to sleep but was presently awakened by something crawling over him that proved a venomous snake called a puff adder which on his moving stung him whereof he died it was the stormy season of the year off south africa but then a few days of westerly winds would blow us into mild and quiet zones and come what might the ship we stood on was stout and honest all things right and true aloft the provision space hospitably stocked and the health of the crew of the best twas a perfectly quiet cheerful morning when we manned the capstan the waters of the bay stretched in an exquisite blue calm to the sandy wastes on the blauberg side and thence to where the town stands the atmosphere had the purity of the object lens of a perspective glass and the far distant hottentot holland mountains with summits so mighty that the sky appeared to rest upon them gathered to their giant slopes such a mellowness and richness of blue that they showed as a dark atmospheric dye which had run and stained before being stanched that part of the heavens rather than as prodigious masses of land of the usual complexion of mountains when viewed closely that imperial height called table mountain guarded by the amber-tinted couchant lion reared a marvellously clear skyline and there the firmament appeared as a flowing sea of blue flushing its full cerulean bosom to the flat altitude as though it would overflow it but i noticed a shred of crawling vapour gather up there whilst the crew were chorusing at the capstan and by the time our topsails were sheeted home there was a mass of white vapour some hundred feet in depth foaming and churning atop with delicate wings of it circling out into the blue where they gyrated like butterflies and melted the air was full of the moaning noises of the southeast wind flying out of that cloud down the steep abrupt full of gorges scars and ravines and what was just now a picture of may-day peace 
became on a sudden a scene of whipped and creaming ripples and the flashing on shore of the glass of shaken window casements through spiral spurtings of reddish dust hands aloft on the various ships at anchor hastily furling the canvas that had been loosed to hang idly to the sun flags quite recently languid as streaks of paint now pulling fiercely at their halyards and malay fishing boats darting across the bay in a gem-like glittering of water sliced out by their sharp stems and slung to the strong wind under small sail we stormed out toward the ocean with a desperate screaming of wind in the rigging but there was no sea for the gale was off the land and after passing some noble and enchanting bays on whose shores the breakers as tall as our ship flung their resounding atlantic thunder whilst behind stood ranges of mountains putting a quality of solemn magnificence into the cheerful yellow clothing of the sunshine with here and there a small house of an almond whiteness against the leaves of the silver trees and sundry rich growths thereabouts in a moment we ran sheer out of the gale into a light wind blowing from the northwest i don't say we were astonished since some while before reaching the calm part we could see it clearly defined by the line where the froth and angry blueness and the fiery agitation of the wind ended still it was impossible not to feel surprised as the ship slipped out of the enraged and yelling belt into a peaceful sea and a weak new wind which obliged us to handle the braces and make sail here happened an extraordinary thing as we passed green point where the weather was placid and the strife waged in the bay no longer to be seen a large ship of six hundred tons that we supposed was to call at cape town passed us her yards braced up and all plain sail set she had some soldiers aboard showed several guns had the english colors flying and offered a very brave and handsome show being sheathed with copper that glowed ruddy to the soft laving of the glass-bright swell and her canvas had the hue of the cotton cloths which the spaniards of the south american main used to spread and which in these days form a distinguishing mark of the yankee ships having not the least suspicion of the turmoil that awaited her round muil point she slipped along jauntily ready to make a free wind of the breeze then blowing but all on a sudden on opening the bay she met the whole strength of the fierce southeaster down she lay to it all aback stopped dead her ports being open i feared if she were not promptly recovered she must founder they might let go the halyards but the yards being jammed would not travel it swept the heart into the throat to witness this thing we brought our ship to the wind to render help with our boats but happily her mizzen topmast broke and immediately after her main topgallant mast snapped short off close to the cross trees then though it must have been wild work on those sloping decks they managed to bring the main and topsail yards square whereupon she paid off writing as her head swung from the gale and with lightened hearts as may be supposed they went to work to let go and clew up and haul down whilst you saw how severe was the need of the pumps they had manned by the bright streams of water which sluiced from her sides it was a cruel thing to witness this sudden wrecking of the beauty of a truly stately ship quietly swinging along over the mild heave of the swell like a full-robed handsome princess 
seized and torn by some loathsome monster as we read of such matters in old romances it was like the blighting breath of pestilence upon some fair form converting into little better than a carcass what was just now a proud and regal shape made beauteous by all that art could give her of apparel and all that nature could impart Chapter Six of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Six. The Captain Speaks Again of the Death Ship. I had the first watch on the night of the day on which we left Table Bay that is from eight till midnight and at two bells nine o'clock i was quietly pacing the deck full of fancies struck into me by the beauty of the stars among which over the starboard yard-arms hung the southern cross shining purely and by the mild glory of the moon that though short of a day or two of being full rained down a keen light that had a hint of rosiness in it when captain skevington came out of the cabin and stepping up to me stood a minute without speaking gazing earnestly right around the sea circle there was a small wind blowing and the ship under full sail was softly pushing southwards with a pleasant noise as of the playing of fountains coming from the direction of her bows a quiet night fenton said the captain presently ay sir quiet indeed there's been a small show of lightning away down in the southwest the wind hangs steady but a little faint sort of night for meeting with the demon ship eh fenton cried he with a laugh that did not sound perfectly natural there's no chance of such a meeting i fear sir you fear well i exclaimed struck by his quick catching up of me i mean that as the demon ship as you term her is one of the wonders of the world the seeing of her would be a mighty experience something big enough in that way to keep a man talking about it all his life god avert such a meeting said he lifting his hat and turning up his face to the stars i suppose thought i that our drawing close to the seas in which the phantom cruises has stirred up his superstitious fears afresh did you speak to any one at cape town about vanderdecken sir said i no he answered i had got my bellyful from the master of the snow what is there to ask whether others have lately sighted the ship why yes i might have inquired certainly but it didn't enter my head tell you what though fenton do you remember our chat t'other day about bodies being endeviled after they pass an age when by the laws of great nature they should die perfectly well sir now continued he i was in company a few nights since where there was one cornelius meyer present a person ninety-one years old but surprisingly sound in all his faculties his sight piercing his hearing keen memory tenacious and so forth he was a dutch jew but his patriotism was colored by the hue of the flag flying at cape castle i mean he would take the king of great britain and the states general as they came when he left we talked of him and this led us to argue about old age one gentleman said he did not know but that it was possible for a man to live to a hundred and fifty and said there were instances of it i replied not out of the bible where the reckoning was not ours he answered yes out of the bible and going to a bookshelf pulled down a volume and read a score of names of men with their ages attached i looked at the book and saw it was honestly written 
and being struck by this collection of extraordinary examples, begged the gentleman's son who was present to copy the list out for me, which he was so obliging as to do. I have it in my pocket, said he, and he pulled out a sheet of paper, and then, going to the hatch, called to the boy to bring a lamp on deck. This was done, the lamp put on the skylight, and putting the paper close to it, the captain read as follows. Thomas Parr, of Shropshire, died November 16, 1635, aged 152. Henry Jenkins, of Yorkshire, died December 8, 1670, aged 169. James Sands, of Staffordshire, died 1770, aged 140. Louisa Truxo, a negress in South America, was living in 1780, and her age was then 175. I burst into a laugh. He smiled, too, and said, Here in this list are thirty-one names, the highest being that negress, and the lowest one Susanna Hillier of Piddington, Northamptonshire, who died February 19, 1781, aged 100. The young gentleman who copied them said they were all honestly vouched for, and wrote down a list of the authorities which, said he, peering and bringing the paper closer to his eyes, consist of Fuller's Worthies, Philosophical Transactions, Durham's Physico-Theology, several newspapers, such as the Morning Post, Daily Advertiser, London Chronicle, and a number of inscriptions. I could have been tolerably sarcastic, I dare say, when he mentioned the authority of the newspapers, always understanding that those sheets flourish mainly on lies, and I should have laughed again had I not been restrained by the sense that Captain Skevington was clearly bitten on this subject, actually worried by it, indeed to such lengths, that if he did not mind his eye, it might presently push into a delusion, and earn him the disconcerting reputation of being a madman. So I thought I would talk gravely, and said, May I ask, sir, why you should have been at the pains to collect that evidence in your hand about old age? A mere humor, said he, lightly, putting the paper away, though I don't mind owning it would prodigiously gratify me if I could be the instrument of proving that men can overstep the bounds of natural life by as many years again, and yet possess their own souls and be as true to their original as they were when hearty young fellows flushed with the summer colors of life. Some fine rhymes coming into my head, I exclaimed, Cowley has settled that point, I think, when he says, To things immortal time can do no wrong, and that which never is to die forever must be young. A noble fancy indeed, cried the captain. He reflected a little and said, it would make a great noise among sailors, and perhaps all men, to prove that the mariners who man the death-ship are not ghosts and phantoms, as has been surmised, but survivors of a crew, men who have outlived their fellows, and are now extremely ancient, as these and scores of others who have passed away unnoticed have been, said he, touching his pocket where the paper was. When, sir, did Vanderdecken sail from Batavia? I asked. I have always understood about the year 1650, he replied. Then, said I, calculating, suppose the average age of the crew to have been thirty when the curse was uttered. We'll name that figure for the sake of argument. In the present year of our Lord, they will have attained the age of hard upon one hundred and eighty. Well, said he inquiringly, as though there was yet food for argument. I shook my head. Then he cried with heat, They are endeviled, for it must be one of two things. They can't be dead men, as the corpse in the grave is dead. 
one could only judge by seeing with one's eyes said i i hope that won't happen he exclaimed taking a hasty turn though i don't know i don't know a something here pressing his brow weighs down upon me like a warning i have struggled to get rid of the fancy but our being chased by the dutchman shows that we did not meet that plymouth snow for nothing and by the thunder of heaven fenton i fear i fear our next bout will be with the spectre his manner his words a gleam in his eye to which the lantern lent no sparkle sent a tremor through me he caused me to fear him for a minute as one that talked with certainty of futurity through stress of prophetic craze the yellow beams of the lantern dispersed a narrow circle of lustre and in it our figures showed black each with two shadows swaying at his feet from the commingling of the lamplight and the moonshine the soft air stirred in the rigging like the rustle of the pinions of invisible night birds on the wing all was silent and in darkness along the decks save where stood the figure of the helmsman just before the little round house outlined by the flames of the binnacle lamp the stillness unbroken to the farthest corners of the mighty plain of ocean seemed as though it were some mysterious spell wrought by the stars so high it went even so one might say as a sensible presence to the busy trem chapter seven of the death ship this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell, Chapter 7 I Converse with the Ship's Carpenter about the Death Ship. And now for six days it veritably seemed as if we were to be transformed into the marine phantom that unsubstantial as she might be yet lay with the heaviness of lead upon captain skevington for being on the parallel of agulas a little to the south of that latitude and in about sixteen degrees west longitude it came on to blow fresh from the southeast hardening after twenty-four hours into a whole gale with frequent and violent guns and a veering of it easterly and this continued with a lull of an hour or two's duration for six days as i have said twas a taste of cape weather strong enough to last a man a lifetime the sea lay shrouded to within a musket shot by a vapour of slatish hue that looked to stand motionless and past the walls and along the roof of this wild dismal cloud-formed chamber with its floor of vaults and frothing brows the wind swept raving raising a terrible lead-coloured sea with heads which seemed to rear to the height of our maintop where they broke and boiled like a cauldron with foam great masses of which the hands of the gale caught up and hurled so that the lashing of the spray was often like a blinding snowstorm but so smarting that the wind was as if charged with javelins we lay too under a storm staysail with top gallant masts struck yards on deck and the lower yards stowed on the rail the hatches battened down and everything as snug as good seamanship could provide our decks were constantly full of water by one great sea that fell over into the waist there were drowned no less than six of the sheep we had taken in at the cape with a hog and many fowls the carpenter's leg was broken by a fall 
and an able seaman was deeply gashed in the face by being thrown against a scuttle-butt twas impossible to get any food cooked and throughout that week we subsisted on biscuit cheese and such dry and lean fare as did not need dressing in short i could fill a chapter with our sufferings and anxieties during that period but on the sixth day the gale broke leaving our ship considerably strained by which time in spite of the current and the send of the sea we had contrived to make forty miles of southing and easting owing to our pertinacity in making sail and stretching away on a board at every lull it was shortly after this on the tuesday following the friday on which the gale ended that it being my watch on deck from eight o'clock in the evening till midnight i carried my pipe an hour before my turn arrived into the carpenter's cabin which he shared with the boatswain to give the poor fellow a bit of my company for his broken leg kept him motionless it was the second dog watch as we term the time twixt six and eight o'clock at sea the evening indifferently fine the wind over the starboard quarter a quiet breeze the ocean heaving in a lazy swell from the south and the ship pushing forward at five knots an hour under fore and main royals the carpenter lay in a bunk wearing a haggard face and grizzly for lack of the razor he was a very sensible sober man a good artificer and had served under lord howe in the fleet equipped for the relief of gibraltar besides having seen a deal of cruising work in earlier times he was much obliged by my looking in upon him and we speedily fell to yarning he lighted a pipe and i smoked likewise whilst i sat upon his chest taking in with a half look round such details as a rude sketch of the boatswain's wife nailed to the bulkhead the slush lamp swinging its dingy smoking flame to a cracked piece of looking-glass over against the carpenter's bed an ancient horny copy of the bible with type pretty nigh as big as the letters of our ship's name a bit of a shelf wherefrom there forked out the stems of some clay pipes with other humble furniture such as a sailor is used to carry the sea with him after a little the carpenter whose name was matthews says to me i beg pardon sir but there's some talk going about among the men concerning the old dutchman that was cursed last century my mate joe marner told me that jimmy meaning the cabin boy was telling some of the crew this morning that he heard the captain say the dutchman's been sighted by any one aboard us i asked maybe sir but i didn't understand that now as every hour was carrying us further to the eastward of the cape away from the phantom's cruising ground and as moreover the leaving gossip to make its own way would surely in the end prove more terrifying to the nervous and superstitious on board than speaking the truth i resolved to tell matthews how the matter stood and with that acquainted him with what the master of the snow had told captain skevington he looked very grave and withdrew his pipe from his lips and i noticed he did not offer to light the tobacco afresh i'm sorry to hear this sir says he but said i what has the lovely nancy's meeting with the dutchman got to do with us only this sir he exclaimed with his face yet more clouded and speaking in a low voice as one might in a sacred building i never yet knew or heard of a ship reporting to another of having met the dutchman without that other a meeting of the ghost too afore she ended her voyage if that be so i cried not liking to hear this for matthews had been to sea for thirty-five years and he now spoke with too much emotion not to affect me 
for god's sake don't make your thoughts known to the crew and least of all to the captain who is already so uneasy on this head that when he mentions it he talks as if his mind were adrift mr fenton said the carpenter i never yet knew or heard of a ship reporting to another of having met the dutchman without that other a meeting the ghost too afore she's ended her voyage and thus speaking he smote his bed heavily with his fist i was startled by the emphasis his repeating his former words gave to the assurance and smoked in silence he put down his pipe and lay a while looking at me as though turning some matters over in his mind the swing of the flame burning from the spout of the lamp put various expressions wrought by the fluctuating shadows into his sick face and it was this perhaps that caused his words to possess a power i could not feign to you by any art of my pen he asked me if i had ever seen the dutchman and on my answering no he said that the usual notion among sailors was that there is but one vessel sailing the seas with the curse of heaven upon her but that that was a mistake as it was an error in the same way to suppose that this ocean from agulas round to the mozambique was the only place in which the phantom was to be met there's a ship said he after the pattern of this here dutchman to be found in the baltic she always brings heavy weather and there's small chance afterwards for any craft that sights her i've been trading in the baltic for five years without ever hearing that said i but it's true all the same mr fenton you ask about it sir when you get back and then you'll see there's another vessel of the same pattern that's to be met down in the mouth of the channel twixt you shan't and the sillies and thereabouts a man i know called jimmy robbins saw her and told me the yarn he was in a ship bound home from the spice island they were in soundings and heading round for the channel it was the morning watch just about dawn weather slightly thickish suddenly a vessel comes heaving out of the smother from god knows where jim robbins was coiling down a rope alongside the mate who on seeing the vessel screams out shrill like a woman and falls flat in a swoon jim looking saw it was the channel death ship a large pink manned by skeletons with a skull for a figurehead and a skeleton captain leaning against the mast watching the running of the sand in an hourglass he held she was seen by twelve others besides jim and the mate who nearly died of the fright and the consequence of meeting her was that the ship jim robbins was in was cast away on the following night on the french coast down st brijos way and thirty-three souls perished the gravity with which he related this and his evident keen belief in these and the like superstitions now rendered the conversation somewhat diverting for as i have elsewhere said though i never questioned the existence of the one spectral ship in a belief in which all mariners are united holding that the deep which is full of drowned men hath its spirits and its apparitions equally with the land yet when it came to such crude mad fancies as a vessel manned by skeletons why of course there was nothing for it but to laugh which i did heartily enough though in my sleeve for seamen are a sensitive people easily affronted more especially in any article of their faith however he succeeded before i left him in exciting a fresh uneasiness in me by asseverating in a most melancholy voice and with a very dismal face that our having spoken with the snow that had sighted the dutchman 
was certain to be followed by misfortune and these being amongst the last words he exchanged with me before i left his cabin i naturally carried away with me on deck the damping and desponding impression of his posture and appearance as he uttered them which were those of a man grieved bewildered chapter eight of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the death ship by william clark russell chapter eight a tragical death for some time after i had relieved the deck as it is termed that is to say after the mate had gone below and left me in charge i had the company of the captain who seemed restless and troubled often quitting my side as we paced to go to the rail and view the horizon with the air of a man perturbed by expectation i need not tell you that i did not breathe a word to him respecting my talk with the carpenter not even to the extent of saying how fancies about the dutchman were flying about among the crew for this subject he was in no state of mind to be brought into the moon was rising a little before he joined me and we stood in silence watching her she jutted up a very sickly faint red that brightened but a little after she lifted her lower limb clear of the horizon and when we had the full of her plane we perceived her strangely distorted by the atmosphere of the shape if shape it can be called of a rotten orange that has been squeezed or of a turtle's egg lightly pressed she was more like a blood-coloured jelly distilled by the sky ugly and even affrighting than the sweet ice-cold planet that imperils the world at night and whose delicate silver the lover delights to behold in his sweetheart's eyes but she grew more shapely as she soared though holding a dusky blush for a much longer time than ever i had noticed in her when rising off the mid-african main and her wake broken by the small black curl of the breeze hung in broken indissoluble lumps of feverish light like coagulated gore that had dropped from the wound she looked to be in the dark sky there was a faintness in the heavens that closed out the sparkles of the farther stars and but a few and those only of the greatest magnitude were visible shining in several colours such as dim pink and green and wan crystal all which together with one or two of them above our mastheads dimly glittering amidst feeble rings made the whole appearance of the night amazing and even ghastly enough to excite a feeling of awe in the attention it compelled the captain spoke not a word whilst the moon slowly floated into the dusk and then fetching a deep breath he said well thank god if she don't grow round it's because of the shadow on her keep a bright lookout mr fenton and hold the ship to her course should the wind fail call me and call me too if it should head us with which he walked quietly to the hatch stood there a moment or two with his hand upon it and his face looking up as though he studied the trim of the yards and then disappeared as the night wore on the moon gathered her wonted hue and shape though her refulgence was small for the air thickened indeed at half past ten all the lights of heaven saving the moon had been put out by a mist the texture of which was illustrated by the only luminary the sky contained around whose pale expiring disk there was now a great halo with something of the character of a lunar rainbow in the very delicate barely determinable tinctures which made a sort of shadowy prism of it 
more like what one would dream of than see the ocean lay very black there was no power in the moon to cast a wake the breathings of the wind rippled the water and caused a scintillation of the spangles of the phosphorus or sea fire the weight of the lower sails kept them hanging up and down and what motion the ship had was from the swelling of the light canvas that rose very pale and ghostly into the gloom i had gone to the taffrail and was staring there away into the dark whither our short wake streamed in a sort of smouldering cloudiness with particles of fire in it conceiving that the wind was failing and waiting to make sure before reporting to the captain when i was startled by the report of a musket or some small arm that broke upon my ear with a muffled sound so that whence it came i could not conceive yet for some minutes i felt so persuaded the noise had been seawards that spite of there having been no flash i stood peering hard into the dark first one side then the other far as the sails would suffer me then but all very quickly concluding that the explosion had happened aboard and might betoken mischief i ran along the deck where close against the wheel i found a number of seamen talking hurriedly and in alarmed voices i called out to know what that noise had been none knew one said it had come from the sea another that there had been a small explosion in the hold and a third was giving his opinion when at that instant a figure darted out of the companion hatch clothed in his shirt and drawers and cried out mr fenton mr fenton for god's sake where are you i recognized the voice of mr hall and bawled back here sir and ran to him he grasped my arm the captain has shot himself he exclaimed where is he said i in his cabin he answered we rushed down together the great cabin where we messed was in darkness but a light shone in the captain's berth the door was open and gently swung with the motion of the ship i pushed in but instantly recoiled with horror for right athwart the deck lay the body of captain skevington with the top of his head blown away it needed but one glance to know that he had done this thing with his own hand he had fired the piece with his foot by a string attached to the trigger standing upright with his brow bent to the muzzle for the bite of the string was round his shoe and he had fallen sideways grasping the barrel the sight froze me to the marrow had i killed him by accident with my own hand i could not have trembled more but this exquisite distress was short-lived it was only needful to look at his head to discover how fruitless would be the task of examining him for any signs of life some of the seamen who heard mr hall cry out to me about this thing had followed us below forgetting their place in the consternation roused in them and stood in the doorway faintly groaning and muttering exclamations of pity mr hall bid a couple of them raise the body and lay it in its bunk and cover it with a sheet and others he sent for water and a swab wherewith to cleanse the place you had better go on deck again fenton says he to me the ship must be watched i'll join you presently i was glad to withdraw for albeit there was a ghastliness in the look of the night the sea being black as ebony though touched here and there with little sheets of fire and stretching like a pole to its horizon that was drawing narrower and murkier around us minute after minute with the wing-like shadow of vapour that was yet too thin to deserve the name of fog though there was this ghastliness i say aided by the moon that was now little more than a dim tarnished blotch of shapeless silver 
wanly ringed with an ashen cincture yet the taste of the faint breeze was as helpful to my spirits as a dram of generous cordial after the atmosphere of the cabin in which i had beheld Chapter 9 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 9 Mr. Hall Harangues the Crew. The news had spread quickly. The watch below had roused out, and most of the men were on deck and they moved about in groups striving to find out all about the suicide presently mr hall arrived on deck fully dressed and stepping over to where i stood in deep thought exclaimed did you have a suspicion that the captain designed this fearful act no not a shadow of a suspicion i answered tis enough to make one believe he was not far out when he talked of the ill luck he expected from speaking a craft that had sighted vanderdecken said he very uneasily which made me see how strong was the blow his nerves had received and running his eyes restlessly over the water here and there as i might tell by the dim sparkle the faint moon haze kindled in them oh but he continued as if dashing aside his fancies the mere circumstance of his being so superstitious ought to explain the act i have often thought there was a vein of madness in him i never questioned that i replied tis an ugly-looking night said he with a little tremble running through him there is some menace of foul weather we shall lose this faint air presently he shivered again and said such a sight as that below is enough to make a hell of a night of midsummer beauty it is the suddenness of it that seizes upon the imagination why do you know fenton i'd give a handful of guineas poor as i am for a rousing gale anything to blow my mind to its bearings for here's a sort of business looking aloft that's fit to suffocate the heart in your breast such words in so plain and literal a man made me perceive how violently he had been wrenched i begged his leave to go below and fetch him a glass of liquor no no said he not yet anyhow i must speak to those fellows there saying which he walked a little distance forward calling for the boatswain on that officer answering he said are all hands on deck i believe most of the crew are on deck sir replied the boatswain pipe all hands said mr hall the clear keen whistling rose shrill to the sails and made as blithe a sound as could have been devised for the cheering of us up the men gathered quickly some lanterns were fetched and in the light of them stood the crew near to the roundhouse mr hall made a brief speech he explained to the men how on hearing the report of a musket he had sprung from his bed and perceiving powder smoke leaking through the openings in the door of the captain's cabin through which some rays of light streamed he entered and seeing the body of the captain and the horrid condition of the head was filled with a panic and rushed on deck that the master had shot himself was certain but there was no help for what had happened the command of the ship fell upon him but it was for them to say whether he should navigate the ship to her destination or carry her back to table bay where a fresh commander could be obtained he was very well liked on board being an excellent seaman and the crew on hearing this immediately answered that they wanted no better master to sail under than he and that indeed they would not consent to a change but having said this with a heartiness that pleased me for i liked mr hall greatly myself and was extremely glad to find the crew so well disposed they fell into an awkward silence broken after a little by some hoarse whisperings 
what now says mr hall why sir answers the boatswain respectfully it's this with the men there's a notion among us that that there plymouth snow has brought ill luck to the ship one bad specimen of which has just happened and the feeling is that we had better return to table bay so as to get the influence worked out of the old barky how is that to be done says mr hall coming easily into the matter partly because of his shaken nerves and partly because of the kindness he felt towards the hands for the way they had received his address to them here there was another pause and then the boatswain speaking somewhat shyly said the carpenter who's heard tell more about the phantom ship and the spell she lays on vessels than all hands of us put together says that the only way to work out of a ship's timbers the ill luck that's been put into them by what's magical and hellish is for a minister of religion to come aboard call all hands to prayer and ask of the lord a blessing on the ship he says there's no other way of purifying her can't we pray ourselves for a blessing says mr hall the boatswain not quickly answering a sailor says it needs a man who knows how to pray who's acquainted with the right sort of words to use ay cried another and whose calling is religion mr hall half turned as if he would address me then checking himself he said well my lads there's no wind now and small promise of any suppose we let this matter rest till to-morrow morning mr fenton and i will talk it over and you forward can turn it about in your minds i believe we shall be easier when the captain's buried and the sun's up and then we might agree it would be a pity to put back after the tough job we've had to get where we are but lest you should still be all of one mind on this matter in the morning we'll keep the ship should wind come under small sail so as to make no headway worth speaking of during the night is that to your fancy men they all said it was and thereupon went forward but i noticed that those who were off duty did not offer to go below they joined the watch on the forecastle and i could hear them in earnest talk their voices trembling through the stillness like the humming of a congregation in church following the parson's reading mr hall came to my side and we walked the deck i am sorry the men have got that notion of this ship being under a spell said he this is no sweet time of the year in these seas to put back will i dare say be only to anger the weather that's now quiet enough and there's always the risk of falling into dutch hands i told him of my talk with the carpenter and said that i could not be surprised the crew were alarmed for the old fellow had the devil's own knack of putting his fancies in an alarming way i laughed at some of his fancies said i but i don't mind owning that i quitted his cabin so dulled in my spirits by his talk that i might have come from a deathbed for all the heart there was in me well things must take their chance said mr hall i'll speak to the carpenter myself in the morning and afterwards to the men and if they are still wishful that the ship should return to table bay we'll sail her there tis all one to me i'd liefer have a new captain over me than be one we continued until five bells to walk to and fro the deck talking about the captain's suicide the strangeness of it as following his belief that ill luck had come to the ship from the plymouth vessel with other such matters as would be suggested by our situation and the tragedy in the cabin and mr hall then said he would go below for a glass of rum but he refused to lie down though i offered to stand an hour of his watch that is from midnight till one o'clock for he said he should not be able to sleep most of the crew continued to hang about the forecastle which rescued the deck from the extreme loneliness i had found in it ere the report of the fatal musket startled all hands into wakefulness and movement the lanterns had been carried away and the ship was plunged in darkness there still blew a very light air 
so gentle that you needed to wet your finger and hold it up to feel it from the darkness aloft fell the delicate sounds of the higher canvas softly drumming the masts to the very slight rolling of the ship i went to the binnacle and found that the vessel was heading her course and then stepped to the rail upon which i set my elbows leaning my chin in my Chapter 10 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 10 We Draw Close to a Strange and Luminous Ship. Now, I might have stood thus for ten minutes when I was awakened from my dream by an eager, feverish muttering of voices forward, and on a sudden the harsh notes of a seaman belonging to my watch cried out, Do you see that sail right broad abeam, sir? I sprang from my leaning posture and peered, but my eyes were heavy. The night was dark, and whilst I stared, several of the sailors came hurriedly aft to where i stood and said all speaking together there see her sir look yonder mr fenton and their arms to a man shot out to point as if every one levelled a pistol though i could not immediately make out the object i was not surprised by the consternation the sailors were in for such was the mood and temper of the whole company that not the most familiar and prosaic craft that floats on the ocean could have broken through the obscurity of the night upon their gaze without tickling their superstitious instincts till the very hair of their heads crawled to the inward motions in a few moments sure enough i made out the loom of what looked a large ship out on the starboard beam as well as i could distinguish she was close hauled and so standing as to pass under our stern she made a sort of faintness upon the sea and sky where she was nothing more and even to be sure of her it was necessary to look a little on one side or the other of her for if you gazed full she went out as a dim distant light at sea does thus viewed she may be an enemy i cried there should be no lack of dutch or even french hereabouts quick lads to stations send the boatswain here i ran to the companion hatch and called loudly to mr hall he had fallen asleep on a locker and came running in a blind sort of way to the foot of the ladder shouting out what is it what is it i answered that there was a large ship heading directly for us whereupon he was instantly wide awake and sprang up the ladder crying where away where away if there was any wind i could feel none yet some kind of draught there must have been for the ship out in the darkness held a brave luff which proved her under command we on the other hand rested upon the liquid ebony of the ocean with square yards the mizzen furled the starboard clue of the mainsail hoisted and the greater number of our staysails down whilst mr hall stared in the direction of the ship the boatswain arrived for orders the mate turned smartly to me and said we must make ready and take our chance bosun pipe to quarters and mr fenton see all clear for the second time in my watch the boatswain's pipe shrilled clear to the canvas from whose stretched still folds the sounds broke away in ghostly echoes we were not a man of war had no drums and to martial duties we could but address ourselves clumsily but all felt 
that there might be a great danger in the pale shadow yonder that had seemed to ooze out upon our eyes from the darkness as strangely as a cloud shapes itself upon a mountain top so we tumbled about quickly and wildly enough got our little batteries clear put on the hatch gratings and tarpaulins opened the magazine lighted the matches provided the guns with spare breeches and tackles and stood ready for whatever was to come all this we contrived with the aid of one or two lanterns very secretly moved about as mr hall did not wish us to be seen making ready but the want of light delayed us and by the time we were fully prepared the strange ship had insensibly floated down to about three-quarters of a mile upon our starboard quarter at that distance it was too black to enable us to make anything of her but we comforted ourselves by observing that she did not offer to alter her course whence we might reasonably hope that she was a peaceful trader like ourselves she showed no lights her sails were all that was visible of her owing to the hue they put into the darkness over her hull it was a time of heavy trial to our patients our ship had come to a dead stand as it was easy to discover by looking over the side where the small pale puffs of phosphoric radiance that flashed under water at the depth of a man's hand from our vessel's strakes whenever she rolled no matter how daintily to the swell hung glimmering for a space in the self-same spot where they were discharged nor was there the least sound of water in motion under our counter unless it were the gurgling drowning sobbing you hear there on a still night when the stern stoops to the drop of the fold and raises that strange hollow noise of washing all about the rudder i would to mercy a breeze would come if only to resolve her said mr hall to me in a low voice there's but little fun to be got out of this sort of waiting at this rate we must keep the men at their stations till daylight to find out what she is pleasant if she should prove some lump of a dutch man-of-war she shows uncommonly large don't you think fenton so do we to her i dare say in this obscurity i replied but i doubt that she's a man of war i've been watching her closely and have never once caught sight of the least gleam of a light aboard her maybe the officer of the watch and the lookout are sound asleep said he with a slight and not very merry laugh and if she steered on her quarter-deck she'll be too deep-waisted perhaps for the helmsman to see us i heard him say this without closely heeding it for my attention at that moment was attracted by what was unquestionably the enlargement of her pallid shadow sure proof that she had shifted her helm and was slowly coming round so as to head for us mr hall noticed this as soon as i ha he cried they mean to find out what we are eh they've observed us at last does she bring an air with her that she's under control or is it that she's lighter and taller than we it was beyond question because she was lighter and taller and having been kept close hauled to the faint draught had made more of it than we who carried it aft besides we were loaded down to our chain plate bolts with cargo and the water and other stores we had shipped at the cape yet her approach was so sluggish as to be imperceptible and i would not like to say that our gradual drawing together was not as much due to the current which off this coast runs strong to the westward setting us who were deep faster towards her than it set her from us as it was also owing to the strange attraction which brings becalmed vessels near to each other often indeed to their having to be towed clear by their boats meanwhile the utter silence on board the stranger the blackness in which her hull lay hidden the strangeness of her bracing in her yards to head up for us without any signal being shown that she designed to fight us wrought such a fit of impatience in mr hall 
that he swung his body from the back stay he clutched in movements positively convulsive are they all dead aboard on such a night as this one should be able to hear the least sound the hauling taut of a tackle the rasping of the wheel ropes she surely doesn't hope to catch us napping said i god knows cried the mate what would i give now for a bit of moon if it's to be a fight it'll have to be a shooting match for a spell or wind must come quickly said i but if she meant mischief wouldn't she head to pass under our stern where she could rake us rather than steer to come broadside on instead of responding the mate sprang on to the bulwark rail and in tones such as only the practised and powerful lungs of a seaman can fling roared out ho the ship ahoy we listened with so fierce a strain of attention that the very beating of our hearts rung in our ears but not a sound came across the water twice yet did mr hall hail that pallid fabric shapeless as yet in the dark air but to no purpose on this there was much whispering among the men clustered about the guns their voices came along in a low grumbling sound like the growling of dogs dulled by threats silence fore and aft cried the mate we don't know what she is but we know what we are and as englishmen we surely have spirit enough for whatever may come there was silence for some minutes after these few words then the muttering broke out afresh but scattered a group talking to larboard another on the forecastle and so forth meanwhile the vessels all insensibly had continued to draw closer and closer to each other a small clarification of the atmosphere happening past the stranger suffered a dim disclosure of her canvas whence i perceived that she had nothing set above her topgallant sails though it was impossible to see whether she carried royal masts or indeed whether the yards belonging to those masts were crossed on them her hull had now also stolen out into a pitch-black shadow and after gazing at it with painful intentness for some moments i was extravagantly astonished to observe a kind of crawling and flickering of light resembling that which burnt in the sea stirring like glow-worms along the vessel's side i was about to direct mr hall's attention to this thing when he said in a subdued voice fenton do you notice the faint shining about her hull what in god's name can it be he had scarce uttered these words when a sailor on the starboard side of our ship whom i recognized by the voice as one ephraim jacobs an elderly sober pious-minded seaman cried out with a sort of scream in his notes as i hope to be forgiven my sins for jesus sake yon's chapter eleven of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the death ship by william clark russell chapter eleven a cruel disaster befalls me the mere putting into words the suspicion that had been troubling all our minds made one man in action of the whole crew like the firing of forty pieces of ordnance in the same instant whatever the sailors held they flung down and in a bound came to the waist on the starboard side where they stood looking at the ship and making amid that silence the strangest noise that ever was heard with their deep and fearful breathing great thunder broke in one of them presently 
do you know what that shining is mates why it's the glow of timbers that's been rotted by near two hundred years of weather softly tom said another tis hell that owns her crew they have the malice of devils and they need but touch us to founder us wait and you shall see her melt exclaimed one of the two foreigners who were among our company of seamen if she is as i believe she will be manned by the ghosts of wicked men who have perished at sea presently a bell shall strike and she must disappear as this was said there was a commotion forward and the carpenter borne by two stout hands was carried into the midst of the crew and propped up so that he might see the ship i was as eager as any of the most illiterate sailors on board to hear what he had to say and took a step the better to catch his words a whole minute went by whilst he gazed so strained and anticipative were my senses that the moments seemed as hours he then said mates yonder's the death ship right enough look hard and you'll mark the steve of her bowsprit with the round top at the end of it and the spring of her aft in a fashion more ancient than is the ages of any two of the oldest men aboard note the after rake of her mizzenmast and how the heel of the foremast looks to step in the forepeak that's the ship born in sixteen fifty vanderdecken master what i've often heard tell of raise my head mates and here whether through pain or weakness or horror he fainted but being laid upon the deck and some water thrown over his face he came to in a short while and lay trembling refusing to speak or answer questions a slight thinning of the vapour that hid the moon had enabled us to remark those points in the ship the carpenter had named and whilst he was being recovered from his swoon the moon looked down from a gulf in the mist but her light was still very tarnished and dim yet blurred and distorted as was her appearance there instantly formed round her the same halo or wan circle that was visible before she was hidden but her apparition made a light that exquisitely answered to those two lines of shakespeare therefore the moon the governess of floods pale in her anger washes all the air for such radiance as fell really seemed like a cleansing of the atmosphere after the black smother that had encompassed us and now we could all see the ship distinctly as she lay on our quarter with her broadside somewhat to us her yards trimmed like our own and her sails hanging dead it was the solemnest sight that ever mortal eye beheld the light left her black so there was no telling what hue she showed or was painted her bows lay low in the water after the old fashion with headboards curling to her beak that doubtless bore an ornament though we could not distinguish it there she rose like a hill broken with the bulwarks that defined her waist quarter-deck and short poop this was as much as we could discern of her hull her foremast stood close to where the heel of her bowsprit came her mizzenmast raked over her stern and upon it was a yard answering to the rig of a felucca the clue of its sail came down clear of a huge lantern whose iron frame for all the glass in it was broken gone showed like the skeleton of some monster on her taffrail it was a sight to terrify the stoutest heart to see the creeping of thin worm or wire-like gleamings upon the side she showed to us i considered at first she was glossy and that those lights were the reflection of the phosphoric fires in the water under her but it was soon made plain that this was not so as though to be sure a greenish glare of the true sea flame would show against or near her when she slightly leaned 
as we did to the swell this charnel house or touchwood glimmer played all along her without regard to the phosphorescence under her what think you of her fenton said mr hall speaking softly but with much of his excitement and uneasiness gone does she resemble the craft that the master of the snow told captain skevington he sighted hereabouts why yes i think so said i but it does not follow that she is the phantom ship the plymouth hooker's yarn owed a good deal to terror and it would not lose in its passage through the brain of a lunatic as i fear poor skevington was she has a very solid look she is a real ship but the like of her i have never seen save in old prints mark those faint fiery stripes and spirals upon her i do not understand it the wood that yields such light must be as rotten as tinder and porous as a sponge it could not swim by this time the mysterious ship had floated out her whole length unless it were our vessel that had slewed and given us that view of her no light save the lambent gleams on her side was to be seen we could hear no voices we could discern no movement of figures or distinguish any outline resembling a human shape upon her on a sudden my eye was caught by an illumination overhead that made a luster strong enough to enable me to see the face of mr hall i looked up conceiving that one of our crew had jumped aloft with a lantern and saw at our main yard arm a corpus sant or st elmo's light that shone freely like a luminous bulb poised a few inches above the spar scarce had this been kindled and whilst it was paling the faces of our seamen who stared at it there suddenly shone two bright meteors of a similar kind upon the strange ship one on top of the topgallant masthead that was the full height of the main spars and one on the summit of a mast that stood up from the round top at the end of the bowsprit and that in olden times before it was discontinued would have been called the sprit topmast they had something of the glory of stars their reflection twisted like silver serpents in the dark waters and as though they had been flambeaux or lamps they hung their spectral glow upon the strangely cut sails of the vessel upon her rigging and spars sickling all things to their starry color dimly illuminating even the distant castle-like poop showing clearly the dark line of bulwarks whilst a deeper dye of blackness entered into the hull from the shadow between the corpus sans on high and their mirroring beneath thanks be to god for the sight of those lights exclaimed a deep voice sounding out among the men it's a saint's hand as kindles them i've heerd and there'll be a breeze with luck behind it presently see mr hall cried i pointing do you observe the figures of men look along the line of the forecastle one two three i count six there and look right aft on that bit of a poop do you mark a couple of shapes viewing us as if with folded arms yes he paused staring then added those lights are familiar enough to me i've seen them scores of times speaking in whispers which trembled back to their former notes of consternation but there's something frightful about them now and yonder one pointing to our yard arm and the sight they show she's no natural ship he said pulling off his cap and passing his hand over his forehead would to god a breeze would come and part us hail him again sir hail him you my throat is dry i walked right aft to bring me more abreast of the silent motionless figures on the stranger's poop and jumping on to the rail caught hold of the vang of the spanker gaff to steady myself and putting a hand to my mouth roared out ship ahoy 
what ship is that and stopped breathless so that i seemed to hear the echoes of my own voice among the sails of the stranger what ship is that now came back in a deep organ-like note and the two figures separated one walking forward and the other stepping as i had on to the bulwark over the quarter gallery the saracen of london bound to indian ports i responded i will send a boat cried the man in the same deep-throated voice if you do we'll fire into it screamed a seaman on our deck mates mr hall you see now what he is keep them off keep them off at which there was a sudden hurrying of feet with many clicking sounds of triggers sharply cocked by which i knew our men had armed themselves the corpus sant at our yard-arm vanished in a few seconds it showed itself afresh midway up the mainmast making a wild light all around it those on the stranger burned steadily and i believed a third had been kindled on her till i saw it was a lantern carried along the deck there was a stillness lasting some minutes what they were about we could not see anon came a creaking as of ropes travelling in blocks then a light splash the lantern dropped jerkily down the ship's side plainly grasped by a man flashes of phosphorus broke out of the water to the dip of oars like fire clipped from a flint i felt a faint air blowing but did not heed it being half frenzied with the excitement and fear raised in me by what i could now see thanks to the light of the st elmo fires and the mystic crawlings of flames on the vessel's sides i saw a boat square at both ends with the gunwale running out into horns rowed by two figures whilst a third stood upright in the bows holding high a lighted lantern in one hand and extending his other arm in a posture of supplication at this instant a yellow glare broke in a noontide dazzle from our own ship's rail and the thunder of twenty muskets fired at once fell upon my hearing i started with the violence of the shock breaking in upon me heedlessly let go the vang that i had been grasping Chapter 12 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 12 I Am Rescued by the Death Ship. I rose to the surface from a deep plunge, but being a very indifferent swimmer, it was as much as i could do clothed as i was to keep myself afloat by battling with my hands i heard the rippling of the water about my ears and i felt a deep despair settle upon my spirits for i knew that the air that blew would carry my ship away from me and that i must speedily drown i struggled hard to keep myself afloat freely breaking the water in the hope that the light and whiteness of it might be seen four or five minutes thus passed and i was feeling my legs growing weighty as lead when i noticed a light approach me my eyes being full of wet i could see no more than the light what held or bore it being eclipsed by the spikes or fibres that shot out of it as you notice a candle flame when the sight is damp I could also hear the dip and trickle of oars and tried to shout, but my brain was giddy, my mind sinking into a babbling state, and in truth I was so exhausted that but for the sudden life darted into me by the sight of the lamp, I am sure I should then and there have clenched my hands above my head and sunk. 
the lantern was flashed full upon my face and i was grasped by my hair he who seized me spoke and i believed it was the voice of one of the men in my watch though i did not catch a syllable of his speech after which i felt myself grasped under each arm and lifted out of the water whereupon i no doubt fainted for there is a blank between this and what followed though the interval must have been very short when i opened my eyes or rather when my senses returned to me i found myself lying on my back and the first thing i noticed was the moon shining weakly amid thin bodies of vapour which the wind had set in motion and which sped under her in puffs like the smoke of gunpowder after the discharge of a cannon i lay musing a little while conscious of nothing but the moon and some dark stretches of sail hovering above me but my mind gathering force i saw by the cut of the canvas that i was on board a strange ship and then did i observe three men standing near my feet watching me terror seized my heart i sprang erect with a loud cry of fear and rushed to the rail to see if the saracen was near that i might hail her but was stayed in that by being seized by the arm he who clutched me exclaimed in dutch what would you do if you could swim for a week you would not catch her i perfectly understood him but made no reply did not even look at him staring about the sea for the saracen in an anguish of mind not to be expressed suddenly i caught sight of the smudge of her and perceived she was heading away on her course she was out on our starboard beam i cast my eyes aloft and found the yards of the ship i was in braced up to meet the wind on the larboard tack whence i knew that every instant was widening the space between the two vessels on mastering this i could have dashed myself down on the deck with grief one of the group observing me as if i should fall extended his hand but i shrunk back with horror and covered my face whilst deep hysteric sobs burst from my breast for now without heeding any further appearances i knew that i was on board the phantom ship the sea spectre dreaded of mariners a fabric accursed by god in the presence of men dead and yet alive more terrible in their supernatural existence in their clothing of flesh whose human mortality had been rendered undecaying by a fate that shrunk up the soul in one to think of than had they been ghosts essences through which you might pass your hand as through a moonbeam i stood a while as though paralyzed but was presently rallied by the chill of the night wind striking through my streaming clothes a lantern was near where the three men were grouped no doubt the same that had been carried in the boat but the dim illumination would have sufficed for no more than to throw out the proportion of things within its sphere had it not been helped by the faint moonlight and a corpus sun that shone with the power of a planet close against the blocks of the jeers of the mainyard twas a ghostly radiance to behold the men in but i found nerve now to survey them there were three as i have said one very tall above six feet with a gray almost white beard that descended to his waist the second was a broad corpulent man of the true dutch build without hair on his face in the third man i could see nothing striking if it were not for a ruggedness of seafaring aspect i could not distinguish their apparel beyond that the stout man wore boots to the height of his knees whereas the tall personage was clad in black hose shoes with large buckles and breeches terminating at the knees their head-dresses were alike a sort of cap of skin with flaps for the ears do you speak dutch said the tallest of the three after eyeing me in silence 
whilst a man could have counted a hundred he it was who had responded to my hail from the saracen as my ear immediately detected now that i had my faculties by the deep organ-like melodiousness and tremor of his voice i answered yes why were your people afraid of us we intended no harm we desired but a little favor a small quantity of tobacco of which we are short this speech i followed though some of the words or the pronunciation of them were different from what i had been used to hear at rotterdam he spoke imperiously with a hint even of passion and rearing himself to his full stature clasped his hands behind him and stared at me as some indian king might at a slave sir said i speaking brokenly for i was a slow hand at his tongue and besides the chill of my clothes was now become a pain first let me ask what ship is this and who are you and your men who have rescued me from death the name of this ship is the brave he answered in his deep solemn voice i who command the vessel am known as cornelius vanderdecken the three seamen to whom you owe your life are frederick houtman john de bremen and this man indicating the rough uncouth person who stood on his left the mate herman van vogelaar i felt a sensation as of ice pressed to my chest when he pronounced his own name yet recollecting he had called his ship the brave i asked though twas wonderful he could follow my utterance what port do you belong to amsterdam where are you from batavia i said when did you sail on the twenty-second of july in last year by the glory of the holy trinity but it is dreary work see how the wind heads us even yet he sighed deeply and glanced aloft in a manner that suggested grievous weariness last year i thought a sudden elation expanding my soul and calming me as an opiate might if that be so why then though this ship had made a prodigiously long voyage of it from java to these parallels there is nothing wildly out of nature in such tardiness last year had i caught the true signification of the words he used pray sir said i speaking in as firm a voice as the shivers which chased me permitted what might last year be the mate van vogelaar growled out some exclamation i could not catch the captain made a gesture with his hands whilst their burly companion said in thick dutch accents it needs not salt water but good strong liquor to take away a hollander's brain last year exclaimed vanderdecken unbending his haughty imperious manner why mine here what should be last year? Chapter Thirteen of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Thirteen. Wiesen Alverdomd. When he said this, I felt like one in whom there is suddenly wrought a dual action of the brain where from one side so to say there is darted into the mind thoughts utterly illogical and insane which the other side marvels at and seeks to reject though if the fit linger the whole intelligence may be seized i recollect of seeking for confirmation of the words of the man who styled himself vanderdecken in the ship and of noticing for the first time that upon the planks of the deck which were out of the reach of the corpus sant 
were the same crawling elusive fires as of phosphorus creeping and coming and going upon a dark wall which i had observed on the vessel's sides several figures of men moved forward close beside me was a small gun of the kind carried by ships in the beginning of the last century termed a light saker and discharging a six-pound ball there were three of these on the larboard side and in the haze of the moonlight and the sheen of the jelly-like star that shone with a pure pale gold over my head i could discern upon the bulwarks of the quarter-deck and poop several swivels furnished with handles for pointing them i also observed a short flight of steps conducting to the quarter-deck with two sets of a like kind leading to the poop the front of which was furnished with a door and little window these matters i took in with a sweep of the eye for the light was confusing a faint erroneous ray glancing from imperfect surfaces and flinging half an image and then an indescribable fear possessing me again i looked in the direction where i had last beheld the smudge made by the saracen and not seeing her cried out wildly in my broken dutch sirs for the love of god follow my ship and make some signals that she may know i am here skipper exclaimed the smooth-faced corpulent man who proved to be the boatswain named antony jans after their cowardly inhumanity in firing upon a small unarmed boat and putting in peril the life of our mate van vogelaar we should have nothing more to do with her henceforth this englishman will know that the dutch are a merciful people said van vogelaar scornfully had our nationalities been reversed he would have been left to drown as a tribute to the courage of his comrades whilst this was said vanderdecken continued to regard me steadfastly and with great sternness then on a sudden relaxing his frown he exclaimed in that wondrous voice of his which put a solemn music into his least utterance come you shiver with the cold and have the look of the drowned jans send prins to me sir please to follow he motioned in a haughty manner towards the poop and walked that way one desperate look i cast round the sea and then with a prayer to god that this experience might prove some eclipse of my reason from which my mind would float out bright afresh ere long i followed the great figure of the captain but with a step so faltering from weakness and grief that he perceiving my condition took me by the elbow and supported me up the ladder to the cabin under the poop whether it was this courtesy or owing to a return of my manhood and i trust the reader will approve the candour with which i have confessed my cowardice whatever might be the reason i began now to look about me with a growing curiosity the interior into which captain vanderdecken conducted me was of a dingy yellowish hue such as age might complexion delicate white paint with an oil lamp of a very beautiful elegant and rare pattern furnished with eight panes of glass variously and all choicely colored with figures of birds flowers and the like though the opening at the bottom let the white light of the oil flame fall fair on to the table and the deck swung by a thin chain from a central beam the cabin was the width of the ship and on its walls were oval frames dusky as old mahogany each one as i suspected holding a painting over the door by which the cabin was entered was a clock and near it hung a cage with a parrot in it of ports i could see no remains and supposed that by day all the light that entered streamed through the windows on either side the door the deck was dark as with age at the after end there were two state cabins bulkheaded off from the living room each with a door the several colors of the lamp caused it to cast a radiance like a rainbow and therefore 
it was hard to make sure of objects amid such an intricacy of illumination but as i have said the sides of the cabin were a sickly dismal yellow and the furniture in it was formed of a very solid square table with legs marvellously carved and a box beneath it two benches on either hand and a black high-backed chair the back of withered velvet the wood framing it cut into many devices at the head or sternmost end of it all these things were matters to be quickly noticed the captain first removing his cap pointed to a bench and lifting his finger with a glance at the starboard cabin said in a low tone sir if you speak be it softly if you please and then directed his eyes towards the entrance from the deck standing erect with one hand on the table and manifestly waiting for the person he had styled prins to arrive a ruby-coloured lustre was upon his face his waist down was in the white lamplight he had a most noble port i thought such an elevation of the head such disdainful and determined erectness of figure as made his posture royal there was not the least hint in his face of the dutch flatness and insipidity of expression one is used to in those industrious but phlegmatic people his nose was aquiline the nostrils hidden by the mustachios which mingled with his noble druidical beard his forehead was square and heavy his hair was scanty yet abundant enough to conceal the skin of his head his eyes were black impassioned relentless and a ruby star now shone in each which gave them a forbidding and formidable expression as they moved under the shadow of his shaggy brows he wore a coat of stout cloth confined by buttons and a belt round his waist this with his small clothes which i have described formed a very puzzling apparel the like of which i had never seen there were no rents nor darns nor patches nothing to indicate that his attire was of great age yet there was something in this commanding person that caused me to know by feelings deeper than awe or even fear by instincts indeed not explicable such as must have urged in olden times the intelligence to the recognition of those supernatural beings you read of in scripture that he was not as i was as are other men who bear their natural parts in the procession from the cradle to the grave the tremendous and shocking fears of captain skevington recurred to me and methought as i gazed at the silent majestic seaman that the late master of the saracen who by his ending had shown himself a madman might as had other insane persons in their time have struck in one of his finer frenzies upon a horrible truth the mere fear of which caused me to press my hands to my eyes with a renewal of mental anguish and to entreat in a swift prayer to that being whom he who stood before me had defied for power to collect my mind and for quick deliverance from this awful situation not a syllable fell from the captain till the arrival of prins a parched-faced bearded man habited in a coarse woolen shirt trousers of the stuff we call fear not and an old jacket he made nothing of my presence nor condition scarce glancing at me get this englishman a change of clothes said the captain take what may be needful from my cabin they will hang loose on him but must serve till his own are dry quick you see he shivers all this was expressed in dutch but as i have before said of an antique character and therefore not quickly to be followed whence i will not pretend that i give exactly all that was spoken though the substance of it is accurately reported the man styled prins went to the larboard cabin at the end whilst the captain going to the table pulled from under it a great drawer which i had taken to be a chest 
from which he lifted a silver goblet and a strangely fashioned stone bottle drink sir he exclaimed with a certain arrogant impetuosity in his way of pouring out the liquor and extending the goblet twas neat brandy and the dose a large mouthful i tossed down the whole of it and placed the goblet that was very heavy and sweetly chaste on the table with a bow of thanks that will put fire into your blood said he returning the cup and bottle to the drawer and then folding his arms and looking at me under his contracted brows with his back to the lantern whilst he leaned against the table are you fresh from your country i told him that we had sailed in april from the thames and had lately come out of table bay is there peace between your nation and mine he inquired speaking softly as though he feared to awaken some sleeper though let his utterance be what it would twas always melodious and rich i answered no it grieves me to say it but our countries are still at war i will not pretend sir that great britain has acted with good faith towards the batavian republic their high mightinesses resent the infraction of treaties they protest against the manner in which the island of st eustatia was devastated they hope to recover the cape of good hope and likewise their possessions in the indies more particularly their great coromandel factory mere courtesy would have taught me to speak as soothingly as possible of such things though but for the brandy i doubt if my teeth would not have chattered too boisterously for the utterance of even the few words i delivered in honest truth i felt an unspeakable awe and fear in addressing this man who surveyed me with the severest most scornful gaze imaginable from the height of his regal stature of what are you speaking he exclaimed after a frowning stare of amazement then waved his hand with a gesture half of pity half of disdain you have been perilously close to death he continued and this idle babble will settle into good sense when you have shifted and slept he smiled contemptuously with a half look around as though he sought another of his own kind to address and said as one thinking aloud if tromp and evertsons and de witt and de reuter have not yet swept them off the seas tis only because they have not had time to complete the easy task as he said this the clock over the door struck two the chimes had a hollow cathedral-like sound as though indeed it was the clock of a cathedral striking in the distance glancing at the direction whence these notes issued i was just in time to witness the acting of an extraordinary piece of mechanism that is to say there arose to the top of the clock case that was of some species of metal the dial plate of blue enamel protected with horn instead of glass there arose i say the figure of a skeleton imitated to the life holding in one hand an hour-glass on which he turned his eyeless sockets by a movement of the head whilst with the other hand he grasped a lance or spear that as i afterwards perceived he flourished to every stroke of the clock-bell as though he pierced something prostrate at his feet the figure shrank into the inside of the clock when the chimes were over as if to complete the bewilderment under which i laboured scarce had the second chime of the clock rung its last vibration when a harsh voice croaked out in dutch wie in alverdomd i started and cried out involuntarily and faintly my god it was the parrot that spoke said captain vanderdecken with a softening of his looks though he did not smile tis the only sentence she seems able to pronounce it was all she could say when i bought her have you had her long sir i inquired feeling as though i lay a dreaming i bought her from a chinaman of batavia two days before we sailed as a gift for my eldest daughter 
here he was interrupted by the arrival of prins the clothes are ready skipper said he on this vanderdecken motioning me to be silent a piece of behavior that was as puzzling as all other things conducted me to the cabin from which prins had emerged and viewing the clothes upon the bed said yes they will do wear them mynheer till yours have been dried leave this door on the hook you will then get light enough for your purpose from yonder lamp the dress consisted of warm knitted stockings breeches of an old pattern and a coat with a great skirt embellished with metal buttons several of which were missing and the remains of some gold lace upon the cuffs in addition there was a clean linen shirt and a pair of south american hide boots fawn colored twas like clothing myself for a masquerade to dress in such things but for all that i was mighty pleased and grateful to escape from my own soaked attire which by keeping the surface of the body cold prohibited my nerves from regaining their customary tone i went to work nimbly observing that captain vanderdecken waited for me and was soon shifted but not before i had viewed the cabin which i found to be spacious enough the bed was curious being what we term a four-poster the upper ends of the posts cleated to the ceiling whilst the lower legs were in the form of dolphins and had one time been gilt with gold there were curtains to it of faded green silk as i judged ragged in places there were lockers a small table on which lay a forestaff or crossstaff as it was often called a rude ancient instrument used for measuring the altitude of the sun before the introduction of hadley's quadrant and formed of a wooden staff having a scale of degrees and parts of degrees marked upon it and cross pieces which could be moved along it by it stood a sand glass for turning to tell the time by against the bulkhead that separated this from the adjoining cabin were hung two oxide mirrors the frames whereof had been gilt also four small paintings in oak colored borders richly beaded i could see that they were portraits of females dim the hues being faded the ceiling of this cabin showed traces of having been once on a time very handsomely painted with the hand other things i noticed were a copper speaking trumpet and an ancient perspective glass such as poets of vanderdecken's time would style an optic tube very weighty and formed of two tubes this thing stood on brackets under which hung a watch of as true a sphere as an orange and of the size of one indeed look where you would you could not fail to guess how stout and noble a ship this brave as her captain named her must have been in those distant years which witnessed her birth my costume made me feel ridiculous enough for whereas the boots might have belonged to a period when shelvoc and clipperton were plundering the spaniards in the south seas the coat was of a fashion of about thirty years past whilst the breeches were such as merchant captains and mates wore when i was first going to sea however being changed and dry i stepped forth bearing my wet clothes with me but they were immediately taken from me by prins who had been standing near the door unperceived by me on my appearing captain vanderdecken rose from the chair at the head of the table but seemed to find nothing in my dress to amuse him the vari-coloured light was extremely confusing and it was with the utmost pains that i could discern the expression of his face but so far as i made out it was one of extreme melancholy touched with lights and shades by his moods which yet left the prevailing character unchanged will you go to rest said he i am willing to do whatever you desire said i your kindness is great and i thank you for it i he replied 
spite of the war i'd liefer serve an englishman than one of any other country the old and the young commonwealths should be friends on either hand there are mighty hearts you in your blakes your ice cues your monks we in our van tromp whom the king of denmark to my great joy before i sailed honorably justified to the people of holland and in van gael in reuter with other skilled and lion-hearted men whom i shall glory in greeting on my return he seemed to reflect a moment and suddenly cried with a passionate sparkle in his eyes but twas cowardly in your captain to order his men to fire upon our boat what did we seek such tobacco as you could have spared which we were willing to purchase by the vengeance of heaven twas a deed unworthy of englishmen i did not dare explain the true cause and said gently sir our captain lay dead in his cabin the men missing the chief fell into a panic at the sight of this ship for she showed large in the dusk and we feared you meant to lay us aboard enough he exclaimed imperiously follow me to your cabin he led the way on to the chapter fourteen of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the death ship by william clark russell chapter fourteen my first night in the death ship i had been in too great a confusion of mind to heed the movements of the ship whilst i was under cover but on emerging i now noticed that it had come on to blow very fresh the vessel under larboard tacks i could not see what canvas she carried lay along very much being light and tall and rolled with peculiar clumsiness in the hollows i caught sight of the water over the weather rail and judged with the eye of a seaman that what progress she was making was wholly leeway so that we were being blown dead to the eastward without probably reaching as it is termed by so much as half a knot an hour the moon was now deep in the west and showing a very wan and stormy disk northwest where the land lay the sea looked to rise into a fluid blackness of thunder clouds wherefrom even as i glanced that way there fell a red gash of lightning there was a heavy sound of seething and bombarding billows all about us and the whole picture had a wildness past language what with the scarlet glare of the northern levin brands and the ghastly tempestuous paleness of the westering moon and a dingy faintness owing its existence to i know not what if it were not the light of the foaming multitudinous surge reflected upon the sooty bosoms of the lowering clouds over our stern captain vanderdecken stood for a moment looking round upon this warring scene and flung up his arms towards the moon with a passionate savage gesture and then strode to a narrow hatch betwixt the limits of the quarter-deck and the mainmast down which he went first turning to see if i followed i now found myself in a kind of tween decks with two cabins on either hand in the doorway of the fore one on the starboard side stood the man prins holding a small lantern this sir said vanderdecken pointing to the cabin must serve you for a sleeping room it has not the comfort of an inn but tis easy to see you are a sailor and therefore one to whom a plank will often be a soft couch in any case here is accommodation warmer than the bottom of the ocean with a cold and condescending salute he withdrew prins hung the lantern on to a rail beside the door and said he would return for it shortly 
i wanted to ask the man some questions about the ship and her commander but there was something about him so scaring and odd that i could not summon up heart to address him he appeared as one in whom all qualities of the soul are dead acting in sooth like a sleepwalker giving me not the least heed whatever and going about his business as mechanically as the skeleton in the cabin clock rose and darted his lance to the chimes of the bell the compartment in which i was to sleep was empty of all furniture saving a locker that served as a seat as well as a box and a wooden sleeping place formed of planks secured to the side in which in lieu of a mattress were a couple of stout blankets tolerably new and a sailor's bag filled with straw for a pillow i was wearied to the bone yet not sleepy and lay me down in my strange clothes without so much as removing my boots and in a few minutes prins arrived and took away the light and there i was in pitch darkness and yet i should not say this for though to be sure no sensible reflection penetrated the blackness yet when the lamp was removed and my eyes had lost the glare of it i beheld certain faint crawlings and swarmings of phosphoric light upon the beams and bulkheads such as were noticeable upon the outside of the ship only not so strong i likewise observed a cold and ancient smell such as i recollect once catching the breath of in the hold of a ship that had been built in seventeen o two and which people in the year seventeen ninety one or thereabouts viewed as a curiosity otherwise there was nothing else remarkable whatever this vessel might be her motion on the seas was as natural as that of the saracen only that her wallowing was more ponderous and ungainly yet merciful heaven how did every bulkhead groan how did every timber complain how did every tree nail cry aloud the noise of the laboring was truly appalling the creaking straining jarring as though the whole fabric were being dashed to pieces i had not immediately noticed this when i followed captain vanderdecken below but it grew upon my ears as i lay in the blackness yet they were natural sounds and as such they afforded a sort of relief to my strained brain and nervous yea and affrighted imagination the stillness of a dead calm would have maddened me i truly believe phantasms and other horrors of my fancy rendered delirious by the situation into which i had been plunged would have played their parts upon that stage of blackness hideous with the vault-like stirring of the glow of rotted timber to the destruction of my intellect but for the homely thunder of the sea without Chapter 15 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 15 I Inspect the Flying Dutchman. I had scarcely fully woke up when the man prins opened the cabin door and peered in and perceiving me to be awake he entered bearing a metal pitcher of water an earthenware dish and a rough cloth for drying the skin he put down the dish so that it could not slide for the ship was rolling very heavily and then poured water into it and said as he was in the act of withdrawing with the pitcher the skipper is on the poop I answered by asking him for my clothes. He shook his bearded, parchment-colored face and said, They are still sodden, and immediately went out. I might have guessed they could not be dry, 
but i presented so hideous a figure in the apparel that had been lent to me that i should have been glad to resume my own coat and breeches wet or no wet but there was no help for it i rose and plunged my face in the cold water used my fingers for a comb which sufficed since i commonly wore my hair rough having much of it and hating a tie and putting on my hat that had held to my head in the water and that had not been taken from me to dry i stepped out of the cabin climbed the steps that led through the hatch and gained what was in former times termed the upper deck for let me make you understand me by explaining that beginning right aft first there was a poop deck elevated above the quarter deck which in its turn was raised above the upper deck along which you walked till you arrived at the forecastle that went flush or level to the bows and was fortified by tall stout bulwarks with ports for forechasers for some considerable while i stood near the hatch gazing about me as this was my first view of the ship by daylight right opposite soared the mainmast an immensely thick made spar weightier than we should now think of using for a craft twice this vessel's size the top was a large circular platform protected by a fence work half as tall as a man looped for the projection of pieces such as culverins matchlocks and the like under the top hung the mainyard the sail was reefed and the yard had been lowered and it lay at an angle that made me understand that but little was to be done with this ship on a bow line the shrouds which were very stout though scarce one of them was of the thickness of another came down over the side to the channels there and the ratlines were all in their places only that here again there was great inequality in the various sizes of the stuff used there were iron hoops round the masts all of them rusty cankered and some of them nearly eaten up i looked at the combing of the hatch and observing a splinter put my hand to it and found the wood so rotten that methought it would powder and i turned the piece about betwixt my thumb and forefinger but the miraculous qualities of the accursed fabric were in it and iron could not have been more stubborn to my pinching the guns which i had on the previous night recognized as an ancient kind of ordnance called sakers were as rusty and eaten into as the mast hoops i ascended the quarter-deck and perceiving vanderdecken standing on the poop went up to him touching my hat as a sailor's salute but the coat i was rigged out in was so outrageously clumsy and ample that the wind which blew very hard indeed filling and distending the skirts of it was within an ace of upsetting me but happily a lurch of the ship swept me towards a mizzen backstay to which i contrived to cling until i had recovered my breath and the surprise i was under there was a small house in the middle of this poop about ten feet from where the head of the tiller would come when amidships possibly designed for the convenience of the captain and officers for making their calculations when in narrow waters and for the storing of their marine instruments flags and the like be that as it may captain vanderdecken beckoned me to it and under the lee of it the shelter was such as to enable us to easily converse i looked at him as closely as i durst his eyes were extraordinarily piercing and passionate with the cruel brilliance in them such as may be noticed in the insane the lower part of his face was hidden in hair but the skin of as much of it as was visible for his cap was dragged low down upon his brows was pale of a haggard sallowness expressed best in paintings of the dead where time has produced the original whiteness of the pigment 
it was impossible that i should have observed this in him in the many-coloured lamplight of the preceding night yet did not his graveyard complexion detract from the majesty and imperiousness of his mien and port i could readily conceive that the defiance of his heart would be hell-like in obstinacy and that here was a man whose pride and passions would qualify him for a foremost place among the most daring of those fallen spirits of whom our glorious poet has written he was habited as when i first saw him we stood together against this deck-house and whilst he remained silent for some moments meanwhile keeping his eyes fixed on me my gaze went from him to the ship and the sea around us it was a thick leaden angry morning such weather as we had had a dose of in that storm i wrote about and of which forerunners might have been found on the preceding night in the lightning in the northwest and in the halo that girdled the moon but it was the sight of the ancient ship that rendered the warring ocean so strange a scene that had i never before witnessed a storm at sea i could not have wondered more at what i saw she was lying too under her reefed fore and mainsail surging dead to leeward on every send of the billows and travelling the faster for the great height of side she showed from time to time a sea would strike her with a severe shock upon the bow or the waist and often curl over in a mighty hissing and seething though the wet quickly poured away overboard through the ports through the skeleton iron frame of what had once been a great poop lantern the blast yelled like an imprisoned maniac and shook the metal with a sound as of clanking chains the captain having inspected me narrowly asked me how i had slept i answered well for i was now resolved to present a composed front to this man and his mates be they and their ship what they would i had given my nerves play and it was about time i recollected i was an englishman and a sailor all vessels but mine said he in his thrilling organ-like voice glancing about him with a scowl catch the luck of the wind had the weather lingered as it was for another three days we should have had agulas on the beam and the ship's head northwest tis bitter hard these encounters of storms when a few hours of fair wind would blow us round the cape he clenched his hands fiercely and shot a fiery glance at the windward horizon just then the man styled herman von vogelar the mate arrived and without taking the least notice of me said something to the captain but what i did not catch it doubtless referred to some job he had been sent forward to see to i was greatly struck by the rugged weather-beaten look of this man his face in the daylight discovered a mere surface of knobs and warts and wrinkles with a nose the shape of one end of a plantain that has been cut in two and little misty eyes deep in their holes and surrounded by yellow lashes his dress was that of a sailor of my own time but what affected and impressed me even more than did the utter indifference manifested towards my presence by him and by the helmsman as though indeed i was as invisible as the wind was the pallor underlying the lineaments of this mate had i been asked what would be the complexion of men dug up from their graves after lying there i should have pointed to the countenances of vanderdecken and van vogelaar yes and to prins and the seamen who steered it was in truth as though captain skevington had hit the frightful reality in his dark and dreadful ideas touching the crew of this ship 
being men who presented the aspect they would have offered at the time of their death and who wearing that death-bed appearance were doomed to complete the sentence passed upon them no longer pensioners on the bounty of an hour as the poet young terms us mortals but wretches rendered supernatural by the impiety of that fierce but noble figure whose falcon flashing eye looked curses at the gale whilst i watched him the mate left us and went to the helmsman by whose side he stood as if conning the ship the captain showed no heed of my presence for a minute or two when glancing at me he said tis fortunate you speak dutch though your pronunciation has a strange sound for my part i just know enough of your tongue to hail a ship and to say i will send a boat where did you learn my language i picked it up during several voyages i made to rotterdam i replied do you know amsterdam no sir said i he mused a little and then said they will think me lost or sunk by the guns of the enemy add the long and tedious passage out to the months which have passed since last july he sighed deeply when did you sail from amsterdam sir i inquired for i was as particular as he to say mine here on the first of november he answered in what year said i he cried out fiercely are your senses still overboard that you repeat that question certainly last year when else i looked down upon the deck i have reason to remember my passage through the narrow seas continued he speaking in a softened voice as though his sense of courtesy upbraided him i sighted the squadron of your admiral askew and a frigate hauled out in chase of me but the brave was too fleet for her and at dusk we had sunk the englishman to his lower yards as he said this i felt yet again the chill of a dread i had hoped to vanquish strike upon my senses like the air of a vault upon the face it was impossible that i could now miss seeing how it was if this man together with his crew were not endeviled as captain skevington had surmised yet it was certain that life was terminated in him with the curse his wickedness had called down upon his ship and her wretched crew existence had come to a stand in his brain with him it was forever the year of our lord sixteen fifty three time had been drowned in the eternity of the punishment that had come upon him i lifted my startled eyes to vanderdecken's face and convulsively clasped my hands whilst i thought of the mighty chapter of history which had been written since his day and of the ashes of events prodigious in their time and in memory still which covered as do the lava and scoria the rocks of some volcanic created island the years from the hour of his doom down to the moment of our meeting the peace of sixteen fifty four the later war of sixteen sixty five reuter at sheerness and chatham and in the hope a stadtholder of vanderdecken's country becoming a king of england the peace of ryswick malplaquet the semi gallican founding of the batavian republic with how much more that my memory did not carry all as non-existent to this man at my side as to any human creature who had died at the hour when the death ship sailed on her last passage home from the Chapter 16 of The Death Ship. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 16. Vanderdecken shows me his present for little Margareta. At this moment, Prince stepped on to the poop and informed the captain that breakfast was ready. Sir, said Vanderdecken to me, with a courtesy that I guessed to be as capricious as his passion, you will have feared I meant to starve you. No, mynheer, I replied. You will find our fair poor, he continued, but please follow me. Sir, said I, forgive me if I detain you for an instant. I am too sensible of your kindness not to desire that you will enable me to merit it by serving you in the navigation of the ship in any capacity you choose to name until we meet with a vessel that shall rid you of my presence. You appear to have but a poor opinion of us, Dutch, said he, still speaking with courtesy. Be pleased to know that a Hollander is never happier than in relieving distress. But come, sir, the shelter of the cabin will be grateful to you after this stormy deck. I said no more, and gathering the flapping skirts of the coat on me to my side, that the gale might not sweep me off my legs, I followed him into the cabin under the poop, marveling as I went at the miracle wrought on behalf of this ship, that her hold should still yield provisions and water for her crew after a century and a half of use. Now you will have deemed by this time that I had supped full enough of surprises, but conceive of my astonishment on entering the cabin that was less darksome than I should have conceived it, on seeing a girl of from eighteen or twenty years of age seated at the table on the right hand of the captain's chair. I came to a stand, struck motionless with astonishment, whilst she, uttering an exclamation of surprise, hastily rose and stood staring at me, leaning with her right hand on the table to steady herself. It was a certain that she had been as ignorant of my presence on board as I, to this instant of her existence. The thought that instantly flashed upon me was that she was Vanderdecken's daughter, that the curse that had fallen on the ship included her, as it had all others of the vessel's miserable company of men, and that, in consonance with Captain Skevington's mad but astonishing theory, touching the people of this death-ship, she discovered the appearance she would have presented at the hour of her death, though vitalized in that aspect by the sentence that kept the brava afloat and her people quick and sentient. I was the more willing to suppose this by her apparel, which was of the kind I had seen in old Dutch paintings at Rotterdam, for it consisted of a black velvet jacket, very beautifully fitting her figure, trimmed with fur and enriched with many small golden buttons, a green silk gown, plain and very full, as though made for a bigger woman. There was a rope of pearls round her neck, and I spied a diamond of great splendor blazing on the forefinger of the hand on which she leaned, she wore small red shoes, and her hair was undressed. All this I saw, and more yet, for whilst I stood looking at her, the mate of the ship, Van Vogelaar, arrived, and both he and the captain and the man Prince, turning their faces towards me, the warmth, the life of her skin, the living reality of her surprise, the redness of her lips, the diamond glance of her eyes, were so defined by the paleness, the deathly hue of the flesh of the men's skin, that the fear that she was of this doomed company fell from me, and I knew that I was face to face with one that was mortal like myself. The captain pointed to the bench on his left hand. I approached the table, giving the girl a low bow before sitting. She curtsied and resumed her seat but all the while looking at me with an astonishment that greatly heightened her beauty. Nor could I fail to see by the slight but visible changes in the expression of her mouth that my presence was putting a pleasure in her that grew as perception of my actuality sharpened in her mind. A coarse but clean cloth that was a kind of deck or drill covered the table, and upon it were a couple of dishes of cold meat, a dish of dried fish, 
another of dried plantains a jar of marmalade and a plate of a singular sort of cakes yellow and heavy resembling the crumb of newly baked bread these things were kept in their places by a rude framework of wood set upon the table and lashed to it underneath before each person there stood a silver cup one of one design and size another of another also an earthen plate of a grey colour of chinese baking and of the kind exported years since in great quantities from batavia and a knife and fork of a pattern i had never before seen on our seating ourselves prins went round the table with two jars one holding a spirit which i afterwards found was a kind of gin and the other cold water with which he manufactured a bumper for us three men but the girl drank the water plain not a word was said whilst prins was at this work as he was filling my cup the clock over the door struck eight the skeleton appearing and flourishing his lance as before and scarce was this ended when the parrot croaked out vis in al verdon i had forgotten this bird and the harsh utterance and dreadful words coming upon me unawares so startled me that i half sprang to my feet the girl looked down on the table with a sad face whilst vanderdecken said tis the clock that excites that fowl we shall have to hang her out of hearing of it he never offered to make me known to the fair creature opposite but that did not signify for after stealing several peeps at me she asked in dutch but with the artless manner of a child and in a sweet voice if i was a hollander i answered no i am an englishman madam feeling the blood warm in my face through the mere speaking with so delicate a beauty i too am english she cried in our own tongue indeed i exclaimed transported out of myself by hearing this and by perceiving how warm real and living she was but in the name of heaven how is it that you are alone upon this strange ship amid these mysterious men for that question i could no more forbear asking right out than i could conceal the admiration in my eyes whilst i felt no diffidence in talking as i made no doubt the english language was unintelligible to the others she swiftly glanced at me but did not answer i took this as a hint and was silent and yet it did not seem that vanderdecken or van vogelaar heeded us they appeared as men sunk in deep abstraction even whilst they ate and drank some meat was put before me prins offered me a cake and being hard set i fell to i found the meat salt but sweet and tender enough and turning to the mate asked him what it was antelope he replied yonder pointing to the other dish is buffalo sir exclaimed vanderdecken with a wonderful stateliness in his manner be pleased to despise ceremony here such as our fare is you are welcome take as you may require and prins will fill your cup as often as you need i bowed and thanked him the wind blows hard imogene said he addressing the girl it storms directly along the path we would take it is miserable he continued turning to me that a change of weather should come upon us just about those parts where the breeze freshened into the scale last night but we'll force her to windward yet hey herman though though he looked at the lady he had named imogene and halted abruptly in his speech but i noticed he could not quickly clear his face of the passionate mad look that darkened it though it did not qualify the paleness of the skin but was like the shadow of a heavy storm cloud passing over the upward gazing features of a dead man the countenances of the mate and prince darkened to his savage mood may heaven pardon me for the thought but when i considered the bitter vexation of a head-wind and how this vessel was being blown dead away to leeward faster than any line of battle ship hove to i could not but secretly feel a sailor's sympathy with these unhappy persons though that this would have been the case had vanderdecken expressed with his tongue the fearful thoughts which he looked with his eyes i do not think possible if i know myself at all there fell a silence among us through which we could hear the dreary howling of the wind the falls of heavy masses of water upon the decks and the lamentable complaining of the whole fabric though as these noises were chiefly in the hold the notes rose somewhat dulled 
presently feeling it indecorous in me to sit silent i asked the captain what his cargo was he answered we have much wrought and raw silk and cloves musk nutmegs mason pepper wood for dyeing drugs calicoes lacquer ware and such commodities sir and how many of a crew sir van vogelaar turned to look at me ask no questions exclaimed the girl in english you will be misunderstood our guns are few but the brave is a swift ship said the mate with a very stern and sullen expression on his rugged face she has outsailed one english frigate and by this time our admirals should have left as little to fear from the fleets of your cromwell pray said the lady addressing vanderdecken and glancing in like a sunbeam upon this sudden darkness of temper tell me of this gentleman how it happens he is here i find he is my countryman converse with me about him if it were possible for human affection to touch into softness the fierce majestic countenance of the noble-looking being whose mien as he sat at the table might have been that of some dethroned emperor with the pride of lucifer to sustain him i might seem to have witnessed the tenderness of it in his ashen bearded face when he turned the cold glitter of his eyes upon the girl we spoke his ship late last night when thou wast asleep imogen and van vogelaar went in our boat to buy tobacco if they were willing to sell but on seeing the boat they fired upon her a light air blew and the ship moved away our boat was returning when she spied this gentleman fast drowning van vogelaar dragged him out of the water and here he is saluting me with a grave inclination of the head had we changed places said the stormy-minded rugged mate what would have been my fate a color flashed into imogene's face and she cried oh here von vogelaar your pardon if you please english seamen are as humane as they are brave yes said the mate with a sneer that rendered his ugliness quite horrible with the distortion of it because english sailors are brave they fire upon an inoffensive boat and because they are humane they leave their comrade to perish madam i said softly the character of this ship was known to us she slightly raised her eyes and such a sadness came into them that i feared to see her shed tears meanwhile vanderdecken had his gaze fixed upon me he seemed to be musing upon what the mate had said it was your commodore young said he in his resonant voice that to be sure sounded grandly after the harsh pipes of the mate who provoked us why should your nation exact the honour of the flag has it bred greater seamen than holland there is my friend willem Schouten. many a pipe when i was a young man have i smoked with him in his summer-house at horn does even your drake surpass Schouten? no no it was not for england to be mistress of the seas he exclaimed with a solemn shake of the head not wanting in a grave kind of urbanity i caught a glance from the girl but i needed no hint to keep my tongue still twas maddening and terrifying enough to hear this man speak of Schouten as a friend Schouten, who greatly headed the grand processions of mariners such as dampier byron anson and many others who since his day have sailed round that cape horn which the stout hollander was the first to pass into name into the great south sea and yet spite of the effect produced upon me by this man's speech and references i was sensible of a distinct pricking of my conscience by my patriotism to hear england sneered at by the natives of a country which has been described by a poet that flourished in the days of blake and trump as the offscouring of the british sand and as the undigested vomit of the sea was by no means to my liking but to remonstrate would have been but a mere warring with the dead the captain appeared to delight to talk of the war between the dutch and the english i remember that he praised our commodore boldly and said that if the state's ambassador adrian pa had been a person of understanding the treaty might have stood this i recollect but very little more for to be plain it was not only a frightful thing to listen to him 
but my thoughts were thrown into the utmost confusion by the loveliness of the lady who confronted me by the assurance of the sweet eyes warm colour and her maidenly youth which lived in every movement word smile or sad look of hers that she was no true member of the unholy and fearful company she lived amongst by my wondering how she came to be in this death ship and how it happened that she was finely dressed not to speak of other speculations such as how the food upon the table was provided and by what means this ship which i knew had been struggling against the will of the omnipotent for hard upon one hundred and fifty years should be supplied with a liberal stock of the conveniences of life but we had now done eating the mate rose and quitted the table but his place was shortly afterwards taken by another man whom i had not before seen the second mate as i afterwards discovered named antony Arents. this person looked to be about fifty years of age he wore high boots and a cloak and a soft flapping hat which he threw down on entering his left eye had a cast and the bridge of his nose was broken that his countenance was of the true dutch character and in some points he was like the boatswain antony jans whom i had seen on deck when waking into consciousness only that he had less flesh to his belly but in him was the same ghastly hue of skin you saw in the others twas in his hands as in his face and you come across him in his sleep you would have said he had been dead some days and indeed never did i view a corpse made ready for casting overboard that had the aspect of the dead so strong upon it as these men he helped himself to food taking not the least notice of me prins meanwhile had put a box of tobacco and some long clay pipes upon the table one of which vanderdecken took and filled asking me to smoke i thanked him wondering what sort of tobacco time had converted this weed into took the tinder-box from the captain and lighted my pipe well if this was an ancient tobacco age had not spoilt its qualities it smoked very sweet and sound we are on short allowance said the captain our stock has run low it will be a hardship if we should come to want tobacco i made no reply being determined to learn all i could about this ship and her people from miss imogene before offering suggestions for though there is no living man whose nose i would not offer to stroke for calling me a coward yet i am not ashamed to say this captain vanderdecken terrified me and i feared his wrath the girl with her elbows on the table and her fair chin resting on her hands which made an ivory cup for her face watched me continuously with eyes whose brightness the large and sparkling diamond on her forefinger did not match by many degrees of glory are you long from england says she to me presently in dutch that vanderdecken might know what we talked about we sailed in april last i replied and you madam she either did not hear the question or would not answer are you married asked the captain of me smoking very slowly to get the true relish of the tobacco whilst the second mate chewed his food with vacant eyes squinting straight ahead or meeting in a traverse on his plate no sir i replied are your parents living he said my mother is alive i answered ah said he speaking as one in a reverie a sailor should not marry what is more uncertain than the sea the mariner's wife can never make sure of her husband's return what will mine be thinking if we continue to be blown back as we are now by these westerly gales it seems longer than months yea it appears to me to be years since i last beheld her and my daughters standing near the schreier's thorn weeping and waving their farewells to me my eldest girl gertruda will be grown sick at heart with her long yearning for the parcel of silk i have for her and margaretha he sighed softly then turning to imogene he said my dear show this gentleman the toy i am taking home for my little margaretha she rose with a look of pain in her face and stepped to the cabin that was next the captain's i now understood why he had desired me to speak in subdued tones last night for that was the room in which she slept the ease with which she moved upon that heaving deck was wonderful and this verse of a ballad came into my head as i watched her go from the table to her cabin no form he saw of mortal mould it shone like ocean's snowy foam 
her ringlets waved in living gold her mirror crystal pearl her comb ay the ocean might have owned her for a child with such dainty elegant ease did she accommodate her form to the sweep and heave of its billows as denoted by the motions of the ship as some lovely gull with breast of snowy down and wings of ermine airily expresses the swing and charge of the surge by its manner of falling in each hollow and lifting above each head on outstretched pinion her costume too that was so strange a thing giving to this interior so romantic an appearance that had the ship been still and he had looked in it at the cabin door then with this lady's beauty and dress the majestic figure of vanderdecken smoking in his high-backed chair the second mate at his food prins standing like one that dreams all the faces but the girl's and mine ghastly the strange beauty of the lamp that swung over the table the oval frames holding paintings so bleared and dusky that it was difficult to make out the subjects the dim and wasted color of the cabin walls and the bald tawdriness of what had been rich gilt work the clock of ancient pattern the parrot cage i say had you been brought on a sudden to view this interior from the door you might have easily deemed it some large astonishing picture painted to the very height of the greatest master's perfection in a moment or two miss imogene returned and coming to the table placed upon it a little figure about five inches tall it was of some metal and had been gaily coloured as i supposed from what was left of the old tents its style was a red cloak falling down its back a small cap with a feather shoes almost hidden with great rosettes hose as high as the thigh and then a sort of blouse with a girdle both arms hung before in a very easy and natural posture and the hands grasped a flute vanderdecken putting down his pipe took a key from under the cloak of the figure and wound the automaton up as a clock when it instantly lifted the flute to its mouth in the exact manner of life and played a tune the sound was very pure though piercing the melody simple and flowing in all the figure played six tunes without any sound of the clockwork within and it was undoubtedly a very curious and costly toy the second mate stalked out in the middle of this performance having finished his meal and showing no more sensibility to what was doing than did the table the figure played on the eyes of the man prince had a sickly far-away look to be imagined only for no one could describe it vanderdecken lighted his pipe when the automaton struck up and nodded gravely to the fluting with as much pleasure in his face as so fierce and haughty a countenance could express the girl stood leaning upon the table with a listlessness in her manner and constantly regarding me scarce had the sixth tune been played when the parrot called out from his cage vice and alverdant clearly showing that she knew when the entertainment was over her pronouncing these words in dutch robbed them somewhat to my ear of their tremendous import but still it was a terrible sentence for the creature to have lighted on and i wondered what her age was for she could not have been newly hatched when vanderdecken bought her as he had told me she then spoke the same words however the captain was full of his flute player and neither he nor imogene noticed the parrot this should delight my little margaretta said he lifting the figure and examining it tis as cunning a toy as ever i saw i bought it at batavia from an old friend of mine moves mindered zumbacher who had purchased it of a sailor belonging to the company ship revoluti for eight ducats twill rejoice my child you shall present it to her imogene i would not sell it for five hundred dollars tis worthy to be john muller's work he ceased speaking lifting his hand then exclaimed hark how the wind continues to storm he gave the figure to the girl who returned it to her cabin in a few minutes he put down his pipe and bade prins bring him his skin or fur cap and then rose impressing me as keenly as though i viewed him for the first time by the nobility of his stature his great beard flowing to the waist the sharp supernatural fires in his eyes as if the light there were living flames in silence he quitted the cabin
Chapter Seventeen of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Seventeen. I talk with Miss Imogene Dudley about the Death Ship. Being in the way now of enjoying a talk with Imogene, the ridiculousness of the dress I was in struck me, and I asked Prins, who was clearing the table, whether my own clothes were yet dry. He answered they were hung up in the furnace near the cookhouse, by which I suppose he meant the caboose, and that when they were dry he would bring them to my cabin. "'In these things,' said I, addressing Imogene in English, whilst I turned my head about to catch a sight of my tails, I feel like a fool in a carnival. What ages this garb represents I cannot conceive, but it surely does not represent less than a century of fashion. And what must you think of my attire? said she, seating herself in the captain's chair, which her beauty made a throne of in a breath, the light of her hair gilding it. But all things are wonderful here, she added, with a half-glance at Prins, whose movements and manner as he removed the dishes from the table were as deaf and soulless as the behavior of the figure that had just piped to us. You know, of course, what ship this is. I said, yes, in a subdued voice, and sat down on the end of the bench near her, adding, will the captain take it amiss if we converse? No, she answered, but should he forbid it and then find you speaking to me, his temper would be dreadful. He is a terribly passionate man. Yet he is gentle to me, and speaks of his wife and children with exquisite tenderness. His wife and children! God help him! Oh, she cried, trembling, I cannot express to you the horror and pain I feel when I hear him talk of them as though he should find them as they were, altered by the length of a year only, when he parted from them. He does not know that he is cursed, none of them on board this ship know it of themselves is that so i exclaimed surely their repeated failures to pass the agulis point must convince them that the will of god is opposed to their attempts and that they are doomed men if you please what name am i to know you by she asked geoffrey fenton i answered and you i'm Jean dudley i bowed to her and she continued are you a sailor I raised my hands half mockingly and said, Do I not look my calling? But recollecting my apparel, I burst into a laugh and exclaimed, touching the faded finery upon the cuff of my coat, You will have thought me a, a beetle or a footman. She shook her head, smiling, but instantly grew grave and now spoke in a more earnest voice. I will tell you all I know about this ship and about myself. My father was Captain Dudley of Portsmouth and nearly five years ago, as closely as I can reckon time, where time has ceased to all the others, he commanded a ship named the Flying Fish, and took me and my mother with him on a voyage to China. We called it Table Bay, but when we were off the coast where Algoa Bay is situated, the ship was set on fire by one of the crew entering the hold with a lighted candle and attempting to steal some rum. The flames quickly raged, the ship was not to be saved, the boats were lowered, and my mother and I and a seaman entered one of them, but suddenly the ship blew up, destroying the boats that were against its side, and when the smoke cleared off, nothing was to be seen on the water but a few pieces of blackened timber. Our boat had been saved by my father ordering the man to keep her at a good distance, lest a panic arose, and she should be entered by too great a number. The shock so affected my mother that she lost her mind. Here Imogene hid her face. When she looked at me again, her face was wet. Nevertheless, she continued. She died on the night following the loss of the ship, and I was left alone with the sailor. We were many leagues from the land. We had no sail. The oars were heavy. I was too weak and ill to help him with them, and the fierce heat soon melted the strength out of him, so that he left off rowing. He was good to me, gentle, and very sorrowful about me. I cried so much over losing my father and mother, and at our dreadful situation, that I thought my heart would break. 
and I pray that it might, for indeed, I wanted to die. She drew a deep, hysteric breath, tremulous as a long, bitter sob. We drifted here and there for five days, after which thirst and hunger bereft me of my senses, and I remember no more till I awoke in this ship. I then learnt that they had passed our boat close, and had stopped the vessel to inspect her. The seaman was dead, and they supposed me dead, too, but Captain Vanderdecken, fancying a likeness in me to his daughter Alida, called to his men to bring me on board. They did so, and found life in me. "'And you have been in this vessel ever since,' cried I. "'Ever since,' she responded. "'That is to say,' I exclaimed, scarcely realizing the truth, "'for hard upon five years.' She hid her eyes and shook her sweet face in the cover of her hands, as if she could not bear to think of it. I waited a little, partly that she might have time to recover her tranquillity, and partly that Prince might make an end of his business and go, though, let me declare, he gave us no more heed than had he been the clock, much less, indeed, than did the parrot that, having rounded her head after the manner of those birds till her beak was uppermost, watched us with the broad side of her face, and therefore with one eye, with horrid pertinacity and gravity. "'But can it be, Miss Dudley, said I, that Captain Vanderdecken never intends to part with you?' She looked up quickly and said, "'My position is incredibly strange. He has a father's fondness for me, and declares that, as I have no relations, I shall be one of his children and live with his wife and daughters at Amsterdam.' but he has no sense of time. Neither he nor the miserable crew can compute. To him and the others, this is the year 1654, and he supposes that he sailed from Batavia in July of last year, that is, as he conceives, in 1653. At first I tried to make him understand what century this was, but he patted my cheek and said my senses had not returned, and when I persisted, he grew angry, and his temper so terrified me that I feigned to agree with him, and have ever since done so. I reflected and said, It must be as you say, and as I have already noted, for did the Almighty grant him and his crew any perception of the passage of time, is it conceivable that he would talk of his wife and children as still living, and be eager to return to them? When did you discover that this was the phantom ship? I had heard that there was such a vessel from my father, and when Captain Vanderdecken talked to me, and I marked the color of his face and the appearance of the crew, and the glow that shone upon the vessel in the dark, with other strange things such as her ancient appearance, I soon satisfied myself. "'Father of mercy!' I cried. "'What a situation for a young girl!' "'When I felt sure of the ship,' she said, "'I should have drowned myself in my misery and terror,' only i dreaded god's wrath i felt that if i humbly resigned myself to his holy will he would suffer the spirits of my father and mother to be with me and watch over me but oh what a tedious waiting has it been what bitter weariness of sea and sky again and again have i entreated captain vanderdecken to put me on board some passing ship but not conceiving of the years which run by, and every tempest that obstructs him melting as a memory into the last, so that the rebuffs of a century past are to him as forgotten things, or possessing the same sort of recentness that in a day or two this gale, which is now blowing, will have, he thinks, to encourage me by saying that next time he is certain to round the headland, that as he is adopted, so he must not part with me, but carry me in his own ship and under his own protection to his wife and home. What are your thoughts, I asked her, as regards their mortality? Are they human? Yes, Mr. Fenton, they must be human, for they think of their homes and wives and children, she replied. I was struck with this, though I said, might not their very yearning be part of the curse? For if you extinguish their desire of getting home, the impulse that keeps them striving with the elements would disappear, and they would say, since we cannot get westwards and so to Europe, we'll head for the east and make for the Indies. It is a thing impossible to reason upon, she exclaimed sadly, and pressing her hand to her brow. The great God here, in this ship, has worked in miracles and mysteries for purposes of his own. 
who can explain his ways sometimes i have thought by the dreadful hue of the skin of their faces that they are men dead in body but forced into the behavior of living beings by the strength of the curse that works in them i replied that in saying this she had exactly hit upon the fancy of my late captain who had taken his own life on the previous evening which fancy now struck me as an amazing inspiration seeing that it was her own opinion and that my own judgment fully concurred in it tis impossible said she that they can be as we are they are supernaturally alive oh it is shocking to think of is it not wonderful that my long association with these people has not driven me mad yet the captain loves me as a father such as his tenderness at times when he talks of his home and strives to keep up my heart by warranting that next time it is always next time we shall pass the cape and all will be well with us that i am lost in wonder he could have ever acted so as to bring the curse of an eternal life of hopeless struggle upon him and his men ay cried i and why should his men be accursed i have often asked myself that whilst watching them she replied but then i have answered why should innocent little children bear in their forms and in their minds too the diseases and infirmities caused by the wickedness and recklessness of persons perhaps several generations removed from them we dare not question tis impious mr fenton in this ship especially must we be as mute spectators only for we are two living persons standing amid shadows and viewing so marvellous a mystery that i tremble to the depth of my soul at the thoughts of my nearness to the majesty of an offended god by this time prince had quitted the cabin and the girl and i were alone i trust miss dudley said i finding a singular delight in the pure virginal resting of her violet eyes sparkling like the jewels of a crown on mine as i talked to her that my questions do not tease you oh no she interrupted if you but knew how glad i am how it gives me fresh heart to hear you speak to see your living face after my long desolating communion with the people of this ship indeed i can conceive it said i may god grant that when i viewed last night as a most dreadful misfortune full of terror i even to madness may prove the greatest stroke of good luck that could have befallen me but of what is to be done we must talk later on i shall require to look about me tell me now madam if you will how is the ship provisioned surely these men are not miraculously fed and tis certain that the meat i tasted this morning has been cured since sixteen fifty three she smiled and said when they run short of food or water they sail for some part of the coast where there is a river there they go on shore in boats armed with muskets and come off with all that they can kill ha cried i fetching a deep breath there is some plain sailing in this unholy business after all but how do they manage for ammunition surely they must long ago have expended their original stock i can but guess about a twelvemonth ago we met with an abandoned ship out of which vanderdecken conveyed a great quantity of tobacco powder money and articles of food a few cases of marmalade and some barrels of flour whether these shipwrecked vessels are left lying upon the sea for him to take provisions from by the power that has sentenced him to his fearful fate i cannot say but since i have been in this vessel we have fallen in with three deserted ships both floating and ashore on the coast and this may have been their method throughout of providing themselves with what they needed backed by such further food as i have never known them to miss of with their muskets and fowling pieces so cried i greatly marvelling now i understand how it happens that the captain can lend me such latter-day clothes as these from his seventeenth-century wardrobe and that you forgive me madam are attired as i see you she answered in their hold they have a great quantity of silks and materials for making gowns for women this jacket said she meaning that which she was wearing is one article out of several chests of clothes captain vanderdecken was carrying home for his wife and daughters and friends do you notice the style mr fenton she added turning about her full and graceful figure that i might see the jacket it is certainly of the last century 
in the captain's cabin is the portrait of one of his daughters dressed in much the same way you at all events said i are not likely to run short of clothes oh she answered with a toss of her head half of weariness half of scorn as it seemed to me there is a chest in my cabin full of clothes fit for the grandest duchess in england i use such as come most readily to my hands what need have i she exclaimed pushing her hair from her forehead to care whether the colours i take match or whether the gown is too full this jacket fits me as do all the clothes that were intended for gertruda vanderdecken then noticing my eyes resting on the pearls she said taking the beautiful and costly rope in her hands there is a great stock of finery of this kind in the ship about a fortnight or three weeks after i had been rescued the captain ordered prince to bring a large case into the cabin it was put upon the table and the captain opened it twas like a jeweller's shop in miniature containing several divisions one full of pearl ornaments another of rings of which he bid me choose one to wear and i took this holding up her forefinger where on the jewel blazed a third of earrings and many other trinkets some as i should fancy more ancient than this ship others of a later time how he got much of this treasure i know how asked i deeply interested well said she letting the pearls fall around her neck to toy with the ring a fair proportion he had purchased for a merchant of amsterdam chiefly eastern jewelry that had made its way from indian cities to java other parcels he was taking home on his own account but much of it too along with a store of further treasure some of which i have seen and which consists of virgin silver bars of gold coated with pewter to deceive the pirates and buccaneers candlesticks and crucifixes of precious metal he found in the wreck of a great spanish ship which lay abandoned and going to pieces on a shoal off the coast of natal this happened during his progress from batavia to the cape before he was cursed and therefore it falls within his memory what other treasure there is his men have no doubt brought away from the wrecked vessels they have examined for food powder and the like during the years they have been sailing about this ocean so cried i lost in amazement by what i heard it is in this fashion that the phantom ship supplies her wants as ships grow more numerous her opportunities will increase for it is terrible to think of the number of vessels which go amissing and besides this is the road to india along which pass the most richly freighted of europe's merchant fleets now i understand how vanderdecken manages to keep his crew supplied with clothes and his ship with sails and cordage but lord cried i if there be nothing magical in this yet surely the evil spirit must be suffered to have a hand in the keeping of the bones of this old fabric together as i said this prince entered the cabin and said shortly your clothes are dry mynheer Chapter Eighteen of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Eighteen. The Death Ship must be slow at plying. I stood a moment or two at the door watching the clock whilst it struck and greatly admiring the workmanship of the skeleton that rose and speared with his lance keeping time to the sonorous chiming which sang with a solemn interval between each beat the great age of this timekeeper was beyond question but the horn that protected the face of it prevented me from perceiving if there were any maker's name or date there as the skeleton sank I could not but admire the patness of the mechanism to the condition of the ship and her crew. For what could surpass the irony of this representation of death, perpetually foiled in his efforts to slay time, which was yet the case of Vanderdecken and his men, whose mortality was constrained to an endless triumph over that force which drives all men born of woman through nature into eternity? 
The parrot hanging near, I stayed yet to look at her, and then spoke to the creature in my rugged Dutch, but to no purpose. With the slow motion of her kind, she contorted herself until, with her beak uppermost, she brought her larboard eye to bear full upon me, and so fixed and unwinking was her stare that I greatly disliked it, nay, felt that if I lingered I should fear it, and was going when she brought me to a stand by a hollow, ha, 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 just such a note as fancy would give to the ghost of a Dutchman, who had been large, fat, and guttural when alive, could the spectre of such a one laugh in his coffin or in a vault. The age which this bird had attained made her mere appearance chilling to the blood, though I am aware these creatures are long-lived, and that no man with certainty could say they might not flourish two hundred years and more. She was not bald. All her feathers were sound and smooth. Yet, as I made my way to my cabin, it terrified me into downright despondency to conceive of this parrot sharing in the curse that Vanderdecken had provoked. For if this soulless fowl could be involved in the general fate, merely because it happened to be in the ship, why might not my lot prove the same? Oh, my heart! To think of becoming one of the crew, partaking their horrid destiny, and in due course dying to live again, accursed and miraculously, my soul as theirs, existing in my body like one of those feeble lamps with which the ancients illumined their tombs. But I was young, and was not without an Englishman's courage. I could gaze backwards and perceive in my life no sin such as should fill me with remorse and hopelessness in a time like this. I believed in my Creator's goodness, and reaching my darksome cabin, I knelt down and prayed, and after a while recollected myself and felt the warmth of my former spirit. I was mighty pleased to recover my own clothes. They gave me back the sense of my being my true self again, whereas the masquerading attire Vanderdecken had lit me occasioned a wretched feeling as of belonging to the ship. I felt a seaman's curiosity to have a good look at a ship of which there were a thousand stories afloat in every forecastle throughout the world, and so I climbed through the hatch on deck, dressed in the style in which I had made my first appearance. The second mate, Anthony Arents, conned the vessel, standing near the helm with his arms folded in a sullen, moody posture, even so as to resemble a man turned into stone. Vanderdecken was at the weather rail, erect and noble-looking, his legs parted in the attitude of a stride that he might balance himself to the rolling deck. He stared fixedly to the windward, his great beard disparted, blowing like smoke over either shoulder, and his brows lowered into a contemptuous scowl upon his sharp, burning eyes. The ship was under the same canvas I had before noticed on her. Her yards were as closely pointed to the wind as the lee braces could bring them, but whereas in our time a square-rigged vessel close-hauled can be brought to within six points, that is to say, if the gale be north, she can be made to head east-northeast. Yet this ship, as I easily gathered without looking at the compass, lay no closer than eight and a half or nine points, the wind blowing west-northwest, and we lying by as close as the trim of the yards would suffer us, at about south by west. In short, we were being driven at the rate of some three or four miles an hour dead to leeward, broadside on. Now, as I am writing this in the main that all mariners may have a just and clear conception of the sort of ship Vanderdecken's vessel is— I particularly desire that this matter of her not being able to sail within eight or nine points of the wind be carefully noted. For then you shall understand how fully, with her own tackling and yards and canvas, she helps out and fulfills her doom. To resume, neither the captain, nor the second mate, nor the seaman at the tiller, taking the least notice of me, I determined to keep myself to myself till it should please Vanderdecken to address me. So I got under the lee of the house where I had conversed with the captain before breakfast and gazed about. It was as dirty a day as ever I remember, the heavens of the color of drenched granite, 
the sea line swallowed up in spray and haze out of which there came rolling to the ship endless processions of olive-colored prodigious combers the storming aloft was a perpetual thunder upon every rope the gale split with a shriek and there was a dreary clattering of the cordage and as the vessel swang her spars to windward an edge of peculiar and hurricane-like fierceness would be put into the wind as though it were driven outrageously mad by the stubborn swing of the masts against its howling face nothing was in sight save over against our weather quarter a cape hen poised on such easy wings that the appearance of the bird made a wonder of the weight of the blast its solitariness gave a heavy desolation to the aspect of the pouring warring scene of frothing summits and roaring hollows the reefed courses under which the vessel lay were dark with wet from the showering of the sea of which great green glittering masses striking the weather bow raised such a smoke of crystals all about the forecastle that the vessel looked to be on fire with a steam-like voluminous whiteness soaring there there were a few men on the decks that way muffled up to their noses but i did not see them speak to one another nor go about any kind of work they had the same self-engrossed nay entranced air that was visible in those such as the two mates and vanderdecken whom i had already observed the ship offered an amazing picture as she soared and sank upon the billows half hidden by storms of froth swept by the wind betwixt the masts with wilder screamings than a hundred madhouses could make the great barricaded tops her spritsail topmast standing up out of another top at the end of the bowsprit she had no jaboom and the long yard after the latine style on her mizzenmast gave her so true a look of the age in which she had been built that it would be impossible for any sailor to see her and not know what ship she was none other resembling her has been afloat since the age of william the third chapter nineteen of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the death ship by william clark russell chapter nineteen i hold a conversation with the crew there is nothing in sight indeed in that thick gale a vessel would have had to come within a mile of us to be visible as vanderdecken neither stirred nor spoke to me i feared he might take it ill if i hung by his side for how was i to tell but that he might consider i should regard the withdrawal of his attention as a hint to be gone i therefore walked aft the second mate no more heeding me than if i had been as viewless as the air whilst the helmsman after turning a small pair of glassy eyes upon me stained with veins directed them again at the sea over the bow his face as sullenly thoughtful as the others albeit he handled the tiller with good judgment meeting her as we sailors say when she needed it and holding a very clean and careful luff my curiosity being great i ventured to peep into the binnacle or bitacle as it was formerly called a fixed box or case for holding the mariner's compass the card was very old-fashioned as may be supposed yet it swung to the movement of the ship and i could not suppose that it was very inaccurate since by the aid of it they periodically made the land where they hunted for meat and filled their casks as neither vanderdecken nor antony arents offered to hinder me from roaming about i determined since i was about it to take a good look at this death ship i examined the swivels which were very green with decay and tried to revolve one on its pivot but found that it was not to be stirred the tiller had been a very noble piece of timber but now presented the aspect of rottenness that all the rest of the wood in this ship had yet it had been very elegantly carved 
and numerous flourishes still overran it, though the meaning of the devices was not to be come at. The rudder head worked in a great helm port, though which a corpulent man of eighteen stone might have slipped fair into the sea underneath. The gale made a melancholy screeching in the skeleton lantern, and I wondered they did not unship the worthless thing and heave it overboard. I looked over the side and as far down as I could carry my sight, and I observed that the ship was of a sickly, sallow color, not yellow, indeed of no hue that I could give a name to, though the original tint a painter might conjecture by guessing what color would yield this nameless pallidness after years and years of washing the seas and the burning of the sun. I then thought I would step forward, not much minding the washing of the seas there, and passed Vanderdecken very cautiously, ready to stop if he should look at me. But he remained in a trance, like a stone figure, all the life of him gone into his eyes, which glared burning and terrible at the same part of the ocean at which he stared when I first observed him stirless. So I stepped past, and descended to the quarter-deck, where there was nothing to see, and thence to the upper deck. The bulwarks being very high enabled me to dodge the seas as I crept forwards, and presently I came abreast of the foremast, where stood Jans the boatswain, along with three or four seamen, taking the shelter of a sort of hutch, built very strong, whence proceeded sounds of the grunting of hogs and the muttering of geese, hens, and the like. As I needed an excuse to be here, for these fellows believed the time to be that of Cromwell and Blake, and looked upon an Englishman as an enemy, and therefore might round upon me angrily for offering to overhaul their ship, I said to Jans, in my civilest manner, "'Are the men who rescued me last night here? I shall be glad to thank them.' "'Yonder's Houtman, said he bluntly, "'the others below.' I turned to the man named Houtman, and saw in him an old sailor of perhaps threescore, with a drooped head, his hands in his pockets, a worn, wrinkled, melancholy face, his complexion like that of the others of the grave. He was dressed in boots, loose yellow, tarpaulin trousers, and a frock of the same material. He had a pilot coat on, a good sou'west cap, such as I myself wore aboard the Saracen, and there was a stout shawl around his neck. I put out my hand and said, Houtman, let an English sailor thank a brave Hollander of his own calling for his life. He did not smile, showed himself by not so much as a twitch in his face sensible of my speech, save that in the most lifeless manner in the world he held out his hand, which I took, but I was glad to let it fall. If ever a hand had the chill of death to freeze mortal flesh, his had that coldness. No other man's skin in that ship had I before touched, though my arm had been seized by Vanderdecken, and this contact makes one of the most biting memories of that time. Will you suppose that the coldness was produced by the wet and the wind? Alas, he withdrew his hand from his pocket, but even had he raised it from a block of ice, you would not, in the bitter bleakness of the flesh, have felt as I did the death in his veins had he been as I was. The others were variously attired, in such clothes as you would conceive a ship's slop chest would be fitted with from pickings of vessels encountered and ransacked in a hundred and fifty years. They had all of them a Dutch cast of countenance, one looking not more than thirty, another forty, and so on. But there was something in them, that God knows if my life were the stake I should not be able to define it, that, backed by the movements, complexions, and the like, made you see that with them time had become eternity, and that their exteriors were no more significant of the years they could count than the effigy on the tomb of a man represents the dust of him. It blows hard, said I to Jans, making the most of my stock of Dutch, and resolved to confront each amazing experience as it befell me with a bold face. But the Brav is a stout ship and makes excellent weather." "'So think the rats!' exclaimed Houtman, addressing Jans. "'A plague on the rats!' cried Jans. "'There's but one remedy. "'When we get to Table Bay, the hold must be smoked with sulphur.' "'I never knew rats multiply as they do in this ship,' said one of the sailors, named Krenz. 
had we been ten years making the passage from batavia the vermin could not have increased more rapidly where do the crew sleep said i jans pointed over his shoulder with his thumb to a hatch abreast of the after end of the forecastle bulwark the cover was over it for there the spray was constantly shooting up like steam from boiling water and filling the iron-hard hollow of the foresail with wet which showered from under the arched foot-rope in whole thunderstorms of rain otherwise i should have asked leave to go below and explore the forecastle for no part of the ship could i thought be more curious than the place in which her crew lived and i particularly desire to see how they slept nay to see them sleeping and to observe the character of their beds whether hammocks or bunks and their chests or bags for their clothes i said it will be dark enough down there with the hatch closed ay said the youngest-looking of the seamen named abraham bothma i took down their names afterwards from imogene's dictation conceiving that the mentioning of them would prove of interest to any descendants of theirs in holland into whose hands this narrative might chance to fall but we keep a lamp always burning but should you run short of oil said i timorously for i had made up my mind to pretend to one and all that i believed they had sailed from batavia in the preceding year and the question was a departure from that resolution oil is easily got explained jans roughly what use do you english make of the porpoise and the grampus is not the seabird full of it and fish you in any bay along the coast twixt natal and cape town and i'll warrant you livers enough to keep your lamps burning for a voyage round the world and what ship with coppers aboard can be wanting in slush here yon said i i am a sailor and love to hear the opinions of persons of my own calling therefore i would ask you do not you consider your ship greatly hampered forward by yonder sprit topmast and the heavy yards there and to render myself perfectly intelligible i have pointed to the mast that i have already described as being fixed upright at the end of the bowsprit rising so to speak out of a round top there and having a smaller top on the upper end of it how would you have a rigged asked he in a sneering manner why said i cautiously as most of the ships you meet are rigged with a jaboom upon which you can set more useful canvas than sprit sails on this botma said let your country rig it ships as it chooses they will find the dutch know more about the sea and the art of navigating and commanding it than your nation has stomach for i could have smiled at this but the voice of the man the deadness of his face the terrifying life in his eyes the sombre gravity of the others standing about me like people in their sleep were such a corrective of humour as might have made a braver man than i am tremble i dared not go on talking with them indeed their looks caused me to fear for my senses so without further ado i walked aft and entered the cabin hoping to find warmth and recovery for my mind in the beauty and conversation of imogene the cabin was deserted the darkness of the sky made it very gloomy and what with its meagre furniture the unhealthy colouring of its walls trappings of gilt and handwork once i dare say very brilliant and delightful but now as rueful as a harlequin's faded dress seen by the sun it was a most depressing interior particularly in such weather as was then storming when the ceaseless thunder of bursting surges drove shock after shock of tempestuous sound through the resonant fabric and when the shrieking of the wind not only in the rigging but along the floor of the stormy sky itself was like the frantic tally-hoing of demons to the million hounds of the blast not knowing how to pass the time i went to the old framed pictures upon the sides and found them to be panels fitted to the ship's plank and framed so as to form as much a part of the structure as the carving on her stern would be but time neglect dirt or damp one or all had so befouled or darkened the surfaces that most of them were more like the heads of tar-barrels than paintings yet here and there i managed to witness a glimmering survival of the artist's work one representing the fish-market at amsterdam such of the figures as were plain exhibiting plenty of humour another a dutch east indiaman of vanderdecken's period 
sailing along with canvas full streamers blowing and the batavian colour standing out large from the ensign staff a third was a portrait but nothing was left of it save a nose whose ruddy tip time had evidently fallen in love with for there it still glowed a mouth widely distended with laughter and one merry little eye the other having sunk like a star in the dark cloud that overspread most of this panel this i supposed had been the portrait of a sailor for so much of the remainder as was determinable all related to amsterdam and things nautical having made this dismal round i sat me down at the table sternly and closely watched by the parrot whose distressing croaking assurance i had no wish to hear she being my only company if i exclude the clock whose hoarse ticking was audible above the gale and the skeleton skulking inside whose hourly resurrection i was now in the temper to as greatly dislike as the bird's iterative denunciation i wondered how the young lady contrived to pass her time had she books if so they would doubtless be dull performances in old dutch fat and wormy volumes bound in hard leather as sluggish in their matter as a canal and very little calculated to amuse a spirited girl evidently in the five years she had been sailing with vanderdecken she had learnt what she knew of dutch she spoke fluently and with a good accent though to be sure it was the dutch of sixteen fifty i constantly directed my eyes towards her cabin in the hope of seeing her emerge for i felt mighty dull and sad and longed for the sight of her fair and golden beauty and all the while i was wondering how she had endured without losing her mind the dreadful imprisonment she had undergone chapter twenty of the death ship this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the death ship by william clark russell chapter twenty imogene says she will trust me a half hour passed and during that time i had sufficiently recovered from the distressful croak of the parrot to wonder as any sailor would how the ship was navigated for i could not doubt that the clock kept pretty close to the true time since the easting and westing made by the ship was small never perhaps exceeding ten degrees and the circumstance of noon having struck set me wondering in what fashion the captain and mates navigated the ship whether they used the cross staff or relied on dead reckoning or were supernaturally conned at half past twelve arrived prins to prepare the table for dinner i was so dull that his coming was extremely welcome and i watched him go about his work with interest not perhaps unmixed with fear out of the great drawer under the table he withdrew the cloth knives forks silver goblets and the like which had been set out for breakfast but his movements were those of a marionette rather than a man's he scarcely looked at what he did putting a goblet here a knife and fork there and so on with the lifeless air of an object controlled by mechanism small wonder that the unhappy wretch should know his business he had been at it long enough yet it wrung my heart to watch him and to think that he would still be arranging the cabin tables for meals and attending upon vanderdecken and his mates when heaven alone knows how many times the wave of civilization should have followed the sun round the globe and how often our british islands should have lapsed into their ancient savageness and emerged again whilst he was at this work miss dudley stepped out of her cabin she came to a stand not instantly recognizing me in my own clothes but quickly satisfying herself she advanced with a smile and sat down near me with no further sign of timidity than a slight blush which greatly heightened her beauty where is captain vanderdecken said she i left him on deck three-quarters of an hour since i answered we were talking when he suddenly broke off and i should have supposed him in a fit but for his erect posture and the fiery life in his eyes 
this happens to them all said she as you will find out i do not know what it means or why it should be possibly i exclaimed the death in them grows too strong at periods for the power that sustains them be it demonic or not and then follows a failure of the vitality of the body which yet leaves the spirit as one sees it flashing in vanderdecken's eyes strong enough to recover the corporeal forces from their languor but how terrible is all this for you to be living familiarly with the sweet fresh human life of the world your beauty would adorn and gladden hidden from you behind the melancholy sea-line and the passage of months yes and of years finding you still aimlessly beating about these waters with no better companions than beings more frightful in their shapes and behaviour as men than they were phantoms which the hand could not grasp and whose texture the eye can pierce what can i do mr fenton captain vanderdecken will not part with me how can i escape she cried with her eyes brimming if i cast myself overboard it would be to drown if i succeeded in gaining the shore when we anchored near to the coast it would be either to perish upon the broiling sands or be destroyed by wild beasts or be seized by the natives and carried into captivity but if a chance offered to make good your escape without the risks you name would you seize it oh yes well said i speaking with such tenderness and feeling such a glow and yearning in my heart that you would say the tiny seed of love in my breast watered by her tears was budding with the swiftness of each glance at her into flower whilst i have been sitting melancholy and alone i have turned over in my mind how i am to deliver you from this dreadful situation no scheme as yet offers but will you trust me as an english sailor to find a means to outwit these dutchmen ay though the devil himself kept watch when they were abed one moment miss dudley forgive me it had not been my intention to touch upon this matter until time had enabled you to form some judgment of me but when two are of the same mind and the pit that has to be jumped is a deep one it would be mere foppery in me to stand on the brink with you chattering like a frenchman about anything else sooner than speak out into the point as a plain seaman should mr fenton she answered i will trust you if you can see a way to escape from this ship i will aid you to the utmost of my strength and accompany you you are a sailor my father was of that calling and as an english seaman you shall have my full faith it was not only the words but her pretty voice her sparkling eyes her earnest gaze the expression of hope that lighted up her face with the radiance of a smile rather than of a smile itself which rendered what she said delightful to me i answered depend upon it your faith will animate me and it will be strange if you are not in england before many months nay let me say weeks have passed here leaning her cheek in her hand she looked down into her lap with a wistful sadness in her eyes not conceiving what was passing in her mind i said whatever scheme i hit upon will take time but what are a few months compared with years on board this ship years which only death can end oh she answered looking at me fully but with a darkness of tears upon those violet lights i don't doubt your ability to escape and rescue me nor was i thinking of the time you would require or how long it may be before we see england what troubles me is to feel that when in england if it please god to suffer me to set foot once more upon that dear soil i shall have no friend to turn to i was about to speak but she proceeded her eyes brimming afresh it is rare that a girl finds herself in my situation both my father and mother were only children and orphans when they married my mother living with a clergyman and his wife at rotherdite as governess to their children when my father met her the clergyman and his lady are long since dead but were they living they would not be persons i should apply to for help and counsel since my mother often spoke of them as harsh mean people the few relations on my mother's side died off on my father's side there was perhaps there yet is an uncle who settled in virginia and did pretty well there but i should have to go to that country to seek him with a chance of finding him dead thus you will see how friendless i am mr fenton 
you are not of those who remain friendless in this world said i softly for can you marvel that a young man's heart will beat quickly when such a beauty as imogene dudley tells him to his face that she is friendless i implore you i added not to suffer any reflection of this sort to sadden or swerve you in your determination to leave this ship no no she interrupted it will not do that better to die a famine among the green meadows at home than oh she cried with hysterical vehemence how sweet will be the sight of flowers to me of english trees and hedges blooming with briar roses and honeysuckles this dreadful life she clasped her hands with a sudden passionate raising of her eyes these roaring seas the constant screaming of the wind that bates its tones only to make a desolate moaning the company of ghost-like men the fearful sense of being in a ship upon which has fallen the wrath of the majesty of god oh indeed indeed it must end and burying her face in her hands she wept most grievously sobbing aloud what will end mynheer and what is it that causes thee imogene to weep exclaimed the deep vibratory voice of vanderdecken i started and found his great figure erect behind me a certain inquisitiveness in the expression of his face and much of the light shining in his eyes that i had remarked when he fell into that posture of trance i have spoken of i answered as readily as my knowledge of his tongue permitted miss dudley weep sir because the scale as others have before retards the passage of your ship to amsterdam and tis perfectly natural consistent indeed with the wishes of all men in the brave that she should wish the balking storm at an end he came round to his high-backed chair and seated himself and putting his arm along the table gently took imogene's wrist and softly pulled her hand away from her face wet with her tears saying my dear your fellow-countryman is right it is the sorrow of every creature here that this gale should blow us backwards and so delay our return but what is more capricious than the wind this storm will presently pass and it will be strange he added with a sudden scowl darkening his brow and letting go miss dudley's hand as he spoke if next time we do not thrust the brave into an ocean where these northwesters make way for the strong trade wind that blows from the southeast she dried her eyes and forced a smile acting a part as i did that is to say she did not wish he should suspect her grief went deeper than i had explained though i could not help observing that in directing her wet sweet violet eyes with her mouth shaped to a smile upon him a plaintive gratitude underlay her manner an admixture of pity and affection the exhibition of which made me very sure of the quality of her heart to carry vanderdecken's thoughts away from the subject he supposed miss dudley and i had been speaking about i asked her in dutch what she had been doing with herself since breakfast she answered in the same language that she had been lying down have you books said i a few that belong to the captain some are in french and i cannot read them the others are in dutch there is also a collection of english poetry some of which is beautiful and i know many verses by heart are these works pretty new said i she answered of various years the newest i think is dated sixteen forty seven ay said vanderdecken that will be my friend lois van treslong's book upon the tulip madness finding him willing to converse i was extremely fretted to discover that owing to my ignorance of the literature and art of his time i could not bring him out as the phrase runs for looking into the batavian story since i find scores of matters he could have told me about such as the building of ships at horn the customs of the people the tulip madness he had mentioned the great men such as jan six rembrandt jan steen van kampen who designed the statues and others some of whom as happened in the case of the great villa Michalton, he may have known and haply smoked pipes of tobacco with but be this as it may we had got back again to the gale when prins brought in the dinner and in a few minutes arrived the mate van vogelaar whereupon we fell to the meal imogene saying very little and often regarding me with a thoughtful face and earnest eyes as though after the maiden's way in such matters she was searching me 
i taciturn the mate sullen in expression and silent as his death-like face would advertise the beholder to suppose him ever to be and vanderdecken breaking at intervals from the deep musing fit he fell into to invite me to eat or drink with an air of incomparable dignity hardened as it was by his eternal sternness and fierceness at this meal i found the food to be much the same as that with which we had broken our fast but in addition there was a roasted fowl and a large ham and into each silver goblet prince poured a draught of sherry a very soft and mellow wine which i supposed vanderdecken had come by through the same means which enabled him to obtain coats for his own and his men's backs and ropes for his masts and sails and brandy and gin for his stone jars that is by overhauling wrecks and pillaging derelicts for certainly strong waters were not to be got by lying off the coast and going a-hunting yet though the wine put a pleasant warmth into my veins insomuch that i could have talked freely but for the depressing influence of the captain and his mate them it no more cheered and heartened it gave them no more life and spirit than had they had been urns filled with dust into which the generous liquor had been poured several times indeed whilst i was on board that ship have i seen vanderdecken Voglar, and arents swallow such draughts of punch out of bowls as would have laid me senseless in five minutes yet these capacious storms gave rise in them to not the least signs of jollity as indeed how should it have been otherwise for their brains were dead to all but the supernatural influence that kept them moving dead as Chapter Twenty One of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty One Vanderdecken Exhibits Some Treasure. When Vogelar left the cabin to relieve Arendt's on deck, Vanderdecken exhibited a disposition to talk. He gently took Imogene's chin in his hand and chided her very tenderly, yet without the slightest quality of what we should call pleasantness in his manner. For this would have brought him to some show of good humor, whereas never during the time I was thrown with him did I see the least light of merriment on his face. I say he chided her, but very gently, for crying at the delay caused by the storm and exclaimed motioning to me here is a seaman he will tell you that this is a stormy part of the ocean and that at this season of the year we must look for gales from the northwest but he will also know that these tempests are short-lived and that a breeze from the east north or south must carry us round the cape as fairly as our helm controls us oh that is so indeed miss dudley said i quickly and darting a meaning glance at her and wishing to change the subject i went on mine hair when i was in your cabin last night shifting myself i noticed a cross staff twould be of no use to you to-day the sun being blotted out failing in observation upon what method do you rely for knowing your position what else but the log he exclaimed i compute entirely by dead reckoning the staff hath often set me wide of the mark the log fairly gives me my place on the sea card and then there is the lead i bowed by way of thanking him for in this direction i gathered by his rejoinder as much as he could have acquainted me with in an hour's discourse besides the earnest regard of the pair of sweet bright eyes opposite reminded me that i must be very wary in showing myself inquisitive you have a sharp sight sir said vanderdecken but speaking without any fierceness to see that forestaff in my cabin by the faint light there was what else did you observe i told him honestly for i could imagine no challenge to his wrath in answering 
that i had seen a speaking trumpet sand glass pictures and the like but as though imogene knew him better and desired to shield me she instantly said oh captain will not you show mr fenton the pictures of your wife and children they will charm him i know on this he called prins to bring the pictures if ever i had doubted this ship was the veritable flying dutchman the portraits would have settled my misgivings once and for all the material on which they were painted was cracked in places and the darkness of age lay very gloomy and thick upon them they were all of a size about ten inches long and six inches broad he put his wife before me first and watched me with his fierce eyes whilst i pored upon the painting the picture was that of a portly lady in a black close-fitting cap the hair yellow the bosoms very large a square-shouldered heavy woman of the true dutch mould round-faced not uncomely and perhaps of five-and-forty years of age how she was dressed i could not tell but the arms were bare from the elbows and they and the hands were methought very delicately painted and exquisitely lifelike the others were those of girls of different ages which of them captain vanderdecken imagined miss dudley to resemble i could not conceive there was nothing in these darksome likenesses albeit they represented maidenhood and infancy to suggest a resemblance to the english beauty of the fragile large-eyed gold-crowned face of imogene dudley she that was named Gertruda was of a style that came close to good looks eyes merry dainty mouth but cheeks too fat here was little margaretha for whom the piping swain had been purchased peering at me with a half shy half wondering look out of the dusky background as i returned them one by one the captain took them from me lingering long upon each and making such comments as tis johanna to the life meaning his wife what art is more wonderful than this of portrait painting no age is likely to beat our time and no nation the dutch how alive is the eye here methinks if i spoke angrily to her she would weep or you will find this girl meaning gertruda a true sister imogene homely honest and innocent so fond of fun but yet so dutiful that there is no woman in all holland who would make a better wife or ah little one thy father will be with thee ere long stopping to kiss the painting of his daughter margaretha Prins stood by to receive the pictures, but Vanderdecken hung over this one for some minutes, falling motionless, insomuch that I thought another one of his strange fits or trances had seized him, and perfectly still for those moments were Miss Dudley and I, often glancing at each other, as though both of us alike felt the prodigious significance imported into this spectacle of a father's love by the bellowing of the wind and the long yearning sickening broadside rushes of the ship ruthlessly hurled back by the surge and storm into the deeper solitude of those waters whose confines she was never to pass now arents left the table never having given us nor our talk nor the pictures the smallest imaginable heed his going brought vanderdecken back to life so to speak and he handed the picture of his child to prins i looked at him expecting though god knows why to see a tear but whatever sensibility heaven had permitted this man to retain did not appear in his face had it been cast in brass it could not have been harder and more impenetrable his eyes were full of their former passionate scornful life and light they made me think supposing him to show now as he would have appeared at the time of his death that he was one who would have met his end full of impatience 
imperious rage and savage decryal of the holy ordinances of nature but oh the sadness the sadness of the spectacle i had contemplated this tender perusal by a husband and father of the beloved lineaments of those whom he deemed living ay and still looking as they looked at him from the canvas but who had been dead so many years that time had perhaps erased the name from the stone that marked the burial place of the youngest of them all the little margaretha and how much longer would these portraits last i asked myself twas certain by the evidences of decay in them that they had not the vitality of the ship and of those who sailed her what then the years would blot them out yet mercy he would surely deserve who loved his wife and children as this man did and i still sometimes fondly hope that memory may be permitted to serve him in lieu of his eyes so that in gazing upon the time-blackened canvas he may as truly see with intellectual sight the faces of his dear ones as though they stood out bright fresh and lifelike as at the hour in which they were painted all the time i looked at these pictures i would notice miss dudley watching me quickly averting her gaze when mine met hers i put down this scrutiny to her wish to gather my character though i need not at this distance expect to be reproached for my vanity if i say that i thought that was not her only reason for following me with her eyes i pray you consider the life she had led since the destruction of her father's ship and the loss of her parents how that she was now grown to be a woman and how that i was not only a young but a bright fair merry-eyed sailor her own countryman of the calling she loved for her father's sake and the sweeter to her sight for breaking in upon her mournful life and offering to snatch her from the frightful companionship of the death ship's crew but more of this anon whilst prins was in the captain's cabin hanging up the pictures she exclaimed it is a dull and dreary day how are we to kill the time as she spoke the clock struck and the parrot instead of using her customary expression laughed out loudly ha 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 that bird said i seems to know what we are talking about it is a pretty notion of hers to laugh at your inquiry when she sees how vainly old death in the clock yonder stabs at time this i spoke in english what do you say mynheer demanded vanderdecken oh captain exclaimed miss imogene as if she was carrying on the sense of my remarks could not we prettily dispatch an hour by looking at some of the treasure you have below she laid her little white hand on his and pleaded with her eyes it will be a treat to mr fenton to see the fine things you have and i am still childish enough to love the sparkle of precious stones he turned to me and said sir i have no objection but our countries are at war and in case of your being transshipped i have to ask you on your honour as a gentleman and a seaman not to give information of the objects the lady desires me to show you i never before witnessed a finer dignity in any man's air than that which ennobled him as he spoke i gave him my assurance feeling that i cut but a mean figure in my manner of answering after his own majestic and haughty aspect and the rich and thrilling tones in which he had delivered himself nor will i pretend that i was not moved at the vanity and idleness of the obligation of silence he imposed upon me for whatever treasure he had would be as safe in his ship as on the sandy bed of the sea even though on my escaping i should go and apprise all the admirals in the world of its existence he said no more but calling to prins ordered him to clear the table bring pipes and tobacco and then take some seamen with him 
into as i understood the half-deck and bring up two chests of treasure those which were lashed on the starboard side close against the bulkhead the cloth was removed we lighted our pipes and after we had waited some little while prins with several sailors appeared bearing among them two stout apparently very heavy chests which they set down upon the cabin floor taking care to secure them by lashings and seizings to the stanchions so that they should not slip with the ship's lurches the sailors interested me so much that whilst they were with us i looked only at them it was not that there was anything in their faces if i except the dreadful pallor or in their attire to fix my attention it was that they were part of the crew of this accursed ship participators in the doom that vanderdecken had brought upon her members of a ghostly band the like of which it might never be permitted to mortal man to behold again one had very deep sunk eyes which shone in their dark hollows with much of the fire that gave a power of terrifying to those of the captain another had a long grisly beard over which his nose curved in a hook his little eyes lay close against the top of his nose and his hair that was wet with spray or rain lay like new gathered seaweed down to pretty near his shoulder blades this man's name i afterwards heard was jart van der Volt, whilst he that had the glowing eyes was called christopher rustoff they all went about in the soulless mechanical way i was now used to and when they had set down the chests prins dismissed them with an injunction to stand by ready to take them below again the cases were about three feet high and ranging about five feet long they were heavily girt with iron bands and padlocked with massive staples prins opened them and flung back the lids and then to be sure i looked down upon treasures the like of which in quality i'll not say quantity in one single ship the holds of the acapulco galleons could alone rival or the caves in which the old buccaneers hid their booty miss dudley seeing me rise left her seat and came to my side vanderdecken stepped round and leaned against the table his arms folded and his body moving only with the rolling of the ship i should speedily grow tedious were i to be minute in my description of what i saw yet i must venture a short way in this direction in one box there were fitted four trays each tray divided into several compartments and every compartment was filled with precious stones set in rings bracelets bangles and the like and with golden ornaments such as birds for the hair brooches necklets chains for wearing about the waist or neck and other such things of prodigious value and beauty of device i asked leave to examine these objects and on picking them up noticed that some were of a much more antique character than others insomuch that i said to miss imogene in english i suspect that much of these splendors our friend will have collected at different periods she answered in our tongue he can tell you what he purchased at batavia or what was consigned to him for delivery at amsterdam but his memory after that is a blank and the last wreck he can recall in which he found several quintals of silver and unminted gold is the vrijheid that he met i cannot tell where in a sinking condition there is more treasure aboard than this cried i much more she replied then turning to vanderdecken who had fixed his eyes on me without moving his head she said i am telling mr fenton that these chests represent but a handful of the treasure in this ship i am dazzled by what i see mynheer said i speaking whilst prins raised the trays disclosing many hundreds of guineas worth of ornaments and stones 
had i but the value of one of these trays alone this should be my last voyage ay said he there is much that is beautiful here much that will yield good sums but a large number of the articles in that chest belong to a merchant there are likewise consignments and my own share is but a speculation the other chest had but one tray in which lay many golden crucifixes of different sizes goblets flagons candlesticks all gold whilst beneath were numbers of a kind of small bricks or bars of pewter which miss imogene told me were gold that had been originally disguised in this way as a blind to the pirates in addition were several great canvas bags into which prins moving always as an automaton thrust his hand bringing forth different sorts of coins such as rix dollars ducatoons ducats batavian rupees spanish dollars and even shillings worth no more than six stivers apiece there is a pleasure in looking at bright and sparkling objects at the beauty of gold worked into strange or fantastic shapes at jewels and stones in their multitude gleaming out in twenty colours at once and had i been a picaroon or a woman i could not have surveyed this collection with sharper delight though i hope you will not suppose that i felt the buccaneer's thirst for the things but when my glance went to vanderdecken all the shining seemed to die out and the richest of the jewels to lose its glory i said to miss imogene pointing as i spoke to the chests that vanderdecken might suppose we talked of the treasure in them he does not appear to care the snap of a finger for what is there if the sense of possession is dead in him why should he take whatever he can find of jewels gold or silver from the ships in which he is fortunate enough to find such things if your brain will not help you to such matters how should mine she replied with a faint smile the idea has never before occurred to me but be sure it is a part of his punishment he may feel no pleasure in the possession of his wealth yet he knows it is on board and it may be intended to render every gale that beats him back more and more bitter and hard by delaying him from carrying his cargo home this was shrewdly imagined i thought though it did not satisfy me because since twas sure that he had lost recollection of preceding gales succeeding ones could not gain in bitterness in truth we were afloat in a fearful and astonishing mystery from which my eagerness to deliver the sweet and fragrant girl by my side grew keener with every look of hers that met mine and with every glance i directed at the captain and around the ancient interior that time had sickened to the complexion of the death which worked this ship in the forms of men having satisfied me with a sight of these treasures vanderdecken ordered prins to have the chests removed and we then returned to the table to smoke out the tobacco Chapter Twenty Two of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty Two. Imogene and I are much together. So far, I have been minute accounting for every hour and all things which happened therein since i was picked up by the mate of the death ship and put aboard her my first impressions were keen and strong and i have sought to lay them before you in the order in which they occurred but to pursue this particularity of narrative to relate every conversation to regularly notice the striking of the clock the movements of the skeleton and the hoarse comminatory croak of the parrot would be to speedily render this tale tedious therefore 
let me speak briefly for a little space the storm blew with steady fury for six days driving the tall fabric to leeward to a distance of many leagues every twenty-four hours the course of the drift being as i should suppose for it was impossible to put much faith in the compasses about southeast by east the larboard tacks aboard and the ship ratching nothing it was so continuous and heavy this gale that it began to breed a feeling of despair in me for i felt that if such weather lasted many weeks it would end in setting us so far south that we should be greatly out of the road taken by ships rounding the cape and so remote from the land that should vanderdecken desire to careen or water his vessel it would occupy us months to fetch the coast so that the prospect of escaping with miss imogene grew small and gloomy added to which was the melancholy of the cell-like cabin in which it was my lot to sleep the fiery crawlings the savage squeakings of great rats the grinding groaning and straining noises of the laboring structure likewise the sickening sweeping soaring falling motions of the high light vessel movements which as we drove further south where the seas were swollen into mountains by the persistent hardness of the gale and the vastness of the liquid plain along which they coursed furious with the fiendish lashing of the thongs of the storm grew at times so insupportable that sailor as i was and used to the sea in all its moods i would often feel faint and reel to a sensation of nausea but imogene was never in the least degree discomposed she was so used to the ship that its movements were to her what the steadiness of dry land is to other women she seldom came on deck however indeed the gusts and guns were often so fierce coming along like thunderbolts through the gale itself that any one of them catching her gown might have carried her light figure overboard moreover twenty-four hours after the gale set in it drew up thick as mud the horizon was brought within reach of a musket shot and out of this thickness blew the rain in straight lines mixed with the showering off the heads of the seas the sky hung steady of the colour of slate no part lighter or darker than another but so low that it appeared as if a man could whip his hand into it from our masthead whenever those reeling spars came plumb as it gave me no pleasure to linger on deck in such weather you may suppose that miss imogene and i were much together below often a whole morning or afternoon would pass without a soul entering the cabin where we sat whether vanderdecken was pleased to think that imogene had a companion a fellow-countryman with whom she could converse and so kill the time which he would suspect from her recent fit of weeping hung heavy on her spirits or that having himself long passed those marks which time sets up as the boundaries of human passions he was as incapable of suspecting that imogene and i should fall in love as he clearly was of perceiving the passage of years tis certain he never exhibited the smallest displeasure when perchance he found us together albeit once or twice on entering the cabin when we were there he would ask imogene abruptly but never with the sternness his manner gathered when he addressed others what our talk was about as if he suspected i was inquiring about his ship and cargo though if indeed this was so i don't doubt the suspicion was put into his head by van vogelaar who i am sure hated me as much because i was an englishman as because our panic-stricken men had fired upon him it takes a man but a very short time to fall in love though the relation of the thing if the time be very short is often questioned as a possibility sometimes heartily laughed at as an absurdity when deliberately set down in writing 
why this should be i do not know i could point to a good many men married to women with whom they fell in love at a dance or by seeing them in the street or by catching sight of them in church and the like i have known a man to become passionately enamoured of a girl by beholding her picture and what says marlowe who ever loved that loved not at first sight depend upon it when passion is of slow growth and cultivated painfully you may suspect a deficiency somewhere either the girl is not delightful of face and shape and her virtues and good qualities are hard to come at or she is a tease and a coquette and in a manner of speaking puts her foot down upon a man's heart and prevents the emotion there from shooting there will be something wanting something wrong i say association may indeed lengthily induct one into a habit of affection but the sort of love i have in mind springs like a young god into a man's intelligence from a maiden's eyes but whether this swift passion is more lasting than the affection that is formed by slower mental processes and which of them is the safer to trust to is no riddle for such as i to bother over and in sober verity i am sorry to have been led into these remarks which certainly should be omitted if they were not necessary as an apology for the truth must be told and it is this that the very first morning i met imogene i fell in love with her beauty while the long days of the storm which threw us greatly together confirmed the first movement of my heart by acquainting me with the extraordinary sweetness innocence gentleness and purity of her nature these qualities unlike the enchanting hue and brightness of her eyes the golden falls of her hair and her many other fairy graces were not quickly discoverable but they stole out during our many conversations who that has been to sea knows not how speedily character is discovered on shipboard and i say that before that gale was ended i was so much in love with this fair and tender girl that i could have laid down my life to serve her this i should not have confessed nor indeed made any reference to my love passage if it did not concern the influence exercised by the death ship on the lives and fortunes of those who have relations with her in this time our conversation was about all sorts of things her parents her home her childhood the loss of her father's ship the friendless condition she would be in on her arrival in england should i manage to deliver her from vanderdecken though when she came to that i begged her to dismiss her fears at once and for ever by assuring her that my mother would gladly receive her and cherish her as her own daughter having but me to love who was always absent at which a faint blush sweetened her cheeks as though she suspected what was in my mind but i was careful to hurry away from the subject since i did not wish her then to suppose i loved her for fear that not having had time as i believed to love me she might fall into a posture of mind calculated to baffle my hopes of carrying her away from the brave i told her all about myself of the famous fenton from whom i was descended of my voyages of the saracen whose passage to india i feared would have an ill issue now that she had met the dutchman and i talked again of captain skevington's amazing and as i supposed accurate theories touching the living dead who navigated this ship she had much to tell me of vanderdecken and his ship of unsuspecting vessels they had fallen in with which had sold them tobacco butter cheese and the like of others that had backed their topsails to speak then taken fright and sailed away in hot haste i asked her if it was true that the captain hailed passing ships for the purpose of sending letters home 
she answered no it was not true that was the general belief as she had heard from her father but as vanderdecken did not know that he was cursed as he went on year after year firmly believing that next time he should be successful in rounding the cape why should he desire to send letters home more particularly as he regarded the brave as one of the swiftest vessels afloat she added i have never seen him write a letter and i am certain he has never endeavoured to send one but if he finds a ship willing to speak he will send a boat yes always but merely for necessaries of which he is constantly in want now it is tobacco another time it will be spirits some few weeks since we met a ship from which he purchased several cases of marmalade and some hams for which van vogelaar paid in coin that scared them when they put the age of the money and the appearance of this ship together for they threw the mate overboard and instantly made off i suppose van vogelaar could not be drowned said i no said she he like the rest have no other business in life than to live they had put the hams and marmalade into the boat and when they threw him in the sea he swam very quietly to his companions what was the ship i asked a spaniard she replied after they had put the ship before the wind i saw a number of them on the poop on their knees crossing themselves i cannot understand said i why this ship should be termed a phantom what could be more real than these timbers and the requirements of the people who navigate her besides exclaimed imogene if she is a phantom how could vanderdecken write those letters in her which he is supposed to desire to send home if you have a real letter such as a person can put into his pocket and deliver you must have real materials to produce it ink pens paper wafers and something hard to sit upon or kneel upon or write upon certainly said i of a phantom the whole must be phantasmal suppose a ghost dressed its attire must be as unsubstantial as the essence it covers the truth about this ship is not known she continued and it never can be known because her influence is dreaded vessels on finding out her character fly from her and those who sell to her unsuspectingly pass away without giving her further thought or said i gloomily perhaps are never more heard of in this way would we talk and you may conceive we were at no loss for topics on several occasions she showed me some of the dresses vanderdecken had furnished her with of which i chiefly remember a chintz gown spotted with roses with sleeves swelling out like ruffs at the elbows a pink dress with a girdle to bring the waist close under the bosom and a slate-coloured dress with a red shawl for it to be worn like a sash and a kerchief for the throat and i also recollect that she showed me some strange very dainty caps one to sit on the back of the head another of black velvet and a feather which she told me vanderdecken had said was worn on the side of the head she put it on to explain its use and a man's true darling she looked in it once she came into the cabin dressed in the pink dress with the high waist and very sweet did she appear but i said to her that of all the apparel she had shown me nothing pleased me better than the black velvet jacket in which i had first seen her and thereafter she constantly wore it in short the clothes vanderdecken had stocked her cabin with including much fine linen lace collars long gloves shoes of several colours and the like were such as to suggest a costly theatrical wardrobe by reason of the variety of the styles representing fashions from the middle of the seventeenth century down to within twenty years of the time in which happened 
what i am here relating it has been already explained how these things were gotten you have only to consider that this ship sailed from batavia in 1653 with a large stock of dresses linen jewelry plate and so forth in her hold besides her cargo which stock vanderdecken in whom there must still work the thrifty instincts of the hollander just as he is suffered to love his pipe and bowl and pine for both when the tobacco and spirits have run out had replenished by appropriating such wares treasure and apparel as he had a fancy for out of the ships he encountered abandoned at sea or cast away upon the african coast you have only to consider this i say and bear in mind the great number of years he has been afloat and how many scores of richly laden merchantmen have passed and repassed that part of the ocean to which the curse confines him to find nothing to marvel at in any catalogue of the contents of the brav that could be offered besides having all these strange and often sumptuous articles of attire to show me and talk about imogene had a great deal to tell me concerning the weary years she had spent in the vessel wondering how her life was to end how she was ever to get to england or to any other civilized country if vanderdecken refused to let her leave him because of his fatherly affection for her and his conviction that he was homeward bound and only temporarily delayed by the northwest gales which beat him back she said that after a time she began to fear that she would lose her own language and be able to speak no tongue but the ancient dutch in which vanderdecken and his men conversed to preserve herself from which calamity she regularly perused the collection of english poetry that the captain most fortunately had among his books her grief was that the book instead of poems was not the holy scriptures but she knew many prayers and hymns her mother had taught her and these she never omitted reciting morning and night you would have been touched had you heard her marked the sadness that rendered madonna-like the character of her fragile delicate beauty observed the girlish innocence of the expression that shone with the moisture of unwept tears in the eyes she fixed on me and then considered how she had been bereaved how frightful for tediousness and dullness and for the association of the mysterious beings into whose society she had been cast must have been the five years she had spent on the death ship i remember asking if she knew what religion vanderdecken was of she answered she did not know for certain but that she had heard him speak of his wife and family as having worshipped in the oud kirk indeed mr fenton said she i don't believe he is or was of any religion at all van vogelaar is a calvinist he told me so one evening when i was speaking with surprise of antony john's being a catholic as it is almost impossible to reconcile the fatness of that man with the austerities and mortifications of his creed there can be no doubt said i that vanderdecken was when human like you and me without religion his shocking defiance and the condemnation that followed proved that he acted out of sheer sin in his soul and not out of a passing passion and yet you would have supposed that a dutchman no matter how secretly impious would have behaved with more discretion than this skipper i dare say he would have been more discreet said imogene had he imagined what was to follow it was in this way and in such talk that we killed those six days of storm and Chapter Twenty Three of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell, Chapter 23 The Gale Breaks. On the sixth day, during dinner, Vanderdecken said he believed we had seen the worst of the storm. There was a small lull in the wind, and a faintness sifting up, so to speak, from behind the peaks and valleys of the horizon into the sky all around, like a very dim dawning of fair weather innumerable leagues distant yet. "'I shall be glad to see the sun again,' said Imogene. "'Let us get quit of these waters,' exclaimed Vanderdecken moodily, and often dropping his knife and fork to take his beard in both hands and stroke it with a fixed look in his eyes, which would have made you swear he beheld a vision. "'And we shall have so much sun every day, climbing higher and higher, until it hangs right over our mastheads like a flaming shield.' that the coolness of the biscayan sea and the entrance of the english channel shall be sweet as drink to a dry man pray mynheer said i how far to the eastwards do you suppose this gale has driven us he looked at me with a sudden temper in his face as if he would crush me for daring to ask nevertheless he answered but with a deep thrill in the rich tremble of his voice about one hundred and fifty leagues sir and what of that ay and what of that exclaimed van vogelaar who had turned a scowling eye on me on my asking this question why nothing gentlemen i answered warned by the violet eyes that dwelt upon me to slide out of this matter as quickly as i could the ground to be recovered is not great and a pretty little southeast wind should float us with square yards round the cape in three or four days vanderdecken made no response his eyes fell away from me to the table at which he gazed in the posture of one who dreams waking van vogelaar on the other hand continued to stare at me for a long minute which as he sat on my right hand and consequently had to turn his head and hold his face full towards me proved a very severe trial to my temper insomuch that i could have beat him for his insolence but a very little reflection taught me to consider this steadfast surly and abusive regard as meaningless as a dead man's stare would be if moulded to the expression van vogelaar wore so i waited till he should have made an end of his scrutiny and the captain shortly after rising i followed him on deck the weather as yet being too heavy and wet for imogene it was as vanderdecken had said the gale had broke and we might look for a clear sky presently yet the sea still ran fearfully high and the wash and weltering of it along the sea-line that was now indifferently clear suggested a vast sierra whose sides beyond were in sunshine whilst over our trucks lay the sombre twilight of the tempest there was still a fine rain in the air though not such as to cloud the ocean but i was so fascinated by the picture of the flying dutchman's fight with the mighty combers which rolled at her from the north and west that i lingered gazing till i was pretty near as soaked as when i had been fished up and brought aboard but a sailor makes no trouble of a wet jacket so long as he has a dry shirt to his back which i had thanks to vanderdecken who had been so good as to lend me several shifts of linen i do not know that i ever saw or heard of a ship that threw from her such bodies of foam as did this vessel she would rise at the sea buoyantly enough yet at every lean-to to windward for a giddy sliding swoop into the hollow she hurled an enormous space of seething and spitting and flashing froth many fathoms from her into which she would sink as though it were snow and so squatter as tis termed and lie there whilst you might count to ten or fifteen ere rising out of it 
to the irresistible heave of the next leviathan sea often had i watched this picture during the six days but the light breaking around the whole circle of the sea like radiance dully streaming through greased paper the decreasing force of the wind that while leaving the surges still monstrous suffered the ship to fall with deader weight to windward thus enlarging the snow-like surface she cast from her whilst rendering it fiercer in its boiling made this particular example of the ship's sea-going qualities a marvel in my sight and i stood for a long time looking and looking by seven o'clock that night the gale was spent and there was then blowing a quiet breeze from the west-southwest the swell rolled slowly from the quarter from which the wind had stormed and caused the brav to wallow most nauseously but she grew a bit steadier after they had shaken the reefs out of the courses and made sail on her i watched this business with deep interest vanderdecken standing on the poop gave his orders to van vogelaar on the quarter-deck the sailors went to work with true dutch phlegm and deliberateness taking plenty of time to unknot the reef points then carrying the fore and main jeers to the capstan and walking round without a song sullen and silent there was no liveliness none of the springing and jumping and cheerful heartiness you would expect in a crew who after battling through six dismal days of black winds and lashing seas were now looked down upon by a heaven of stars shining gloriously among a few slowly moving clouds after a little vanderdecken went below and presently returned bringing imogene with him on the poop twas all darkness save for the phosphorescence in the ship and the sea-fire over the side the captain and the lady came close before i distinguished them fair weather at last mr fenton she exclaimed after peering to make sure of me and then stopping so as to oblige vanderdecken to stop too for he had her arm in his and i think he meant to walk to and fro the deck with her yes i replied heaven is merciful such another six days i would not pass through for the wealth in this ship pray speak in dutch sir that i may follow you said vanderdecken with a certain stern and dignified courtesy if i could converse with ease mine hair said i i should speak in no other language aboard this vessel as it is i fear you do not catch half my meaning oh yes you are intelligible sir he answered though you sometimes use words which sound like dutch but signify nothing nothing to you my friend thought i but i warrant them of good currency in the amsterdam of to-day in short his language was to mine or at least to the smattering i had of the batavian tongue what the speech of a man of the time of charles the second would be to one of this century not very wide asunder only that one would now and again introduce an obsolete expression whilst the other would occasionally employ a term created years after his colloquist's day but it pleases me captain to speak in my own tongue said imogene i should not like to forget my language it will be strange if you forget your language in a few months my child he answered with a slight surprise a sudden roll of the ship causing the great mainsail to flap he started looked around him and cried out with a sudden anger in his deep voice to the steersman how is the ship's head north by east was the answer we want no easting he cried out again with the same passion in his voice and strode with vehemence to the binnacle where stood antony arents who had charge of the deck and who had gone to view the compass on hearing the skipper call this will not do i heard the captain say his deep tones rumbling into the ear as though you passed at a distance a church in which an organ was played 
"'By the bones of my father, I'll not have her break off. "'Sweat your braces, man. Take them to the capstan. "'If we spring our masts and yards for it, "'she'll have to head nothing east of north.' There was a fierce impetuosity in his speech that made the delivery of it sound like a sustained execration. Harrance went forward and raised some cries. I could see the figure of Vanderdecken black against the stars, up and down which he slided with the heave of the ship. He was motionless, close to the binnacle, and I could imagine the stormy rise and fall of his broad and powerful chest under his folded arms. The watch came aft to the braces and strained at them. T'was a shadowy scene. There were none of those songs and choruses which seamen use to keep time in their pulling and hauling and to encourage their spirits withal. The boatswain, Jans, was on the forecastle attending the fore. Arents stood on the quarter-deck. Occasionally, one or the other shouted out an order which the dim concavities on high flung down again out of their hollows as though there were ghosts aloft mocking at these labours you saw the pallid shinings writhing about the feet of the sailors and the sharper scintillations of the woodwork wherever it was chafed by a rope when they had trimmed but not yet with the capstan Arents called to the captain, who returned an answer implying that the ship had come up again, and that the trim, as it was, would serve. Thereupon the men stole out of sight into the darkness forward, melting into the blackness as do visions of a slumberer into the void of deep and dreamless rest. Arents returned to the poop, and stood near the captain, who held his place with the entranced stirlessness I was now accustomed to see in him. But, no doubt, his eyes were on the needle, and had I dared approach, I might have beheld a fire in his eyes keener than the flame of the mesh with which the binnacle was illuminated. "'You would know him as one not of this world,' said I to Imogene, even should he pass you quickly in a crowd." There are some lines in the book of poetry downstairs which fit him to perfection, she answered. Thou hast a grim appearance, and thy face bears a command in it. Though thy tackle's torn, thou shrewest a noble vessel. Ay, said I, they are wonderfully pat. They might have been made for him. Here are others, she continued. He has, I know not what of greatness in his looks and of high fate that almost awes me and when his moods change these verses are always present readst thou not something in my face that speaks wonderful change and horror from within me she put a tragic note into her voice as she recited the starlight was in her eyes and they were fixed on me her face whitened out to the astral gleaming, till you saw her hair throbbing on her forehead to the blowing of the wind. She continued, I could quote a score of passages marvelously true of the captain and his fellows, serving indeed as revelations to me, so keen are the eyes of poets. And little wonder, says she with a sigh, for what else have I had to read but that book of poetry? Just now, said I, he asked if you thought it likely you should lose your language in a few months. This plainly shows that he supposes he met with you in his passage from Batavia. That is his last passage. Now, since his finding you dates nearly five years back, and you tell me that he has only memory for what has happened within the past few months, how does it fall out that he recollects your story which he certainly does for he asked me if you had related it to me it must be she answered because he is constantly alluding to it in speaking of the reception his wife and daughters will give me it is also impressed upon him by my presence 
by my frequent asking him to put me on board a homeward-going ship and so it is kept in his mind as a thing constantly happening continually fresh suppose i should stay in this ship say for six months never speaking of the saracen nor recalling the circumstance of my coming on board you believe his memory would drop the fact and that he would view me as one who happened to be in the ship and that's all his mind stopping at that how he would view you i cannot say but i am certain he would forget how you came here unless there was incessant reference to the saracen and to her men shooting at van vogelaar but time would bear no part in this sort of recollection he would still be living in the year of god sixteen fifty three and sailing home from batavia and if he thought at all he'd imagine it was in that year that you came on board his ship meanwhile the giant figure of the dutch captain stood motionless near the binnacle close to him was the second mate himself like a statue the tiller tackles grasped by the helmsman swayed him with every blow of the sea upon the rudder yet even his movements had a lifelessness in them that was as apparent as though the man had been stricken dead at his post and swung there against the dancing stars a quick jerk of the ship causing imogene to lose her balance she grasped my arm to steady herself by and i took care she should not release me indeed from almost the first hour of our meeting there had been a yearning towards me a wistfulness of a mute sort underlying her demeanour and this night i found assurance of it by her manner that was now indeed clinging having more of nestling in it as if i was her refuge her one hope she may have guessed i loved her i cannot tell my eyes may have said much though i had not spoken but there was that in her as she stood by my side with her hand under my arm that persuaded me her heart was coming to mine and haply more quickly because of our sole mortality amid the substantial shadows of the death ship's crew you felt what that bond meant when you looked around you and saw the dimly looming figure of vanderdecken beside the compass the ghostly darkness of the second mate's form the corpse-like swaying of the helmsman as of an hanging body moved by the wind and thought of the amazing human mysteries lost in the darkness forward or slumbering in the hammocks if indeed sleep was ever permitted to visit eyes which death was forbidden to approach twas as if imogene stood on one side a grave i on the other and clasped hands for the courage we found in warm and circulating blood over a pit filled with a heart-freezing sight we shall escape yet fear not said i speaking out of the heat of my own thoughts as though we were conversing on that subject may our saviour grant it she exclaimed see how black the white water around the ship makes her in spite of the strange fires which glow everywhere i felt her shiver as she cried the vessel seems to grow more terrible to my fancy it may be because we have talked so much of her and your views of vanderdecken and the crew have raised terrifying speculations in me we shall escape yet i repeated hotly for the very sense of our imprisonment and the helplessness of our condition for the time being that might be long in terminating was a thought so maddening that i felt in a temper to defy scorn and spit in the face of the very devil himself was he to appear but i had her right hand pressed to my heart twas sure she felt the comfort of it and together for some while in silence we stood viewing the ship the fabric of whose hull stood out as though lined with india ink upon the ashen tremble of froth that seemed to embrace her length like shadowy white arms as the wind blowing mildly into her sails 
forced her to break the water at her stem as she slided athwart the swell. She made a sight to shrink from. The sailor's heart within me sank to this feebly luminous mystery of aged yet imperishable hull, holding within her creatures so unnatural that the eye of man can view the like of them nowhere else, and raising her structure of ancient sail and masts to the stars which glided in blue and green and white along the yards with the rolling of her. Little wonder that she should affright the mariner who meets her amid the lonely paths of the vast ocean she haunts. I clasped my brow with bewilderment in my brain. Surely, I cried to my companion, I am dreaming. It cannot be that I, at this moment, am standing on the deck of the death ship. She sought to soothe me, but she was startled by my behavior, and that perception enabled me to rally. If she, as a weak and lonely maiden, could bravely support five years of life amid this crew, what craven was I to have my brain confused by only seven days' association spent mainly in her company? Heaven forgive me! But methinks I realized our condition, all that it might hereafter signify, with a keenness of insight, present and prophetic, which would be impossible in her, whose knowledge of the sea was but a child's when she fell into Vanderdecken's hands. "'We must have patience, courage, and hope, Mr. Fenton,' she said softly. "'Look at that starry jewel yonder,' and she turned up her face to the cross that hung above the mizzen topmast head, gleaming very gloriously in a lake of deep indigo betwixt two clouds. "'It shines for me, and often have I looked up at it with full eyes and a prayer in my heart.' It shines for you, too. It is the emblem of our redemption, and we must drink in faith that God will succor us from it. She continued to gaze at it, and there was sheen enough to enable me to see a tender smile upon her upturned face. How sweet did she then appear, fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars, as the poet wrote, I looked up to that sparkling cross, and thought how strange it was that the sentence pronounced upon this ship should doom her to sail eternally over waters above which there nightly rises the lustrous symbol of compassion and mercy. "'Take my arm, my child. Tis silly work standing,' said the deep voice of the captain. Again had he come upon us unawares, but this time he found us silent, together gazing at the cross of stars. She withdrew her hand quickly from my arm and took his, showing wisdom in her promptness, as I was quick to see. Then, being alone, I went to the quarter-deck and fell to walking briskly. For Vanderdecken was right. Chapter 24 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 24 The Death Ship's Forecastle. Next morning being very fine, the first bright day that had broken since I had been in the ship, I thought, since it was early, an hour to breakfast, Vanderdecken in his cabin and Arents alone on the poop deck with the man who steered, that I would look a little closely into the vessel and ascertain, if possible, where and how the men slept, where they dressed their food and the like. I spied the corpulent figure of Jans, the boatswain, forward of the foremast. He was standing with his arms folded, staring ahead. His posture somehow suggested a vacancy of mind, 
and you thought of him as looking into god knows what distance with the unmeaningness you observe in the fixed gaze of a babe sucking i could not say whether the decks had been washed down they seemed damp as if newly swabbed one whom i supposed to be the ship's carpenter was sawing wood near the house in which were the livestock two others hard by him sat upon a sail stitching at it there was a seaman in the foretop but what doing i could not see little more than his head showed above the barricade i walked forward to where the boatswain stood and on observing that he took no notice of me i touched him lightly on the shoulder he turned his round face ghastly as death yet as fleshy and plump as life and gazed at me i felt nervous it was dreadful to accost these conformations which were neither men nor devils but i was resolved to go through with the business i had on hand impelled by the thought that if i was suffered to come off with my life from this experience there would be that to relate to the world beyond anything which seamen have told of the ocean life i said to him good morning here jans here to be sure is a fine sky with noble promise true sir he answered seeming to step out of the mystery of his stillness and vacancy without effort she looks fairly up but so tedious a nor'wester should be followed by a southerly gale heaven grant it cried i gathering courage from his civility you will be glad to see old amsterdam again no doubt ay said he i warrant you and my wife amana too and my daughter tobina ha ha his laugh was like that of the parrot mirthless and not a wrinkle stirred upon his countenance to give reality to his shocking merriment to come at what i wanted for i did not wish vanderdecken to arrive and see me forward i said yes meetings are made sweeter by a little delay pardon me here i am an englishman not well acquainted with the shipboard usages of the dutch in the ship of which i was second mate we had what is called a top-gallant forecastle in which the crew slept he interrupted with a shake of the head i do not understand said he this was not strange for as i did not know the dutch words i called it top-gallant forecastle in english they slept under a deck resembling the poop said i ha he exclaimed where do your crew sleep down there he responded pointing to a hatch answering to the forescuttle of these times is it a comfortable cabin said i he made a face and spat behind his hand which caused me to see that sailors in all times have been alike in the capacity of grumbling and that even in this man who by virtue of the age he had attained had long ceased to be human and was kept alive only by the curse it was his lot to share with the skipper the instinct of the seaman still lived a few sparks among blackened embers judge for yourself if you will said he my last ship was the mad von Eukhuysen, and though her forecastle raised a mutiny among us for its badness i tell you mine here twas as punches to stale cold water compared to this he motioned me to descend but i asked him to go first for how was i to guess what would be my reception if the men saw me entering their boat unaccompanied very good said he and catching hold of the combing he dropped his great figure through the hatch and i followed we descended by a ladder in perfect correspondence with the rest of the fittings of this ship the handrails carved and the steps a sort of grating different indeed from the pieces of coarse rough wood nailed to the bulkhead which in these days form the road down through the fore scuttle the light of the heavens fell fair through the hatch but seemed powerless to penetrate the gloom that lay around 
i was blinded at first and stood a moment under the hatch idly blinking and beholding nothing then stepping out of the sphere of the daylight there stole upon my sight the details of the place one by one helped by the wan sputtering and smoking flame of a lamp shaped like a coffee-pot the waste or mesh coming out of the spout fed by what the nose readily determined to be slush jans stood beside me can you see mine here said he ay tis growing upon me by degrees i replied master exclaimed a hollow voice proceeding from the darkest part of this forecastle if you could help me fill the bowl of a tobacco pipe i should be grateful very luckily i had the remains of what sailors term a prick of tobacco in my pocket which prins when he dried my jacket had very honestly suffered to remain there the piece had been so hard pressed in the making and rendered so waterproof by the rum in it that my falling overboard had left it perfectly sweet and fit for smoking by a stingy and cautious use of the knife there was enough of it to give all hands a smoke i pulled it out and handed it to jans to deliver to the man who had addressed me jans smelt it and said yes it was tobacco but how was it to be smoked i pulled out my knife and stepping into the light under the hatch put the tobacco upon one of the ladder steps and fell to slicing or rather shaving it and when i had cut enough to fill a pipe bowl i rolled up the shreds in my hands and taking a sooty clay pipe from jans charged it and bade him light it at the lamp he did so speedily returning smoking heartily puffing out great clouds and crying out oh but tis good tis good it is tiring work cutting up this kind of tobacco and jans now understanding how it was done took the knife and the tobacco and shred about an inch of it there being in all between three and four inches whilst this was doing i had leisure to gaze about me no sooner had jans lighted his pipe so that all could see he was smoking than from several parts of that gloomy interior there slided a number of figures who quickly clustered around the ladder over one of whose steps or treads the boatswain leaned pipe in mouth whilst he sliced and shaved the daylight fell upon some of them others were faintly to be seen in the dim illumination which the lustre passing through the hatch feebly spread from rows of old hammocks that died out in the gloom these men had dropped and mariners half perished with hunger could not have exhibited more delirious eagerness for food than did these unhappy creatures for a pipeful of the tobacco jans was at work upon a dismaler and wilder nay a more affrighting picture i defy the imagination to body forth it was not only that many of these unhappy people were half naked most of them still swinging in their hammocks when i descended it was their corpse-like appearance as though a graveyard had disgorged its dead who had come together in a group quickened and urged by some hunger lust or need common to the whole and expressing in many varieties of countenance the same desire all about jans they crowded fifteen or twenty men some thin with their ribs showing others with sturdy legs of the dutch kind some nearly bald some so hairy that their locks and beards flowed down their backs and chests some dark with black eyes others round-faced and blue-eyed but every man of them looking as if he was newly risen lazarus-like from the tomb as though he had burst the bondage of the coffin and come into this forecastle dead yet living his body formed of the earth of the grave 
and his soul of the curse that kept him alive i had particularly hoped to see some of them sleeping wondering what appearance they presented in slumber also whether such as they ever dreamed and what sort of expressions their faces wore but the place was too dark to have yielded this sight even had i been at liberty to peer into their hammocks when my eyes grew used to the twilight of the slush lamp and i could see plain i found there was not much to whet curiosity here and there stood a box or sea-chest against the aged sides hanging by nails or hooks were coats trousers oilskins and the like most of them differing in fashion swaying with the heaving of the ship some odds and ends of shoes and boots a canvas bucket or two a tall basket in which were stowed the dishes and mugs the men ate and drank with completed with the hammocks overhead all the furniture that i could distinguish of this melancholy rat gnawed yea and noisome forecastle by this time jans was wearied of slicing the tobacco and the fellow called meindert krins was at work upon what remained of it all who had pipes filled them and i was surprised to find how well off they were in this respect though my wonder ceased when i afterwards heard that amongst other articles of freight vanderdecken had met with in a derelict were cases of long clay pipes it was both moving and diverting to watch these half-clad creatures smoking their manner of holding the smoke in their mouths for the better tasting of it the solemn joy with which they expelled the clouds some in their hammocks with their naked legs over the edge others on the chests manifestly insensible to the chilly wind that blew down through the hatch no man spoke if aught of mind there was among them it seemed to be devoted to keeping their pipe bowls burning jans stood leaning against the foremast puffing at his pipe his eyes directed into the gloom in the bows that he had forgotten the errand that brought him below that i had no more existence for him than would have been the case had i never fallen from the rail of the saracen was clearly to be gathered from his strange rapt posture and air i touched him again on the shoulder and he turned his eyes upon me but without starting twas the easiest nimblest way of slipping out of a condition of trance into intelligence and life that can be conceived i wished to see all i dared ask to look at and said where do you cook your food i will show you he answered and walked to some distance abaft the forescuttle i followed him painfully for i could scarce see indeed here would have been total blackness to one fresh from the sunlight there was a bulkhead with an opening on the larboard hand we passed through it and i found myself on a deck pretty well filled up at the after end with coils of cable casks and so forth a windward port was open and through it came light enough to see by in the middle of this deck was a sort of caboose situated clear of the ropes and casks twas in short a structure of stout scantling open on either side and fitted with brickwork contrived for a furnace and coppers for boiling a man the cook or the cook's mate his feet naked his shanks clothed in breeches of a faded blue stuff and his trunk in a woolen shirt was at work boiling a kind of soup for the crew's breakfast another man stood at a dresser rolling paste this fellow was a very short corpulent person with a neck so fat that a pillow of flesh lay under the back of his head never in my time had i viewed a completer figure of a dutchman than this cook you would have supposed that into this homely picture of boiling and pie-making there would have entered such an element of life and reality as was nowhere else to be found in that accursed ship 
yet so little was this so that i do not know that in all the time i had been in the brave i had beheld a more ghastly picture it was the two men who made it so the unreality of their realness to comprehend which if this phrase should sound foolishly think upon the vision of an insane man or upon some wondrous picture painted upon the eyes of the dying or opening upon the gaze of some enthusiast the flames of the furnace shot a crimson glare upon the first of the two men i have described he never turned his head to look at me but went on stirring what was in the copper the place had much of the furniture of one of our present cabooses or galleys there was a kind of dresser and there were racks for holding dishes an old brass timepiece that was as great a curiosity in its way as the clock in the cabin a chair of the last century a couple of wooden bellows and such matters i was moving when the little fat cook suddenly fell a sniffing and turning to jans said is there tobacco at last no answered jans this here had a piece which he has distributed tis all gone but there is a smoke left in this pipe take it he dried the sooty stem upon his sleeve and handed it to the cook who instantly began to puff uttering one or two exclamations of pleasure but with an unmoved countenance is there no tobacco on board said i following jans into the forecastle the skipper has a small quantity but there is none for the crew he answered had your ship supplied us with a little stock twould have been a godsend welcomer sir than the powder and shot you wantonly bestowed upon our boat we were now in the forecastle and this reference to the action of the terrified crew of the saracen in the hearing of the seamen who overhung their hammocks or squatted on their chests smoking alarmed me so with a quickly uttered good morning addressed to them all i sprang up Chapter Twenty Five of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty Five. We sight a ship. It was like coming out of a sepulchre to step from that forecastle on deck where the glorious sun was and the swaying shadows and where the blue wind gushed in a soft breathing over the bulwark rails with weight enough in it to hold the canvas stirless and to raise a gentle hissing alongside like the seething of champagne i spied vanderdecken on the poop and near him imogene so i hastened aft to greet the girl and salute the great bearded figure that nobly towered beside her she looked fragrant and sweet as a white rose in the dewy morn wore a straw hat turned up on one side and looped to stay there with a party-coloured rosette and though this riband was faded with age and the straw yellow and dull through keeping the gear did suit her beauty most divinely and i could have knelt and kissed her hand so complete a princess did she appear in the royal perfections of her countenance and shape to turn from the sparkle of her violet eye the rosiness of her lip the life that teemed in the expression of her face like a blushing light shining through fragile porcelain to turn from her to the great silent figure near her with piercing gaze directed over the taffrail his beard trembling to the downrush of air from the mizzen was to obtain a proper contrast to enable you to realize in the aspect of that amazing person the terrible conditions of his existence and the enormous significance of his sentence with a smile of pleasure at the sight of me 
Imogene bade me good morning, saying, I am before you for the first time since you have been in the ship. I was out of my cabin half an hour ago, perhaps longer, said I. What think you I have been doing? Exploring the sailors' quarters and inspecting the kitchen. And I tossed up my hands and turned up my eyes, that she might guess what I thought of those places. Then, meeting Vanderdecken's gaze, which he had brought to bear upon me with a frowning roll of the eyes, I took off my hat, giving him a bow. He greeted me in his imperious, stormy way, and asked me what I thought of his ship. I replied, "'She is a very fine vessel, sir.' "'Did they lift the hatches to show the cargo to you?' he exclaimed. I answered smartly, "'No.' perceiving that he was aware i had been below in the forepart how does my forecastle show to your english prejudice he said oh mine here said i smiling with a look at imogene whose eyes were fixed in the quarter over the stern into which vanderdecken had been staring so far from englishmen being prejudiced at all events in naval matters we are continually taking ideas from other nations particularly from the french whose ships of war we imitate and admire perhaps said i that is one of the reasons why we are incessantly capturing the vessels of that nation but the conceit was lost because this man had flourished before we had become the terror of the french that our admirals have since made the english flag to be imogene cried out in dutch do you know mr fenton that there is a sail in sight my heart gave a bound and following the indication of her ivory white forefinger which pointed directly astern i saw the tiny gleam of what was unquestionably a ship's canvas resembling the curved tip of a gull's wing ay to be sure yonder's a sail i exclaimed after keeping my eyes fixed upon it a while to make sure and i added in dutch which way madam does the captain say she is steering directly after us she replied judge for yourself sir said vanderdecken motioning with his hand toward a telescope that stood against the deck-house it was the ancient heavy tube i had observed in his cabin i picked it up rested it upon the rail it was too weighty for the support of my left hand and worked away with it at the sail astern it was a feeble old glass magnifying i should suppose to the proportion of a crown to a groat in fact i could see as well with the naked eye it was vanderdecken's telescope however and a curiosity and still feigning to view the sail i secretly ran my eye over the tubes noticing in very faint letters the words Cornelius Vanderdecken, Amsterdam, 1650, graved in flowing characters upon the large tube. "'She's heading after us, you think, mynheer?' said Vanderdecken, as I rose. "'I could not say, sir. Has she grown since you first observed her?' "'Yes.' He took the glass and leveled it very easily, and I met Imogene's gaze, as she glanced from him to me as though she was sure i could not but admire the massive manly figure of that man drawn to his full height and in such a posture as one would love to see him painted in she is certainly steering our course said he speaking with his eye at the tube i hope she may not prove an english man of war who can tell if a merchantman be her nationality what it may, we'll speak her for tobacco, for that's a commodity we must have. I looked earnestly, and with a face flushed with hope at Imogene, but she glanced away from me to the sail, signaling to me by this action, in a manner unmistakable, to be wary. Vanderdecken put down the glass, cast a look aloft at the set of his canvas and the trim of his yards, and then called to Arents to heave the log. Some seamen came aft in response to the second mate's call, and bringing out a reel, 
and sand glass from the deck house measured the speed of the ship through the water precisely as we at this day do so ancient is this simple device of telling a ship's speed of passage through the water by paying out a line marked with knots to the running of sand i heard arendt say that the vessel was going three knots and a half at that rate said i to imogene whilst vanderdecken remained aft watching in a soulless manner the automaton-like motions of the men engaged in hauling the line in and reeling it up that vessel yonder if she be actually heading our way will soon overhaul us mr fenton said she with subdued energy in her soft voice i earnestly pray you neither by word look or sign to give captain vanderdecken the least reason to suspect that you mean to escape from his ship and rescue me whenever the chance shall offer i will tell you why i say this just now he spoke of you to me and said if an opportunity offered he should put you on board any vessel that would receive you no matter where she was bound to and then he asked what you and i chiefly talked about there was more sternness in his manner than ever i recollect in him when addressing me if i thought him capable of human emotions said i i should reckon him jealous but he has human emotions he loves his wife and children she replied ay but who is to know that that love is not left to linger in him as part of his curse said i by which i mean if he was not suffered to remember his wife and children and love them he might not show himself very eager to get round the cape possibly he wants to get rid of me not because he is jealous not because he dislikes me as a man but because that malignant baboon van vogelaar may have been speaking against me putting fears into his head touching his treasure and working upon his duty as a hollander a compatriot of de reuter god help him to hate me as an englishman but he loves me too mr fenton said she as a father might said i not liking this yet amused by her sweet tenaciousness yes as a father but it shows he has capacity for other emotions outside those which you deem necessary for the duration of the sentence i ought to believe so if he hates me said i looking his way and observing that he had turned his back upon us and was watching the sail astern but be all this as it will you shall find me as careful as you can desire if said she plaintively he should become even faintly suspicious of your intentions he might set you ashore should we not meet with a ship to receive you and then what would become of you and what would become of me mr fenton have no fear said i he shall discover nothing in me to make him suspicious as to his setting me ashore that he could do and whether i should be able to outwit him in such a manoeuvre i cannot tell but in no other way could he get rid of me unless by throwing me overboard he would not do that she exclaimed shaking her head nor do i think he would force you from this ship if he could find no ground for distrust but something affecting you has worried his mind i am certain or he would not have declared his intention to send you to another vessel he believes he is going straight home why then should he not be willing to carry you maybe he heard from arendt that you were below exploring the ship oh mr fenton be cautious if not for your own sake then for mine she involuntarily brought her little hands together into a posture of prayer with the earnestness of her entreaty and her warmth flowed rosily to her cheeks so that though she spoke low her manner was impassioned and i saw how her dear heart was set upon my delivering her and how great was her terror lest my thoughtlessness should end in procuring our separation however i had no time to then reassure her though i resolved henceforth to walk with extraordinary circumspection 
seeing that the people I had fallen amongst were utterly unintelligible to me, being so composite in their dead aliveness that it was impossible to come at their motives and feelings, if they possessed any resembling ours. I say I had not time to reassure her, for Prins arrived to report breakfast, which brought Vanderdecken to us. Little was said at table, but that little was quite enough to make me understand the wisdom of Imogene's fears, and to perceive that, if I did not check my curiosity to inspect the ship, so as to be able to deliver a true account of this strange and fearful fabric, I stood to lose Imogene the chance of escape which my presence in the vessel provided her with. No matter which of the two mates had the watch on deck, Van Vogelaar always sat down to meals first, Aaron's following. He was beside me this morning, as usual, coming fresh from his cabin, and when we were seated, Vanderdecken told him there was a ship astern. "'How heading, skipper? "'As we go, without doubt. "'She hath grown swiftly since first sighted, "'yet hangs steady in the same quarter. "'Let her hoist any colours but those of this gentleman's country,' "'said Van Vogelaar, with an ugly sneer. "'Should that happen, Captain, will you fight her?' I asked quietly. "'If she be a ship of war?' No, for what are our defences against the culverins and demi-culverins of your ships? And how shall we match perhaps four hundred sailors with our slender company, replied Vanderdecken, with an evil glitter in his eyes, and grasping his beard as his custom was when wrathful thoughts surged in him. She may prove a harmless merchantman, perhaps a sturdy Hollander, that will give you plenty of tobacco for a little of your silver, said Imogene, striking in with her sweet smile and melodious voice, like a sunbeam upon turbulent waters. If you are in doubt, why not shift your helm, gentlemen, said I. Ah, skipper, cried Van Vogelaar sardonically, we have an adviser here. It is fit that a Dutch ship should be served by an English pilot. I held my peace. At this moment the clock struck, and the parrot, as though some fiend was inside her green bosom, prompting her to breed trouble, cried out, Visen avadomd, with fierce energy, severely clawing her wires, and exhibiting more agitation than seemed possible in a fowl of naturally dull and leaden motions. "'I believe she speaks the truth,' exclaimed Van Vogelaar, turning his face towards the cage. "'The parrot hath been known to possess a witch-like capacity of forecasting and divining. "'Oh, but you know here that she had that sentence by heart when the captain bought her,' said Imogene, "'with a mixed air of distress and petulance in her face. "'I know, madam,' he replied, that yonder bird never spoke those words with such energy as she now puts into them before this gentleman arrived. Vanderdecken looked at him, and then at me, but did not speak. "'What do you suspect from the increased energy of the bird's language?' said I, fixing my eyes upon the mate. He would not meet my gaze, but answered with his eyes upon his plate— what is your motive in examining this ship, sir? The harmless curiosity of a sailor, I replied. He was about to speak, but I lifted my hand, meaning to entreat silence, whilst I continued. But he, mistaking the gesture for a threat, shrank very abjectly from his seat, proving himself a timorous, cowardly fellow, and the more to be feared, perhaps, for being so. "'Captain Vanderdecken,' said I, keeping my hand lifted, "'that he and his mate might understand I intended no menace. "'I know not what base and degrading charges here Van Vogelaar would insinuate. "'I am an honest man, and mean well. "'And, sir, add to that the gratitude of one whose life you have preserved. "'You were pleased on one occasion to speak kindly of my countrymen.' 
and regret that feud should ever exist between two nations whose genius seems to have a common root. I trust that your sympathy with Britain will cause you to turn a deaf ear to the unwarrantable hints against my honor as an English seaman dropped by your first mate. To this speech Vanderdecken made no reply. Indeed, I would not like to swear that he had heeded so much as a syllable of it. Van Vogelaar resumed the position on his seat from which he had started on my raising my hand, and went on with his meal. Shortly after this, Imogene left the table and entered her cabin, on which, weary of the sullen and malignant company of the mate and the ghostly silence and fiery eyes of Captain Vanderdecken, I rose, bowed to the skipper, and went on deck. I walked right aft, past the helmsman, and stood gazing with a most passionate yearning and wistfulness at the sail astern. The stranger had not greatly grown during the time we had passed below, but her enlargement was marked enough to make me guess that she was overhauling us hand over fist, as sailors say, and I reckoned that if the wind held, she would be within gunshot by three or four of the clock this afternoon. I went for Vanderdecken's glass and examined her again. The lenses imparted an atmospheric sharpness and pellucidity of outline which showed plainly enough the royals and topgallant sails of apparently a large ship slightly leaning from the wind i could not persuade myself that she was reaching for though our yards were as sharply braced as they would lie the stranger if she were close hauled could have luffed up three or four more points but as she held her place it was certain she was making a free wind and coming along with her yards braced in somewhat. Therefore, she was not bound to the westwards, and if for the Indian Ocean, what need had she to be heading due north? I put down the glass, but the yearning that rose within me at the sight of the vessel ceased when I thought of Imogene. Suppose that ship should prove the instrument of separating me from her, I had talked big, for the sake of comforting her, of fearing nothing from Vanderdecken save being set ashore or tossed overboard, for I counted upon any and all ships we met refusing to receive me if they found out that this ancient fabric was the Flying Dutchman. But suppose Vanderdecken should heave me overboard on nearing a vessel, leaving it to her people to succor me if they chose. These were the fancies which subdued in me the eager wistfulness raised by yonder gleaming wing of canvas, whitening like a mounting star upon the blue edge of the ocean in the south. Lost in thought, I continued gazing until presently I grew sensible of the presence of someone standing close beside me. It was Imogene. On the weather quarter was Van Vogelaar, surveying the sail with folded arms and stooped head. His face wore a malignant expression, and in his stirlessness he resembled an effigy, wrought with exquisite skill to a marvellous imitation of apparel and shape. "'Where is the captain?' I asked. "'He is smoking in the cabin,' Imogene answered. "'Yonder rascal is evidently my enemy,' said I. "'All will be well if you show no curiosity,' she replied softly. "'Do you not remember that I cautioned you at the very beginning? "'My belief is that the mate is mad you should know of the treasure in this ship, "'and will be eager to get rid of you lest you should contrive to possess it. "'But how?' "'By acquainting the master of the ship you are transferred to with the wealth in this vessel.' Add to this fear, for he has a share in all they recover from wrecks, and in a portion of the cargo, his hatred of you for your men firing at him. I begin to see, said I, that there are several strokes of human nature still to be witnessed among these unhappy wretches, spite of their monstrous age, the frightfulness of the curse they are under, and there being men who are alive in death, corpses reflecting vitality just as the dead moon shines. 
but needs must where the devil drives speculating will not serve we must wait i watched her whilst she looked at the sail in our wake emotion darkened and lightened in the violet of her eyes as the blue folds of heaven seemed to deepen and brighten with the breathings of the wind through her delicate lips her rose-sweet breath came and went swiftly she started looked at van vogelaar aloft at the canvas round the deck with a sharp tremble running through her light form and cried out with an hysteric swiftness and in a voice full of tears you will not leave me to this wretched fate mr fenton you will not leave me in this dreadful ship i grasped her hand i swear before the majesty of that offended god whose eye is on this ship as we thus stand that if i am forced to leave you Chapter Twenty Six of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty Six. We watch the ship approach us. We stood in silence for some moments, hand in hand. Then, finding von Vogelaar furtively watching us, I quitted her side. At the same moment, Vanderdecken came on deck. Leaning against the rail of the bulwarks as high as my shoulder-blades, I quietly waited for what was to come, yet with a mind lively with curiosity and expectation. What would Vanderdecken do? What colors would the stranger show? How would she behave? what part might I have to take in whatever was to happen? To be sure, the stranger would not be up with us for some while yet, but since breakfast the breeze had slightly freshened, and by the rapid enlargement of those shining heights astern you knew that the wind had but to gather a little more weight to swiftly swirl yonder nimble craft up to within musket-shot of this cumbrous ancient fabric. I looked over the rail, watching the sickly colored side slipping sluggishly through the liquid transparent blue, marbled sometimes by veins and patches of foam, flung with a sullen indifference of energy from the hewing cutwater, on the top of which there projected a great beak, where yet lingered the remains of a figurehead that I had some time before made out to represent an Hercules, frowning down upon the sea with uplifted arms as though in the act of smiting with a club. It was easy to guess that this ship had kept the seas for some months since careening by observing the shellfish below the waterline, and the strings of black and green weed she lifted with every roll. But uncouth as was the fabric, gaunt as her aged furniture made her decks appear, inconvenient and ugly as was her rig, exhibiting a hundred signs of the primitiveness in naval construction of the age to which she belonged. Yet when I lifted my eyes from the water to survey her, t'was not without a sentiment of veneration beyond the power of the horror of the supernaturalism of her and her crew raised in me to correct. For was it not by such ships as this that the great and opulent islands and continents of the world had been discovered and laid open as theatres for posterity to act dazzling parts in? Was it not with such ships as this that battles were fought, the courage, audacity, skill, and fierce determination exhibited in which many latter conflicts may indeed parallel, but never in one single instance surpass? Was it not by such ships as this that the great protector raised the name of Britain to such a height as exceeds all we read of in the history of ancient or modern nations? What braver admirals, more skillful soldiers, more valiant captains, stouter-hearted mariners have flourished than those whose cannon flamed in thunder from the sides of such ships as this? The time passed. At the hour of eleven, or thereabouts, the hull of the ship astern was visible upon the waterline. The breeze had freshened, 
and the long heave of the swell left by the gale was whipped into wrinkles which melted into a creamy sparkling as they ran. Under the sun, upon our starboard bow, the ocean was kindled into glory. Through the trembling splendor the blue of the sea surged up in fluctuating veins, and the conflict of the sapphire dye dwelling up into the liquid dazzle, where it showed an instant, ere being overwhelmed by the blaze on the water, was a spectacle of beauty worthy of lifelong remembrance. Elsewhere the crisp plain of the ocean stretched darker than the heavens, under which were many clouds, moving with full white bosoms like the sails of ships, carrying tinted shinings resembling wind galls or fragments of solar rainbows upon their shoulders or skirts as they happened to offer them to the sun. By this time you felt the stirring of curiosity throughout the ship. Whatever jobs the crew had been put to they now neglected, that they might hang over the sides or stand upon the rail to watch and study the ship astern of us. Many had an avidity in their stare that could not have been matched by the looks of famine-stricken creatures. Whether they were visited by some dim sense or perception of their frightful lot, and yearned, out of this weak emotion, for the ship in pursuit, albeit they might not have been able to make their wishes intelligible to their own understandings, God knoweth. Twas moving to see them, one with the sharp of his hand to his forehead, another fixedly gazing out of a tangle of gray hair, a third showing fat and ghastly to the sunlight, a fourth with black eyes charged with the slate-colored patches of blindness, straining his imperfect gaze under a bald brow, corrugated into lines as hard as iron. Vanderdecken had left Imogene and stood on the weather quarter with the mate. The girl being alone, I walked aft to her and said in English, feigning to speak of the weather by looking aloft as I spoke, "'I have held aloof long enough, I think. He will not object if I join you now?' "'No, his head is full of that ship yonder,' she replied. "'For my part, I am as weary of sitting as you must be of standing. Let us walk a little. He has never yet objected to our conversing. Why should he do so now?' So saying, she rose. Her sheer weariness of being alone, or of talking to Vanderdecken, was too much for her policy of caution. We fell to quietly pacing the poop-deck to leeward, and with a most keen and exquisite delight I could taste in her manner the gladness our being together filled her with, and foresee the spirit of defiance to danger and risks that would grow in her with the growth of our love. No notice was taken of us. The eyes and thoughts of all were directed to the ship. From time to time Vanderdecken or Van Vogelaar would inspect her through the glass. Presently Antony Arents and Jans, the boatswain, joined them, and the four conversed as though the captain had called a council. "'She is picking us up very fast,' said I to Imogene, whilst we stood a while looking at the vessel. "'I should not like to swear to her nationality.' but that she is an armed ship, whether French or Dutch or English, is as certain as that she has amazingly lively heels. "'How white her sails are, and how high they rise!' exclaimed Imogene. "'She leans more sharply than we.' "'Aye,' said I, "'she shows twice our number of cloths. "'Is it not astonishing?' I continued, softening my voice. "'That Vanderdecken and his mates and men should not guess that there is something very wrong with them, from the mere contrast of such beautifully cut and towering canvas as that yonder, with the scanty, storm-darkened rags of sails under which this groaning old hull is driven along. Yes, at least to you and me, who have the faculty of appreciating contrasts, but think of them as deficient in all qualities but those which are necessary for the execution of the sentence. Then their heedlessness is that of a blind man, who remains insensible to the pointing of your finger to the object you speak to him about. "'Would to God you and I were quit of it all,' said I. "'We must pray for help, and hope for it too,' she answered, with a swift glance at me, 
that for a breathless moment carried the violet beauty and shining depths of her eyes fair into mine. An instant's meeting of our gaze only. Yet I could see her heart in that rapid, fearless, trustful look, as the depth of the heavens is revealed by a flash of summer lightning. Suddenly Vanderdecken gave orders for the ensign to be hoisted. The boatswain entered the little house and returned with the flag which he bent onto the halyards rove at the mizzen topmast head. The colors mounted slowly to his mechanical pulling, and they were worthy indeed of the dead and alive hand that hoisted them, being as ragged and attenuated with age as any banner hung high in the dusty gloom of a cathedral. But the flag was distinguishable as the Hollander's ensign, as you saw when it crazily streamed out its fabric, that was so thin in places you thought you spied the sky through it. One should say it was a flag seldom flown on board the Dutchman, to judge from the manner in which the crew cast their eyes up at it, never a one of them smiling. Indeed, though here and there, under the death pallor, there lay a sort of crumpling of the flesh, as of a grin. "'Twas a flag to drive thoughts of home deep into them, and now and again I would catch one muttering to another behind his hand, whilst the most of them continued to steadfastly regard the ensign for many minutes after Jans had mastheaded it. Chapter Twenty Seven of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty Seven The Centaur Flies From Us. Now the Dutch flag had not been flying twenty minutes when, my sight being keen, I thought I could perceive something resembling a color at the fore royal masthead of the ship. I asked Imogene if she saw it. She answered no. I said nothing, not being sure myself, and was unwilling to intrude upon the four men standing to windward by asking for the telescope. On board our ship they had set the spirit topsail, and the forward part of the dull, time-eaten, rugged old vessel resembled a Chinese kite. She was doing her best. But let her splutter as she would, twas for all the world like the sailing of a beer-barrel with a mast stepped in the bunghole. And this, thought I, was the vessel that gave the slip to the frigate belonging to Sir George Ayscue's squadron. The wake she made was short, broad, and oily, a square, fat, glistening surface of about her own length, not greatly exceeding the smoothness she would leave aweather if drifting dead to leeward under bare poles different, indeed, from the suggestion of comet-like speed which you find in the fleecy swirl of a line of foaming waters boiling out from the metalled run of a fleet cruiser, and rising and falling and fading into dim distance like a path of snow along a hilly land. On board yonder ship they would have perspective-glasses of a power very different from the flat lenses in Vanderdecken's tubes and since by this time it was certain they had us large in their telescopes, what would they be thinking of our huge, old-fashioned tops, fitter for the bowmen and musketeers of Ferdinand Magellan and Drake than the small armsmen of even the days of the Commonwealth, of the antique cut of our canvas, and the wild and disordered appearance its patches and colors submitted, of the grisly aspect of the wave-worn, storm-swept hull, of the peaked shape and narrowness of our stern, telling of times long vanished, as do the covers of an old book or the arches in an ancient church. Imogene and I continued our walk up and down, talking of many things, chiefly of England, whereof I gave her as much news, down to the time of the sailing of the Saracen, as I carried in my memory, until presently, coming abreast of the group of four, still on the weather-quarter, every man of whom, turn and turn about, had been working away with the telescope at the ship. Vanderdecken called me by name, and stepped over to us with the glass in his hand. 
"'Your sight is younger than ours, mine here,' said he, motioning towards Jans and the two mates. "'What flag do you make yonder vessel to be flying at her fore-top-gallant masthead?' I took the glass and pointed it, kneeling to rest it as before, and the instant the stranger came within the lenses I beheld Britannia's glorious blood-red St. George's Cross blowing out, a great white flag betwixt the fore royal yard and the truck that rose high above. Pretending to require time to make sure, I lingered to gather, if possible, the character of the ship. From the cut of her sails, the saucy, admirable set of them, the bigness of the topsails, the hungry yearning for us I seemed to find in the bellying of the studding sails she had thrown out, it would have been impossible for a nautical eye to mistake her for anything but a state ship, though of what rate I could not yet guess. There was a refraction that threw her up somewhat, and in the glass she looked to be swelling after us in a bed of liquid boiling silver, with a thin void of trembling blue between the whiteness and the sea-line. I rose and said, "'The color she shows is English.' Vanderdecken turned savagely towards the others and cried, "'English!' Arents let fly an oath. Jan struck his thigh heavily with his open hand. Van Vogelaar, scowling at me, cried, "'Are you sure, sir?' "'I am sure of the flag,' said I. "'But she may prove a Frenchman for all I know.' Vanderdecken clasped his arms tightly upon his breast and sank into thought with the fire in his eyes leveled at the coming ship. "'See there, gentlemen!' I exclaimed. "'A gun!' Bright as the morning was, I had marked a rusty red spark wink in the bow of the vessel, like a flash of sunshine from polished copper. A little white ball flew away to leeward, expanding as it fled. An instant after, just such another cloudy puff swept into the jibs and drove out in a gleaming trail or two. Presently the reports reached our ears in two dull thuds, one after the other. Vanderdecken stared aloft at his canvas, then over the side, enjoying the others. My excitement was intense. I could scarce contain myself. I knew there was a British squadron at the Cape and t'was possible that fellow there might be on a reconnoitering or cruising errand. "'You are sure she is English?' Imogene whispered. "'She is a man of war. She is flying our flag. I don't doubt she is English,' I replied. The girl drew a long, tremulous breath, and her arm touching mine, so close together we stood, I felt a shiver run through her. "'You are not alarmed, Imogene?' I exclaimed, giving her Christian name for the first time, and finding a lover's sweetness and delight in the mere uttering of it. She colored very faintly and cast her gaze upon the deck. "'What is going to happen?' she whispered. "'Will they send you on board that ship, keeping me?' "'No, they'll not do that. If she be an Englishman, and has balls to feed her cannon with—' I cried, raising my voice unconsciously. "'Hush!' she cried. Van Vogelaar watches us. We were silent for a space that the attention I had challenged should be again given to the ship. During the pause I thought to myself, but can her guns be of use? How much hulling and wounding should go to the destruction of a vessel that has been rendered imperishable by the curse of heaven? What injury could musket and pistol, could cutlass and hand-grenades deal men to whom death has ceased to be? who have outlived time and are owned by eternity. Vanderdecken, who had been taking short turns upon the deck with heated strides, stopped afresh to inspect the ship, and as he did so another flash broke from her weather-bow, and the smoke went from her in a curl. The skipper looked at the others. "'She has the wind of us and sails three feet to our one. Let the mainsail be hauled up and the topsail brought to the mast.' If she be the enemy her flag denotes, her temper will not be sweetened by a long pursuit of which the issue is clear. Van Vogelaar, scowling venomously, seemed to hang in the wind, on which Vanderdecken looked at him with an expression of face incredibly fierce and terrible. The posture of his giant figure, his half-lifted hand, 
the slight forward inclination of his head, as if he would blast his man with the lightning of his eyes. It was like seeing some marvelous personification of human wrath, and I whispered quickly to Imogene's ear, "'That will be how he appeared when he defied his god.' It was as if he could not speak for rage. And swiftly he was understood. In a breath Jans was rolling forward, calling to the men. Arents was hastening to his station on the quarter-deck, and Van Vogelaar was slinking to the foremost end of the poop. The crew, to the several cries that broke from the mates and boatswain, dropped from rail and ratline, where they had been standing staring at the pursuing craft, and in ghastly silence, without exhibition of concern or impatience, fell to hauling upon the clue garnets and backing the yards on the main. So weak was the ship's progress that the bringing of the canvas to the mast immediately stopped her way, and she lay as dead as a buoy upon the heave of the sea. This done, the crew went to the weather side, whence, as they rightly supposed, they would best view the approaching vessel. Jans held to the forecastle, Arents to the quarter-deck, and the mate hung sullen in the shadows cast by the mizzen-shrouds upon the planks. My heart beat as quickly as a baby's. I could not imagine what was to happen. Would yonder man-of-war, supposing her British, take possession of the brava? That is, could she? English powder, with earthquake power, has thrown up a mighty mountain of wonders. But could it? with its crimson glare, thunder down the curse by and in which this ship continue to sail and these miserable men continue to live? I shuddered at the impiety of the thought, yet what ending of this chase was to be conjectured if it were not capture? Vanderdecken, on the weather quarter, watched the ship in his trance-like fashion. How majestic, how unearthly, too, he looked against the blue beyond! his beard stirring and waving like smoke in a faintly moving atmosphere to the blowing of the wind. He wore the aspect of a fallen god, with the fires of hell glittering in his eyes and the passions of the damned surging dark from his soul to his face. Imogene and I had insensibly gained the lee quarter, and our whispers were driven seawards from him by the breeze. "'How will this end?' I asked my sweet companion. If there be potency in the curse, this ship cannot be captured. She answered, I cannot guess. I have not known such a thing as this to happen before. Suppose they send a prize crew on board. The sentence will not permit of her navigation beyond a gullis. There is not a hawser in all the world stout enough to tow this ship round the cape. As it is, is not yonder vessel doomed by her chasing us, by her resolution to speak us? There was a deep stillness fore and aft. No human voice broke the silence. You heard but the purring of the surges frothing against our sides, the flap of a sail to the regular roll of the fabric, a groan from the heart of her, the soft shock of the sudden hit of a billow. Nothing more. The silence of the measureless deep grew into a distinct sense, undisturbed by the gentle universal hissing that went up out of it. The sails of the oncoming ship shone to the gushing of the sunlight like radiant leaning columns of a porphyritic tincture breaking into moonlike alabaster, with the escape of the shadows to the sunward stare of the cloths. Bland as the fairy glory of the full moon floating in a sea of ethereal indigo was the shining of those lustrous bosoms, each coarse and topsail tremulous with the play of the golden fringe of reef points and delicate beyond language was the penciled shadowings at the foot of the rounded cloths. Like cloud upon cloud, those sails soared to the dainty little royals, above the foremost of which their blue Britannia's glorious flag, the blood-red cross of St. George, upon a field white as the foam that boiled to as high as the hawse-pipes with the churning of the shearing cutwater, storming like a meteor through the blue. Oh, she was English! You felt the blood of her country hot in her with the sight of her flag that was like a crown upon a hereditary brow, making her queen of the dominion of the sea roll where it would. She approached us like a roll of smoke, 
and the wash of the froth along her black and glossy bends threw out the mouths of her single tier of cannon. She was apparently a thirty-eight-gun ship, and as she drew up, with a luffing helm that brought the after-yard arm stealing out past the silky swells of the sails on the fore, you spied the glitter and flash of the gold-colored figurehead, a lion with its paw upon Britannia's shield. When she was within a mile of us, she hauled down her studding sails, clued up her royals and mizzen top gallant sail, and drove quietly along upon our weather quarter, still healing as though she would have us note how lustrous was the copper, whose brightness rose to the water line, and what finished that ruddy sheathing, coloring the snow of the blue water leaping along it with a streaking as of purple sunshine, gave to her charms. All this while the master, mates, and crew of the death ship were as mute as though they lay in their coffins. Vanderdecken leaned upon his hand on the rail above the quarter-gallery, and the motion which the heave of the ship gave to his giant form by the sweeping of it up and down the heavens at the horizon emphasized his own absolute motionlessness. Nevertheless, his gaze was rooted in the ship and the brightening of the angry sparkle in them to the nearing of the man-of-war was a never-to-be-forgotten sight. "'How is this going to end?' I whispered to still Imogene. "'Is it possible that they are unable to guess the character of our vessel?' The frigate had drawn close enough to enable us to make out the glint of buttons and epaulets on the quarter-deck, the uniform of marines on the forecastle and the heads of seamen standing by the braces or at the guns along the decks. She now hauled up her mainsail, but without backing her topsail, luffed so as to shake the way out of her, giving us, as she did so, an oblique view of her stern, very richly ornamented, the glass of the windows flashing, and the blue swell brimming to her name in large characters, Centaur. "'Ship ahoy!' came thundering down through the trumpet at the mouth of a tall, powerfully built man erect on the rail close against the mizzen-rigging. "'What ship is that?' Vanderdecken made no answer. The wind blew in a moaning gust over the bulwark, and there was the sound of a little jar and shock as the old fabric leaned wearily on the swell, but not a whisper fell from the men. Meanwhile it was grown evident to me that our ship was greatly puzzling the people of the frigate. It looked indeed as if the men had left their stations to crowd to the side, for the line of the bulwarks was blackened with heads. A group of officers stood on the quarter-deck, and I could see them pointing at our masts, as though calling one another's attention to the Brava's great barricadoed tops, to her sprit topmast, the cut and character of her rigging, and to the many signs that would convert her into a wonder if not a terror in the eyes of sailors. "'Ship ahoy!' now came down again, with an edge of anger in the hurricane note. "'What ship is that?' At this second cry Vanderdecken broke into life. He turned his face forward. "'Bring me my trumpet!' he exclaimed, in a voice whose rich, organ-like roll must have been plainly heard on board the frigate, whether his Dutch was understood or not. The ancient tube I had seen in his cabin was put to his hand. He stepped to the rail, and placing the trumpet to his mouth, cried, "'De Brava! Where are you from? Batavia! Where bound? Amsterdam!' There was another pause. The line of heads throbbed with visible agitation along the sides, and I saw one man of the group on the quarter-deck go up to the captain, who was speaking our ship, touch his cap and say something. But the other imperiously waved him off with a flourish of his trumpet, which he instantly after applied to his lips, and shouted out, "'Haul down your flag, and I will send a boat!' Vanderdecken looked towards me. "'What does he say?' he exclaimed. I told him. He called to Van Vogelaar, who promptly enough came to the halyards and lowered the flag to the deck. I watched the descent of that crazy, attenuated, ragged symbol. To my mind it was as affrighting in its suggestions of unholy survival as the whole appearance of the vessel, 
or the countenance and mechanic manners of the most corpse-like man of the crew of her. Scarce was the ensign hauled down when there came to our ears the silver, cheerful singing of a bosun's pipe. The main topsail was laid aback, and the frigate's length showed out as she fell slightly aft from the luff that held her canvas trembling in the wind. We were too far asunder for the nice discernment of faces with the naked eye, but, methought, since there seemed no lack of telescopes aboard the frigate, enough should have been made out of the line of deadly faces which looked over the bulwark rail to resolve us to the satisfaction of that British crew. Again was heard the silver chirping of the boatswain's whistle. A pinnace was lowered, into which tumbled a number of armed seamen, and the blades of eight oars flashed like gold as they rose feathering from the first spontaneous dip. "'They are coming!' cried Imogene in a faint voice. "'Let us keep where we are,' I exclaimed. "'Vanderdecken does not heed us. If we move, his thoughts will fly to you, and he may give me trouble. Dear girl, keep a stout heart. They will be sure to carry us to the ship, proud to rescue you, at least. Then what follows must come. You will be safe.' She put her hand under my arm. Tall as were the bulwarks of the Brava, there was swell enough so as to roll the ship as to enable me with every windward sway to see clear to the water where the boat was pulling. With beating hearts we watched. On a sudden the oars ceased to rise and fall. The seamen hung upon them, all to a man, staring at our ship with heads twisted as if they would wring their necks. Then, as if impelled by one mind, they let fall their oars to stop the boat's way, all of them gazing with straining eyeballs. The officer who steered stood erect, peering at us under his hand. The ship, God knows, was plain to their view now, the age and rottenness of her timbers, her patchwork sails, the sickliness of such ghastly and dismal hue as her sides discovered, the ancientness of her guns and swivels, above all the looks of the crew watching the boat's approach. An array of figures more shocking than they were truly dead newly unfrocked of their winding-sheets, and propped up against the rail to horribly counterfeit living seamen. "'Why have they ceased rowing?' cried Imogene, in a voice of bitter distress, and withdrawing her hand from my arm to press it upon her heart. As she spoke, a sudden commotion was perceptible among the men in the boat. The officer shrilly crying out some order, flung himself, as one in a frenzy, in the stern-sheets. The larboard oars sparkled, and the desperate strokes of the men made the foam fly in smoke, whilst the starboard hands furiously backed water to get the boat's head round swiftly, and before you could have counted ten she was being pulled in a smother of froth back to the frigate. I was about to leap to the side and shout to them, but at the instant Vanderdecken turned and looked at me. Then it flashed upon my mind. If I hail the boat— he and Van Vogelaar, all of them, may imagine I design to inform the frigate of the treasure. And the apprehension of what might follow such a suspicion held my feet glued to the deck. "'They have guessed what this ship is,' said Imogene, in a voice full of tears. I could not speak for the crushing disappointment that caused the heart in me to weigh down heavy as lead. I had made sure of the officer stepping on board and of his delivering the girl and me from this accursed ship on hearing my story, and acting as a British naval officer should when his duty as a sailor, or his chivalry as a man, is challenged, in conformity with that noble saying of one of our most valiant admirals, who, on being asked whither he intended to carry his ship, "'To hell!' he answered, "'if duty commands!' Yet one hope lingered, though faintly indeed. The captain of the frigate had imperiously commanded the boat to be manned, as I gathered by his manner of waving away the officer who had addressed him in a remonstrant manner. Would he suffer the return of the boat's crew until they had obeyed his orders? I watched. Headlong went the boat, smoking through the billows, which arched down upon her from the windward, and her oars sparkled like sheet lightning with the panic terror that plied them. 
the excitement in the ship was visible enough. Discipline had given way to superstitious fear. I could see the captain flourishing his arm with threatening gestures, lieutenants and midshipmen running here and there, but to no purpose. The whole ship's company, about three hundred sailors and marines as I supposed, knew what ship we were, and the very frigate herself, as she rolled without way, looked like some startled beast mad for flight, the foam draining from her bows to the slow pitching, as a terrified steed champs his bit into froth, and shudder after shudder going up out of her heart of oak into her sails, as you would have said, to watch the trembling and filling and backing of them to the wind. It was as I had feared, and had the captain of the man-of-war promised to blow his ship and men into a thousand atoms if the boat's crew refused to obey his orders to board us, they would have accepted that fate in preference to the hideous alternative adventure. In a trice the pinnace was alongside the frigate, the crew over the rail, and the boat hoisted. The yards on the main flew round, royals and topgallant sails were set, studding sails were run aloft, and before ten minutes had elapsed, since the boat had started to board us, the frigate, under a whole cloud of canvas, was heeling and gently rolling and pitching over the brilliant blue sea, with her head northeast, her stern dead at us, the gilt there and the windows converting her betwixt her quarters into the appearance of a huge sparkling square of crystal, the glory of which flung upon her wake under it a splendor so great that it was as though she had fouled a sunbeam and was dragging the dazzle after her. I looked at Imogene, her beautiful eyes had yearned after the ship into the dimness of tears. "'My dear, do not fret,' said I, again calling her my dear, for I still lacked the courage to call her my love. This experience makes me clear on one point. We shall escape, but not by a ship.' "'How, if not by a ship?' she cried tremulously. Before I could reply, Vanderdecken looked round upon us, and came our way, at the same time telling Van Vogelaar to swing the topsail-yard and board his main-tack. "'Tis in this fashion,' he exclaimed, "'that most of the ships I meet serve me. It would be enough to make me deem your countrymen a lily-livered lot if the people of other nations, my own included, did not sheer off before I could explain my needs or learn their motives in desiring to board us. What alarmed the people of that ship, think you, mynheer? Who can tell, sir? I responded, in as collected a manner as I could contrive. They might suspect us hardly worth the trouble of capturing. He motioned an angry dissent. Or, I continued, abashed and speaking hurriedly, they might have seen something in the appearance of your crew to promise a bloody resistance. "'By the Holy Trinity!' he cried, with the most vehement scorn. "'If such a thing were conceivable, I should have been glad to confirm it with a broadside!' And his eye came from the frigate that was fast lessening in the distance, to his poor show of rust-eaten sakers and green-coated swivels. It was an hour after our usual dinner-time and Prinz arrived to tell the captain the meal was on the table. He put Imogene's hand under his arm caressingly, and I followed them with one wistful look at the frigate that was already a toy and far off, melting like a cloud into the junction of sapphire ether and violet ocean. I saw Vanderdecken level a glance at her too, and as we entered the cabin he said, addressing me but without turning his head and leading Imogene to the table, it will be a disappointment to you, mynheer, that your countrymen would not stay to receive you. It was your intention, said I, that I should go with them? Certainly, he answered, confronting me slowly and eyeing me haughtily. You are an Englishman, but you are not my prisoner. We may be more fortunate next time, I said coldly. Tis to be hoped, said Van Vogelaar who had followed last, speaking in his harshest and sourest tone. I turned to eye him, but at the moment the parrot, probably animated by our voices, croaked out hoarsely, "'We sind all verdommed!' on which the fellow broke into a hoarse, raw, "'Ha, ha!' 
yet never stirring a muscle of his storm-hammered face. "'Twould have been like fighting with phantoms and fiends to war in words with these men. "'I am here,' thought I, "'and there is yonder sweetheart to rescue before I am done with this—' Chapter Twenty Eight of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty Eight Captain Vanderdecken Walks in His Sleep. I remember when the evening came, that same day on which we had been chased and abandoned by the centaur, walking up and down the lee side of the short poop alone, Arents, who had charge, standing silent near the helmsman. I had worked myself up into great confusion and distress of mind. Dejection had been followed by a fit of nervousness, and when I looked around me at the unmeasurable waste of ocean darkling in the east, to the growing shadows there at the ancient heights of canvas above me, with the dingy rusty red of the western light slipping from the hollow breasts and off the sallow spars, till the edges of the sails melted into a spectral faintness upon the gradual gloom, at the desolate, grassy appearance of the decks, the dull motions, the death-like posture of the three or four men standing here and there forward. I felt as if the curse of the ship had fallen upon my heart and life too, that it was my doom to languish in her till my death, to love and yet be denied fruition, to yearn for our release with the same impotency of desire that governed the navigation of this death-ship towards the home it was the will of God she was never to approach. On turning from a short contemplation of the sea over the stern, I observed Imogene at the head of the ladder conducting from the poop to the quarter-deck watching me. It was the first opportunity which had offered for speaking with her alone since dinner-time. "'Captain Vanderdecken has gone to his cabin to take some rest,' said she. "'I knew you were above by your tread.' "'Ah, you can recognize me by that?' "'Yes, and by the dejection in it, too,' she answered, smiling. There is human feeling in the echo. The footfalls of the others are as meaningless as the sound of wood smitten by wood. "'I am very dull and weary-hearted,' said I. "'Thanks be to God that you are in this ship to give me hope and warmth.' "'And I thank him, too, for sending you to me,' said she. I took her hand and kissed it. Indeed, but for Arents and the helmsman, I should have taken her to my heart with my lips upon hers. "'Let us walk a little,' said I. "'We will step softly. We do not want the captain to surprise us.' I took her hand, and we slowly paced the deck. "'All the afternoon,' said I, "'I have been considering how we are to escape. There is no man among this ghostly crew who has a friendly eye for me, and so whatever is done must be done by me alone.' "'You must trust no one,' she cried quickly. "'The plan you light upon must be our secret. "'There is a demon imprisoned in Vanderdecken. "'If it should be loosed, he might take your life. "'I don't doubt it. "'And suppose I went armed. "'My conflict would be with deathless men. "'No, no, my plan must be our secret, as you say. "'But what is it?' If but a gleam of light sank its ray into this darkness, I should take heart. She pressed my hand, saying, The frigate's abandoning of us has depressed you, but an opportunity will surely come. Yes, the behavior of the frigate has depressed me. But why? Because she has made me see the greatest calamity which could befall us would be our encountering a ship willing to parley with us. Is it so? I fear, because Vanderdecken would send me to her and separate us. Then, bethinking me, by observing her head sink, how doleful and unmanly was such reasoning as this, such apprehension of what might be, without regard to the possibility of our salvation, 
lying in the very circumstance or situation I dreaded. I said, heartening my voice, Imogene, though I have no plan, yet my instincts tell me that our best, perhaps our sole chance of escaping from the ship, will be in some necessity arising for her to drop anchor off the coast, for careening, or for procuring provision and water. Think, my dear, closely of it. We dare not count upon any ship we meet taking such action as will ensure our joint deliverance. No body of seamen, learning what vessel this is, would have anything to do with her. Then, as to escaping from her at sea, even if it were in the power of these weak, unaided arms to hoist one of those boats there over the side unperceived, I know not whether my love for thee, Imogene, whether— Oh, forgive me if I grieve you. She stirred her hand as if to remove it, but I held it the tighter, feeling in the warm and delicate palm the dew that emotion was distilling there. She was silent, and we came to a stand. She said in a weak and trembling voice, "'You do not grieve me. Why should I grieve to be loved?' "'You are beautiful and good and a sailor's child, my dearest,' said I. "'And friendless. No! Bid me say I love thee!' She bade me whisper, drawing closer to me. I swiftly kissed her cheek that was cold with the evening wind. Great heaven, what a theatre was this for love-making! To think of the sweetest, in our case the purest, of emotions, having its birth in, owing its growth to, the dreaded fabric of the death-ship. Yet I, that a short while ago was viewing the vessel with a despondency and fear and loathing, now for a space found her transfigured. The kiss my darling had permitted, her gentle speech, the caress that lay in her drawing close to me, had kindled a light in my heart, and the luster was upon the ship. A faint radiance viewless to the sight, but of a power to work such transformation that instead of a gaunt phosphoric structure sailing through the dusk, there floated under the stars a fabric whose sails might have been of satin, whose cordage might have been formed of golden threads, whose decks might have been fashioned out of pearl. We were silent for a while, and then she said in a coyly coquettish voice, with a happy note of music in it, "'What were you saying, Mr. Fenton, when you interrupted yourself?' "'Dear heart,' cried I, "'you must call me Geoffrey now.' "'What were you saying, Geoffrey?" said she. "'Why,' I replied, "'that even were it possible for me to secure one of those boats and launch it unperceived, my love would not suffer me to expose you to the perils of such an adventure. "'My life is in your keeping, Geoffrey,' said she. "'You need but lead. I will follow. There is one thing you must consider if we escape to the land, which seems to me the plan that is growing in you.' I said, "'Yes,' watching the sparkling of the stars in her eyes, which she had fixed on mine. Are not the perils which await us there greater than any the sea can threaten, supposing we abandoned ourselves to its mercy in that little boat yonder? There are many wild beasts on the coast. Often in the stillness of the night, when we have been lying at anchor, have I heard the roaring and trumpeting of them. And more dreadful and fearful than leopards, wild elephants, and terrible serpents, all of which abound, dear, crocodiles in the rivers, and poisonous, tempting fruit and herbs, are the savages, the hideous, unclothed Caffreys, and the barbarous tribes, which I have heard my father tell of as occupying the land for leagues and leagues, from the Cape to the coast opposite the island of Madagascar. A strange shudder ran through her, and letting slip my hand to take my arm, for now that she knew I loved her she passed from her girlish coyness into a bride-like tenderness and freedom, and put a caressing manner into her very walk as she paced at my side. She cried, "'Oh, do you know, Geoffrey, if ever a nightmare freezes my heart, it is when I dream I am taken captive by one of those black tribes, and carried beyond the mountains to serve as a slave.' The dusk had thickened into night. The stars swung in glory to the majestical motion of the mastheads. 
there was a curl of moon in the west like a pairing of pearl designed for a further enrichment of the jeweled skies. The phosphor trembled along the decks, and all substantial outlines swam into indistinctness in an atmosphere that seemed formed of fluid indigo. Visible against the luminaries past the quarter-gallery was the figure of the mate, but the helmsman near him was shrouded by the pale haze that floated smoke-like about the pinnacle. Flakes of the sea-glow slipped slowly past upon the black welter, as though the patches of stardust on high mirrored themselves in this silent ebony water. From time to time a brilliant meteor flashed out upon the night and sailed into a ball of fire that far outshone the glory of the greatest stars. The dew fell lightly. The crystals trembled along the rail and winked to the stirring of the wind with the sharp sparkle of diamonds and though we were in the cold season, yet the light breeze, having a flush of northing in it, was pure refreshment without touch of cold, so that a calmer, fairer night than this I do not conceive ever descended upon a ship at sea. Thrice the clock struck in the cabin, and whenever the first chime sounded I would start as if we were near land and the sound was the note of a distant cathedral bell. And punctually, with the last stroke, would come the rasping voice of the parrot, reminding all who heard it of their condition. Occasionally Aaron's moved, but never by more than a stride or two. Forward all was dead blackness and stillness, the blacker for the unholy, elusive shinings, the stiller for the occasional sighing of the wind, for the thin, shaling sound of waters, gently stemmed, for the moan now and again that floated muffled out of the hold of the ship. Twice Imogene said she must leave me, but I could not bear to part with her. The night was our own, yea, even the ship, in her solitude wrought by the silent figures aft and the tomb-like repose forward, seemed our own. And my darling, being in her heart as loath as I to separate, lingered yet and yet till the silver sickle of the moon had gone down red into the western ocean and the clock below had struck half-past eleven. Then she declared it was time indeed for her to be gone. Should Vanderdecken come on deck and find her with me, he might decide to part us effectually by sending me forward and forbidding me to approach the cabin end. So, finding her growing alarmed, and hearing the quick beating of her heart in her speech, I said, "'Good night,' kissing her hand and then releasing her. She seemed to hurry, stopped and looked behind. I stood watching her. Seeing her stop, I held out my arms and went to her, and she returned to me. With what love did I kiss her upturned brow and hold her to my heart? She was yet in my arms when the great figure of Vanderdecken rose above the ladder, and ere I could release her he was close to us, towering in shadow like some giant spirit. The start I gave caused her to turn. She saw him, and instantly grasping my hand drew me against the bulwark, where we stood waiting for him to speak. Love will give spirit to the pitifulest recreant, and had I been the most craven-hearted of men, the obligation to stand between such a sweet heart as Imogene and one whom she feared, though he stood as high as Goliath, would have converted me into a hero. But I was no coward. I could look back to my earliest experiences and feel that with strictest confidence. Yet, spite of the animating presence of Imogene, the great figure standing in front of us chilled, subdued, terrified me. Had he been mortal, I could not have felt so. Nay, had his demeanour, his posture, but that which intercourse with him had made familiar, I should not have suffered from the superstitious fears which held me motionless, and made my breathing laboured but there was something new and frightful in the pause he made abreast of us, in the strange and menacing swing of his arms, in the pose of his head defiantly held back, and in his eyes, which shone with a light that owed nothing to the stars, in the pallid gloom of his face. His gaze seemed to be riveted on the ocean line a little abaft of where we stood, and therefore did he appear to confront us. The expression in his face I could not distinguish. 
but I feebly discerned an aspect of distortion about the brow, and clearly made out that his underjaw was fallen so as to let his mouth lie open, causing him to resemble one whose soul was convulsed by some hideous vision. Imogene pressed my hand. I looked at her, and she put her white forefinger to her mouth, saying in accents so faint that they were more like the whispers one hears in memory than the utterance of human lips. He is walking in his sleep. In a moment he will act a part. I have seen this thing once before. And so, fairly speaking, she drew me lightly towards the deeper gloom near the bulwarks, where the mizzen-rigging was. For some moments he continued standing and gazing seawards, slowly swinging his arms in a way that suggested fierce yet almost controlled distress of mind. He then started to walk, savagely patrolling the deck, sweeping past us so close as to brush us with his coat. Then crossing athwart ships, and madly passing the other side of the deck, sometimes stopping with a passionate, violent suddenness at the binnacle, at the card of which he seemed to stare, then with denunciatory gesture resuming his stormy striding, now lengthwise, now crosswise, now swinging his great figure into an abrupt stand to view the sea, first to starboard, then to larboard, now staring aloft and all with airs and gestures as though he shouted orders to the crew and cried aloud to himself, though saving his swift, deep breathing that, when he passed us close, sounded like the panting of bellows in angry or impatient hands, no syllable broke from him. "'Some spell is upon him!' I exclaimed. "'I see how it is. He is acting over again the behavior that renders this ship accursed.' I saw him like this two years ago. Twas earlier in the night, whispered Imogene. He so scared me that I fainted. That Arents and the helmsman took notice of this strange, somnambulistic behavior in their captain, I could not tell. He approached them as often as he approached us, and much of the dumb show of his rage was enacted close to them. But so far as I could judge from the distance at which we stood, their postures were as quiet as though they were lay figures, or passionless and insensible creatures, without understandings to be touched. It was a heart-subduing spectacle beyond words to tell of. Bit by bit his temper grew, till his emotions, his frenzied racings about the deck, his savage glarings aloft, his fury when, in this distemper of sleep, his perusal of the compass disappointed him— were those of a maniac. I saw the white froth on his lips as he approached us close to level a flaming glance seawards, and had he been Satan himself I could not have shrunk from him with deeper loathing and colder terror. The insanity of his wrath as expressed by his gestures, for he was as mute as one bereft of his voice by agony, was rendered the wilder, the more striking and terrible, by the contrast of the night the peace of it, the splendor of the stars, the silence upon the deep rising up to those luminaries like a benedictory hush. For such an infuriated figure as this you needed the theater of a storm-tossed ship, with the billows boiling all about and over her, and the scenery of a pitchy sky torn by violet lightning and piercing the roaring ebony of the seas with zigzag fire, and the trumpetings of the tempest deepened by a ceaseless crashing of thunder. He continued to lash himself into such a fury that, for very pity, misery, and horror, you longed to hear him cry out, for the relief the expression would give to his soul, strangling and in awful throes. Suddenly he fell upon his knees. His hands were clenched, and he lifted them on high. His face was upturned. And as I watched him menacing the stars with infuriate gestures, I knew that, even as he now showed, so did he appear when he blasphemously dared his Maker. A soft gust of the midnight air blew with a small moan through the rigging. Vanderdecken let drop his arms, swayed a while as if he would fall, staggered to his feet, and with his hands pressed to his eyes, as though indeed some sudden stroke of lightning had smitten him blind, came with wavering gait, 
in which was still visible a sullen and disordered majesty, to the poop-ladder down which he sightlessly went, steered by the wondrous, unintelligible faculty that governs the sleepwalker. I pulled off my hat and wiped my forehead, that was damp with sweat. "'Great God!' I cried. "'What a sight to behold! What anguish is he made to suffer! How is it that his human form does not scatter, like one broken on a wheel to the rending of such infernal passions as possess him?' Imogene was about to answer, when, on a sudden, the first stroke of midnight came floating up in the cathedral note of the clock. "'Hark!' she exclaimed. "'It is twelve. Errants will now be relieved by von Vogelar. If that malignant creature spies me here at this hour with you, oh, t'would be worse through the report he would give than if Vanderdecken himself had surprised us. Good night, Mr. Fenton.' She quickly slipped from my grasp and faded down the ladder. As she vanished, I put my hand to my heart to subdue its beating, and whilst I thus stood a moment the last note of the clock vibrated into the stillness on deck, and scarcely less clear than had the accursed croak sounded close beside me, rose the Chapter Twenty Nine of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Twenty Nine. We Sight a Dismasted Wreck. Terrible as must have been the sufferings of Vanderdecken in the tragic passage through which his spirit had driven in a silent madness of sleep. Yet next morning I could perceive no trace of his frenzy in the cold and ghastly hue of his face. I found him on deck when I quitted my melancholy cabin, and he responded to the good morning I gave him with a touch of civility in his haughty, brooding manner that was not a little comforting to me who had been kept awake till t'was hard upon daylight by remembrance of the spectacle I had witnessed, and by apprehensions of how a person of his demoniacal passions might serve me, if I should give him, or if he should imagine, offence. "'There should be a promise of a breeze, mynheer,' said I, in the shape and lay of those high clouds, and the little dimness you notice to windward. "'Yes.' he answered, darting a level glance under his bushy, corrugated brows, into the north quarter. "'Were it not for what hath been sighted from aloft, I should be steering with my starboard tacks aboard.' "'What may be in sight, sir?' I asked, dreading to hear that it was a ship. He answered, "'The sparkle of a wet, black object was visible from the cross-trees at sunrise. Arents finds it already in the perspective-glass from the foretop. He reports at the hull of an abandoned ship. He may be mistaken. Your sight is keen, sir. We greatly need tobacco, but I would not willingly lose time in running down to a vessel that may be waterlogged, and therefore utterly unprofitable. You wish me to go aloft and see what I can make of the object, sir? If you will be so good, he answered, with a grave inclination of the head. Captain Vanderdecken, said I, I should be glad to serve you in any direction. I only regret your courtesy will not put me to the proof." He bowed again and pointed to the telescope to which Aarons had fastened a lanyard that he might carry it aloft on his back. I threw the bite over my head and walked forward, guessing now that Vanderdecken's civility was owing to his intending to make me oblige him in this way. Coming abreast of the weather foreshrouds, I jumped on to an old gun thence leapt to the rail and swung myself into the rigging, up which, however, I stepped with the utmost caution, the seizings of the ratlines looking very rotten, and the shrouds themselves so grey and worn that they seemed as old as the ship herself, and as if generations of seamen had been employed to do nothing else but squeeze the tar out of them. There was a good-sized lubber's hole through which I easily passed, the barricados prohibiting any other entrance into the top and when I was arrived, 
I found myself on a great circular platform, green as a field with moss and grass, surrounded by a breastwork of wood to the height of my armpits, the scantling extraordinarily thick, but answering in age and appearance to the rest of the timber in the ship, with loopholes for muskets and small cannon. The foot of the foresail having a very large curve, I had a clear view of the sea on both bows under it, and the moment I ran my naked eye from the windward to the leeward side, then I saw, fair betwixt the cathead and the nighthead, the flashing of what was unquestionably the wet side of a dismasted ship rolling to the sun. The regular coming and going of the sparkling was like the discharge of a piece fired and quickly loaded and fired again. I pointed the telescope, and the small magnification aiding my fairly keen sight, I distinctly made out the hull of a vessel of between three hundred and four hundred tons, rolling with a very sluggish regularity and shooting out a strong blaze of light whenever the swell gave her streaming sides to the glory. I was pretty sure, by the power and broadness of this darting radiance, that her decks were not submerged, that indeed she would still show an indifferently good height of side above the water, and thereupon threw the glass over my back for the descent, pausing, however, to take a view of the brava from the height I occupied, and wondering, not a little, with something of amusement, too, at the extraordinary figure her body offered thus surveyed. In fact, she was not three times as long as she was broad, and she had the sawn-off look of a wagon down there. After every swimming lift of her head by the swell, the droop of her bows hove a smearing of froth into the large blue folds, that might have passed for an overflow of soap suds from a wash-tub. And upon that whiteness all the forward part of her stood out in a sort of jumble of ponderous catheads, curved headboards sinking into a well out of which forked the massive bolt-sprit, as the people who fashioned it would have spelt it, with its heavy confusion of gear, yards, stays for the sprit topmast and the like. I had a good sight of the sails up here, and perceived they were like the famous stocking of which Dr. Arbuthnot or Pope or one of the wits of Queen Anne's reign wrote. That is, that though they might have been the same claws which the Brava sheeted home when she set sail from Batavia, Yet they had been so patched, so darned, and over and over again so repaired, that to prove they were the same sails would be as nice a piece of metaphysical puzzling as to show that they were not. Yet the sun flung his light upon their many-hued dinginess, and as I looked up they swung to the heave of the ship with a hard blank staring of their breasts that seemed like the heading of an idiot's gaze at the clusters and wreaths and curls of pearly vapour over the lee horizon. And, though my glance was swift, yet even in a breathless moment a confusion was wrought, as though the shining prismatic clouds were starting to sweep like some maelstromic brimming of feathery foam around the ship, and founder her in gradual gyrations of blue ether and snow-like mist. Great God, thought I, here, to be sure, is a place to go mad in, to lie upon this dark green platform, to hearken to the spirit whisperings amid this ancient cordage, to behold these darkened sails sallowly swelling toward some bloody disk of a moon soaring out of a belt of sooty vapor, to listen to the voices of the fabric beneath, and to the groans of her old age dying in echoes in the caverns of her stretched canvas. By my father's hand, thought I, if I am to save my brain, I must put myself nearer to Imogene than this. So I dropped with a loud heart through the lubber's hole, and stepped down the ratlines as fast as my fears of the soundness of the seasons would suffer me to descend. "'What do you see, mynheer?' asked Vanderdecken. "'The hull of a ship, sir,' I replied. "'She is deep in the water, but not too deep for boarding.' I believe, for the sunshine finds a wide expanse to blaze out upon when she rolls. Well, he exclaimed, an hour or two can make but very little difference, and he sent his impatient, imperious gaze into the blue to windward, and fell to marching the deck athwartships opposite the tiller head, becoming suddenly as heedless of my presence as if I had been a brass swivel on his bulwarks. 
but I was less likely to be chagrined by his discourtesy than by his attention. It had, indeed, come to my never feeling so easy in my mind as when he perfectly neglected me. It was two hours and a half after sighting the hull from the masthead when it lay visible upon the sea from the deck. Luckily the breeze had stolen a point or two westerly, which enabled our ship to keep the wreck to leeward of our bowsprit. Otherwise we should never have fetched it by two miles without a board, and that might have ended in a week's plying to windward. The crew had long got scent of this object ahead, and being as keen for tobacco as was ever a sharp-set stomach for victuals, they were collected in a body on the forecastle, where, in their dull, lifeless, mechanic way, they stood staring and waiting. Although those who had the watch on deck had been at various sorts of work when the wreck hove into view over the forecastle rail, such as making spun-yarn, sawing wood, as I supposed for the cook-room, sail-mending, splicing old running gear and the like, yet I remarked they dropped their several jobs just as it suited them, and I never observed that either of the mates reproved them, or that the captain noticed their behavior. Whence I concluded that the curse had stricken the ship into a kind of little republic, wherein such discipline as was found was owing to a sort of general agreement among the men that such work as had to be done must be done. I found myself watching the wreck with a keener interest than could ever possess the breast of the wretched master, mates, or crew. Was any stratagem conceivable to enable me to use that half-sunk vessel as an instrument for escaping with Imogene from this death-ship? My dearest girl came to my side whilst my brain was thus busy, and in a soft undertone I told her of what I was thinking. She listened with eager eyes. Geoffrey, said she, you are my captain. Command me, and I will do your bidding. My darling, I replied, if you knew what a miserable, nervous creature this death-ship has made of me, you would guess I was the one to be led, you to direct. But yonder craft will not serve us. No. Better that little boat that Chapter 30 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 30 The Dead Helmsman. I proved right in the estimate I had formed from the foretop of the size of the wreck. Her burden was within four hundred tons. We gradually drove down to her, and when we were within musket-shot, Vanderdecken ordered the topsail to be laid aback. The breeze had freshened, the little surges ran in a pouring of silver gushing heads, the broad-backed swell rose in brimming violet to our channels, and our ship rolled upon it helpless as an eggshell. The wallowing of the wreck, too, was like the plashing and struggling of some sentient thing heavily laboring with such fins or limbs as God had given it, to keep itself afloat. That there was no lack of water in her was certain, yet having the appearance of a ship that had been for some days abandoned, at which time it might be supposed that her people would imagine her to be in a sinking condition, it was clear that in a strange accidental way the leak had been healed, possibly by some substance entering and choking it. All three masts were gone within a foot or two of the deck. Her hull was a dark brown, that looked black in the distance against the blue, with the mirror-like flashing from the wet upon it. She had a handsome stern, with quarter-galleries supported by gilt figures, wherefrom ran a broad band of gilt along her sides to the bows. Under her counter there stole out in large white characters, with every heave of her stern, the words, Prince of Wales and was startling to see the glare of the letters coming out in a ghastly, staring sort of way from the bald brow of the swell, as it sloped from the gilded stern. Her name proved her English. You could see the mass had been cut away, 
by the hacked ends of the shrouds snaking out into the hollows and swellings over the side. Her decks were heavily encumbered with what sailors call raffle, that is, the muddle of ropes, torn canvas, staves of boats and casks, fragments of deck fittings and so forth, with which the ocean illustrates her violence, and which will sometimes for weeks, ay, and for months continue to rock and nurse, and hold intact for very affection of the picture as a symbol of her wrath when vexed by the gale, and of her triumphs over those who daringly penetrate her fortresses to fight her. The confusion to the eye was so great, and rendered so lively and bewildering by the hulk's rolling, that scan her as you would, it was impossible to master details with any sort of rapidity. Suddenly Imogene, grasping my wrist in her excitement, exclaimed, "'See, there is a man there. He seems to steady himself by holding the wheel. Look now, Geoffrey, as she rolls her decks at us.' I instantly saw him. The wheel was in front of the break of the poop, where the cuddy or roundhouse windows were. And erect at it stood a man on the starboard side, one hand down clutching a spoke at his waist, and his left arm straight out to a spoke to larboard, which he gripped. Methought he wrestled with the helm, for he swerved as a steersman will who struggles to keep a ship's head steady in a seaway. "'Is he mad?' cried I. Ay, it must be so. Famine, thirst, mental anguish, may have driven him distracted. Yet, even then, why does he not look towards us? Why, were he actually raving, surely his sight would be courted by our presence. Pray God he may not be mad, whispered Imogene. He is certain to be a sailor and an Englishman, and if he be mad and brought here, how would these men deal with him? "'Yes, and I say, too, pray God he be not mad,' I cried. "'For back me with a hearty English sailor, and I believe, yes, I believe, I could so match these fellows as to carry the ship, without their having the power to resist me, to any port I chose to steer for to the eastward. For with her cry of, he is sure to be a sailor and an Englishman, there swept into my brain the fancy of securing the crew under hatches, and imprisoning Vanderdecken and his mates in their cabins, the least idle, in sober truth, of all the schemes that had presented themselves to me. "'Hush!' she exclaimed breathlessly, and as she closed her lips to the whisper, Vanderdecken came to us. But not to speak. He stood for some minutes looking at the wreck, with the posture and air of one deeply considering. The seaman forward gazed with a heavy steadfastness, too, some under the sharp of their hands, some with folded arms. I heard no speech among them. Yet, though their stillness was that of a swoon, their eyes shone with an eager light, and expectation shaped their pallid, death-like faces into a high and straining look. There were no signs of life aboard the wreck, saving for the figure of the man that swayed at the wheel. I was amazed that he should never glance towards us. Indeed, I am not sure that the whole embodied ghastliness of our death-ship matched in terror what you found in the sight of that lone creature grasping the wheel, first bringing it a little to right, then heaving it over a little to left, fixedly staring ahead, as though such another curse as had fallen upon this Dutch-ship had come like a blast of lightning upon him compelling him to go on standing at yonder helm, and vainly striving to steer the wreck, as terribly corpse-like as any man among us, and as shockingly vital, too. It struck my English love of briskness as strange that Vanderdecken should not promptly order the boat over, or give orders that should have reference to the abandoned hull. Yet I could not help thinking that his Holland blood spoke in this pause, and that there, intermingled with the trance-like condition that was habitual in him, the phlegmatic instincts of his nation, that gradual walking to a decision, which in Scotland is termed, taken a thought. After a while he said to me, Mine here, the wreck hath an English name. She will be of your country, therefore. May I beg of you to take my trumpet and hail that person standing at the wheel? 
"'I shall not need your trumpet, sir,' said I, at once climbing upon the rail and thinking to myself that twas odd if there was not wanted a trumpet with a voice as thunderous as the crack of doom to bring that silent, forward-staring man's face round to his shoulder. "'Wreck ahoy!' I bawled with my hand to my cheek, and the wind took the echo of my voice clear as a bell to the hulk. I shouted again and yet again, then dismounted. "'He is deaf,' said Vanderdecken. "'He is dead,' said I, for this was forced upon me, spite of the erect and Chapter Thirty One of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Thirty One The Dutch Sailors Board the Wreck. Get the boat over, cried Vanderdecken, turning to Van Vogelaar, and go and inspect the wreck. Look to the man first. Here Fenton declares him dead, and particularly observe if there be aught that hath life in it aboard. On this, Van Vogelaar went forward, calling about him. In a few minutes, a white-faced seaman, with yellow beard trembling to the wind, and his eyes looking like a rat's with the white lashes and pink retinas, leisurely climbed aloft, with a line in his hand, and, swinging himself on to the mainyard, slided out upon the horses to the extremity, or yard-arm, as it is termed, which he bestrode as a jockey a steed, and then hauled up the line, to the end of which was hitched a tackle. This tackle he made fast to the yard-arm, and by it, with the help of steadying ropes or guys, some of the crew on deck hoisted the little boat out of the bigger one and lowered it away into the water alongside i watched this business with a sailor's interest wondering that so great a ship as this great that is for the age to which she belonged should carry no more than two boats stowed one in the other after the fashion of the north country coastmen nor was i less impressed by the aged appearance of the boat when she was afloat she had the look of a slug with her horns, only that those continuations of her gunwale rail projected abaft as well as from the bows. And when Van Vogelaar and three of the crew entered her, then, what with the faded red of her inner skin, the wide red blades of the short oars, the soulless movements of the seamen, the hue of their faces, the feverish, unnatural shining of their eyes like sunlight showing through a cairngorm stone, their dried and corded hands which wrapped the handles of their oars like rugged parchment, the little but marvellous picture acted as by the waving of a magic wand, forcing time back by a century and a half, and driving shudders through the frame of a beholder, with a sight whose actuality made it a hundredfold more startling and fearful than had it been a vision as unsubstantial as the death-ship herself is mistakenly supposed to be. The wreck being within hailing distance, the boat was soon alongside her. The heavy rolling of the hull, and the sharp rise and fall of the boat, would have made any human sailor mightily wary in his boarding of the vessel, but if ever there was an endeviled wretch among the phantom's horrible crew, Van Vogelaar was he. The fiend in him stayed at nothing. The instant the boat had closed the wreck, the fellow leaped, and he was on deck and walking towards the figure at the wheel, whilst the others, that is to say two of them, were waiting for the hull to swing down for them to follow. The mate went up to the figure, and seemed to address him. Then, receiving no reply, he felt his face, touched his hands, and pulled to get that amazing grip relaxed, but to no purpose. The others now joining him, they all stared into the figure's face, one lifting an eyelid and peering into the eye, 
another putting his ear to the figure's mouth van vogelaar then came to the side and shouted in his harsh and rusty voice that it was a dead man vanderdecken imperiously waved his hand and cried fall to exploring her and motioned significantly to the sky as if he would have the mate misgive the weather though there was no change in the aspect of the pearly wreaths and glistening beds of vapour and the draught was still a gentle breeze dead i whispered to imogene yet i feared it i noticed vanderdecken looking at the body there was deep thought in his imperious menacing expression with a shadow of misery that his fierce and glittering eyes did but appear to coarsen and harshen the gloom of and i wondered to myself if ever moments came when perception of his condition was permitted to him for it truly appeared as though there were a hint of some such thing in him now whilst he gazed at the convulsive figure at the wheel as if jesus have mercy upon him the sight of the dead filled his own deadly flesh with poignant and enraged yearnings the meanings of which his unholy vitality was unable to interpret when van vogelaar had spent about half an hour on the wreck he and the others dropped over the side into the boat and made for us we had scarce shifted our position for the courses being hauled up and the top-gallant sails lowered there was too little sail abroad for the weak wind then blowing to give us drift and the swell that drove us towards the wreck would also drive the wreck from us the mate came over the side and stepping up to the captain said she is an english ship freighted with english manufacture i make out bales of blanket clothing and stores which i imagine to have been designed for troops what water is in her seven and a quarter feet by her own rod her pump she hath two both shattered and useless does she continue to fill i believe not sir i would not swear to it she rolls briskly but said he sending his evil glance at the wreck it does not appear that she has sunk deeper since we first made her out yonder figure at the wheel is dead you say as truly dead a briton as ever fell to a dutchman's broadside i exchanged a swift look with imogene his eyes are glassy his fingers clasp the spokes like hooks of steel he must have died on a sudden perhaps from lightning from disease of some inward organ or from fear and there was the malice of the devil in the sneer that curled his ugly mouth as he spoke taking me in with a roll of his sinister eyes i watched him coldly remonstrance or temper would have been as idle with this man and his mates as pity to that unrecking heart of oak out there what is to be come at demanded vanderdecken with passionate abruptness the other answered quickly holding up one forefinger after another in a computative tallying way whilst he spoke the half-deck is free of water and there i find flour vinegar treacle tierces of beef some barrels of pork and five cases of this which hath the smell of tobacco and is no doubt that plant and he pulled out of his pocket a stick of tobacco such as is taken in cases to sea to be sold to the crews vanderdecken smelt it tis undeniably tobacco said he but how used his eye met mine i took the hint and said to be chewed it is bitten to be smoked it has to be flaked with a knife thus mine here and i imitated the action of cutting it some of the crew had collected on the quarter-deck to hear the mate's report and seeing the tobacco in the captain's hand and observing my gestures one of them cried out that if it was like the tobacco the englishman had shown them how to use twas rare smoking whether vanderdecken had heard of my visit to the forecastle i do not know he seemed not to hear the sailor's exclamation saying to me yes mynheer i see the convenience of such tablets they hold much and are easily flaked and then 
sweeping the sea and skies with his eyes he cried get the other boat over take a working party in her and leave them aboard to break out the cargo the smaller boat will tow her to and fro arents you will have charge of the working party you van vogelaar will bring off the goods and superintend the transshipments away now there is stuff enough there to fill the hollowest cheek with fat and to sweeten the howl of a gale into melody away then there was excitement in his words but none in his rich and thunderous voice nor in his manner and though there seemed a sort of bustle in the way the men went to work to hoist out the large boat it was the very ghost of hurry as unlike the hearty leaping of sailors fired with expectation as are the twitchings of electrified muscles to the motions of hale limbs controlled by healthy intellect yet to a mariner what could surpass the interest of such a scene as i leaned against the bulwark with imogene watching the little boat towing the big one over the swell with now a lifting that put the leaning toiling figures of the rowers clear against the delicate vaporous film over the sky at the horizon the red blades of the oars glistening like rubies as they flashed out of the water and the white heads of the little surges which wrinkled the liquid folds melting all about the boats into creaming silver radiant with salt rainbows and prismatic glories and now a sinking that plunged them out of sight in a hollow i said to my dear one here is a sight i would not have missed for a quintal of the silver below i am actually witnessing the manner in which this doomed vessel feeds and clothes herself and how her crew replenish their stores and provide against decay and diminution what man would credit this thing who would believe that the curse which pronounced this ship imperishable should also hold her upon the verge of what is natural sentencing her to a hideous immortality and at the same time compelling the crew to labor as if her and their life was the same as that of other crews in other ships if they knew their doom they would not toil she answered they would seek death by famine or thirst or end their horrible lot by sinking the ship and drowning with her how far away from the dread reality is the world's imagination of this ship and the situation of her people cried i she has been pictured as rising out of the waves as sailing among the clouds as being perpetually attended by heavy black storms and thunderclaps and blasts of lightning here is the reality as sheer a piece of prose at first sight as any salvage job but holding in the very heart of its simplicity so mighty so complicate so unparalleled a wonder that even when i speak to you about it imogene and suffer my mind to dwell upon it my mind grows numb with a dread that reason has quitted her throne and left me fit only for a madhouse you tremble she whispered softly nay you think too closely of what you are passing through let your knowledge that this experience is real rob it of its terror are we not surrounded with wonders which too much thought will make affrighting that glorious sun what feeds his flaming disk why should the moon shine like crystal when her soil perchance is like that of our own world which also gleams as silver does though it is mere dust and mould and unreflecting ashes think of the miracles we are to ourselves and to one another she pressed my hand and pleaded reproved and smiled upon me with her eyes was she some angelic spirit that had lighted by chance on this death ship and held it company for very pity of the misery and hopelessness of the sailor's doom but there was a human passion and tenderness in her face that would have been weakness in a glorified spirit oh indeed she was flesh and blood as i was with warm lips for kissing and breasts of cream as a pillow for love
Chapter thirty two of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter thirty two The Dutchmen Obtain Refreshments. Above an hour passed before the big boat, deeply laden, was towed by the little one from the wreck of what a proportion of her freight was composed i could not tell much of it being in parcels and casks they had made sure of the tobacco by bringing away at once all that they could find i observed a number of hams stitched up in canvas and some sacks of potatoes two bags of which were lost by the bottoms bursting whilst they were being hoisted on which van vogelaar broke into several terrible oaths in dutch though twas like a dramatic rehearsal of a ranting and bullying scene for vanderdecken took no notice and the men went on hoisting and lowering away in the old phlegmatic mechanic fashion as though they were deaf there were likewise other kinds of provisions of which i need not tease you with the particulars i believe that all the loading of the boat in this her first trip i mean consisted of articles of food for some of the parcels which puzzled me proved to contain cheeses and the others might therefore as well represent stores of a like kind is it their custom to bring away the provisions first i asked imogene as a rule she answered they take whatever comes to hand that is if the articles be such as may be of use what they chiefly secure as soon as possible is tobacco and spirits then provisions and clothing and then any treasure they may come across and afterwards any portion of the cargo they may fancy that is light to handle such as silks pottery and so forth but they cannot take very much said i or a few meetings of this kind would sink their ship for them with overloading there are many of us she replied and the provisions they bring away do not last very long the pottery they use and it is soon broken silk and such materials as they bring are light and then my dear they do not meet wrecks every day nor of the wrecks they meet may you count one in five that yields enough to sink this ship by a foot i am heartily sorry said i that they should find so much to eat aboard yonder hulk with so goodly a store of provisions vanderdecken will not require to run into the land to shoot and until this ship brings up i see no chance for ourselves she sighed and looked sadly into the water insomuch that she suggested an emotion of hopelessness but in an instant she flashed out of her expression of melancholy weariness into a smile and gave me the deep perfections of her violet eyes to look into as if she knew their power over me and shaped their shining influence for my comfort and courage when the boat was discharged of her freight the men's dinner was passed over the side for the fellows to eat in snatches working the while to save time the wind remained weak and quiet but it was inevitable that the hamper we showed aloft should give us a drift beyond the send of the swell and to remedy this vanderdecken clewed up his topsails and took in all his canvas leaving his ship to tumble under bare poles and by this means he rendered the drift of the vessel down upon the wreck extremely sluggish and scarcely perceptible all day long the big boat was towed to and fro making many journeys and regularly putting off from the wreck very deep with freight vanderdecken ate his dinner on deck you would have found it hard to reconcile any theory of common human passions such as cupidity rapacity and the like with his bloodless face and graveyard aspect and yet it was impossible to mistake the stirring of the true dutch instincts of the patient but resolved greed in the air he carried whilst he waited for the return of the boat in his frequent levelling of the telescope at the wreck 
as one who doubted his people and kept a sharp eye on them in the eagerness his posture indicated as he hung over the rail watching the stuff as it was handed up or swayed by yard-arm tackles over the side and the fierce peremptoriness of the questions he put to van vogelaar as to what he had there how much more remained and so on though nothing that the mate answered satisfactory as must have been the account he gave softened the captain's habitual savageness or in any degree humanized him of the majesty of his deportment i have spoken likewise of the thrilling richness of his voice the piercing fire of his fine eyes and of his mien and bearing so haughtily stately in all respects as to make one think of him after a pagan fashion as of some god fallen from his high estate but for all that he was a dutchman at heart dead alive as he was as true to his holland extraction in seventeen ninety six as he had been an hundred and fifty years earlier when he was trading to batavia and nimbly getting money and saving it too with as sure a hand as was ever swung in amsterdam the threads and lines and beds of vapour extending all over the sky served to reverberate the glory of the sunset as the crags and peaks of mountains fling onwards the echoes of the thunderclap in the east it was all jasper and sapphire and reds and greens and a lovely clear blue slowly burning to a carnelian in the zenith where the effulgence lay in a pool of deep red with a haze of light like fine rain floating down upon it half white half of silver then followed a jacinthine hue a lustrous red most daintily delicate with streaks of clear green like the beryl till the eye came to the west where the sun vastly enlarged by refraction hung an enormous bulk of golden fiery magnificence amid half-curtained pavilions of living splendour where twas like looking at some newly wrought fairy world robed in the shinings of the heaven of christ to see the lakes and lagoons of amber purple and yellow the seas of molten gold the starry flamings in the chrysolite brows of vapour and the sky fading out north and south in lights and tints as fair as the reflections in the wet pearly interior of a seashell gaping on a beach towards the setting sun the small swell traversing the great red light that was upon the sea put lines of flowing glory under the tapestries of that sunset and the appearance was that of an eager shouldering of the effulgence into the grey of the south quarter as though old neptune sought to honourably distribute the glory all around and render the western seaboard ambient then it was while the lower limb of the luminary yet sipped from the horizon the gold of his own showering that the picture of the wreck and the death-ship heaving pale and stripped of her canvas became the wonder that my memory must for ever find it how steadfastly the dead seamen at the wheel kept watch the quieted sea now scarce stirred the rudder and the occasional light movements of the figure seemed like starts in him motions of surprise at the dutchman's ant-like pertinaciousness in their stripping of the hull and they in that many-coloured western blaze they partook more of the character of corpses in those faces of theirs which stared our way or glimmered for a breath or two over the bulwarks than ever i had found visible in them by moonlight or lamplight or the chilling dimness of a stormy dawn the sun vanished and the pale grey of evening stole like a curtain drawn by spirit hands out of the eastern sea and over the waning glories of the skies with a star or two glittering in its skirts and the wind from the north blew with a sudden weight and a long moaning making the sea whence it came ashen with gushings of foam which ran into a colour of thin blood on passing the confines of the western reflection 
vanderdecken seizing his trumpet sent a loud command through it to the wreck but the twilight was a mere windy glimmering under the stars which shone very brightly among the high small clouds by the time the boats had shoved clear of the hull and were heading for us and the night had come down dark spite of the stars and the silver pairing of moon ere the last fragment of the freight of rope sail and raffle from the wreck had been passed over the side from the big boat it grew into a wild scene then the light of the lantern candles dimly throwing out the bleached faces and dark figures of the seamen as they hoisted the boats and stowed them one inside the other the ship rolling on the swell that had again risen very suddenly as though some mighty hand were striving to press it down and so forcing the fluid surface into larger volumes the heads of the seas frothing spectrally as they coursed arching and splashing out of the further darkness the eastering slip of moon sliding like a shearing scythe among the networks of the shrouds and gear and nothing to be heard but the angry sobbing of waters beating themselves into hissing foam against the ship's side and the multitudinous crying as of a distant but piercing chorusing of many women and boys of the freshening wind flying damp through the rigging it had been a busy day it was still a busy time but never throughout the hours if i save the occasional cursing of the mate the captain's few questions his command trumpeted to the wreck my talk with imogene had human voice been heard it was not so noticeable a thing this silence of the ghostly crew in the broad blaze of sunshine and amid an exhibition of labor that was like sound to the eye as now in the darkness with the wind freshening sail to be made and much to be done much of the kind that forces merchant seamen into singing out and bawling as they drag and pull and jump aloft the wreck was a mere lump of blackness tumbling out to windward upon the dusky frothing welter and i thought of the dead sentinel at the helm what in the name of the saint was there in that figure to put into the sea the enormous solitude i found in the vast surface glimmering to where it melted in shadow against the low stars what was there in that poor corpse to fling a bleakness into the night wind to draw an echo as chilling as a madman's cry out of the gusty moaning aloft to sadden the very starbeams into dull and spectral twinklings the canvas shook as the silent sailors sheeted it home and voicelessly mastheaded the yards at three bells in the first watch the death ship had been wore to bring her starboard tacks aboard and under all the canvas she had she was leaning before a small gale with her head to the southward and westward her sides and decks alive with the twistings of the mystic fires which darkness kindled in her ancient timbers and her round weather bow driving the rude black Chapter thirty three of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter thirty three My Life is Attempted. Heading out to sea afresh. Once again, pointing the ship's beak for the solitude of the ocean and starting as it might be on a new struggle that was to end in storm and defeat in the heavy belaboring of the groaning structure by giant surges and in a sickening helpless drift of god alone knew how many leagues ere the sky brightened into blueness once more never had i so strongly felt the horror and misery of the fate which vanderdecken's hellish impiety had brought down upon his ship and her company of mariners as now 
when I saw the yards braced up on the starboard tack, and the vessel laid with her head to the south and west. The fresh wind seemed to shriek the word forever in her rigging, and the echo was drowned in the wild sobbing sounds that rose out of each long, yearning wash of the sea along her dimly shining bends. Shortly after midnight, the wind freshened, and it came on to blow with some weight. I had been in my cabin an hour, lying there broad awake, being rendered extraordinarily uneasy by my thoughts. The sea had grown hollow, and the ship plunged quickly and sharply with a heavy thunderous noise of spurned and foaming waters all about her. It was sheer misery lying intensely wakeful in that desolate cabin that would have been as pitchy black as any ancient castle dungeon but for the glimmering lights, which were so much more terrible than the profoundest shade of blackness could be, that, had there been any hole in the ship where the phosphor did not glow, I would cheerfully have carried my bed to it, I, even if it had been in the bottom of the forepeak, or in the thickest of the midnight of the hold. The rats squeaked, the bulkheads and ceilings seemed alive with crawling glowworms, groans as of dying, cries as of wounded men sounded out of the interior, in which lay stowed the pepper, mace, spices, and other Indian commodities of a freight that was hard upon an hundred and fifty years old. I crawled into my clothes by feeling for them, and groped my way on to the poop. The sky was black with low-flying cloud, from the speeding rims of which a star would now and again glance, like the flash of a filibuster's fusil from the dark shrubbery of a mountain slope. But there was so much roaring spume and froth all about the ship, that a dim radiance as of twilight hung in the air and I could see to as high as the topmast heads. I stepped at once to the binnacle without noticing who had the watch, and found the ship's head southeast by south. I could not suppose the ancient magnet showed the quarters accurately, but, allowing for a westerly variation of thirty degrees, the indication came near enough to satisfy me that the wind was as it had been ever since the night I first entered this ship, right in our teeth for the passage of the Cape, and that though we might be sluggishly washing through it close-hauled, we were also driving away broadside on, making a clean beam course for the heart of the mighty southern ocean. This vexed and harassed me to the soul, and occasioned in me so lively a sympathy with the rage that adverse gales had kindled in Vanderdecken, that had he contented himself with merely damning the weather instead of flying in the face of the Most High and behaving like some foul fiend, I should have deeply pitied him and considered his case the hardest ever heard of. The main-yard was lowered, and a row of men were silently knotting the reef-points. The top-gallant sails had been handed, Reefs tied in the topsails, and the vessel looked prepared for foul weather. But, though the wind blew smartly, with weight in its gusts and plenty of piping and screaming and whistling of it aloft, there was no marked storminess of aspect in the heavens. Somber and sullen as was the shadow that ringed the sea-line, and fiercely as flew the black clouds out of it in the northwest, and with this appearance, I essayed to console myself as I stood near the mizzen shrouds gazing about me. Seeing a figure standing near the larboard shrouds, I stepped over and found it to be Van Vogelaar. My direct approach made some sort of a cost a formal necessity, but I little loved to speak with this man, whom I considered as wicked a rascal as ever went to sea. "'These nor'westers are evil winds, mine here, said I, "'and in this sea they appear to have the vitality of easterly gales in England. "'What is the weather to be like? "'For my part, I think we shall find a quieter atmosphere before dawn.' "'He was some time in answering, "'feigning to watch the men reefing the mainsail. 
though by the light of the white water i could catch the gleam of his eyes fixed upon me askant what brings you on deck at this hour said he in his rasping surly voice i answered quietly that feeling wakeful and hearing the wind i rose to view the weather for myself a sailor is supposed to rest the better for the rocking of seas and the crying of wind said he with a mocking contemptuous tone in his accents that saying is intended no doubt for the dutch seamen the english mariner nobly shines as a sailor in his own records but you will admit sir that he is never so happy as when he is ashore sir i replied suppressing my rising temper with a very heavy effort i fear you must have suffered somewhat at the hands of the english sailor that you should never let slip a chance to discharge your venom at him i am english and a sailor too and i should be pleased to witness some better illustrations of dutch courage than the insults you offer to a man who stands defenceless among you and must be beholden therefore wholly to your courtesy he said in a sneering scornful voice our courtesy a member of a dastardly crew that would have assassinated me and my men with their small arms hath a great claim upon our courtesy i was aft and ignorant of the intentions of the men when that thing was done said i resolved not to be betrayed into heat let the struggle to keep calm cost what it would to this he made no reply then after a pause said in a mumbling voice as if he would and yet would not have me hear him i brought a curse into the ship when i handed you over the side the devil craved for you and i should have let you sink into his maws by the holy sepulchre there are many in amsterdam who would have me keel-hauled did they know this hand had saved the life of an englishman and he tossed up his right hand with a vehement gesture of rage i was a stoutly built fellow full of living and healthy muscle and i do solemnly affirm that it would not have cost me one instant of quicker breathing to have tossed this brutal and insulting anatomy over the rail but it was not only that i feared any exhibition of temper in me might end in my murder i felt that in the person of this ugly and malignant mate i should be dealing with a sentence that forbade his destruction that must preserve him from injury and that rendered him as superior to human vengeance as if his body had been lifeless and what were his insults but a kind of posthumous scorn as idle and contemptible as that inscription upon a dead dutchman's grave in rotterdam in which the poor holland corpse after eighty years of decay goes on telling the world that in his opinion britons are poor creatures i held my peace and van vogelaar went to the break of the poop whence he could better see what the men were doing upon the mainyard the enmity of this man made me feel very unhappy i was never sure what mischief he meditated and the sense of my helplessness the idleness of any resolution i might form in the face of the supernatural life that encompassed me made the flying midnight seem inexpressibly dreary and dismal and the white foam of the sea carrying the eye to the ebony cloud girdle that belted the horizon suggested distances so prodigious that the heart sank to the sight of them as to thoughts of eternity i was running my gaze slowly over the weather seaboard whence came the endless procession of ridged billows like incalculable hosts of black-mailed warriors with white plumes flying and steam from the nostrils of their steeds boiling and pouring before them and phosphoric lights upon them like the shining points of couched spears when methought a dim pallid shadow standing just under a star that was floating a moment betwixt two flying shores of cloud was a ship and the better to see i sprang on to the rail about abreast of the helmsman for my support catching hold of some stout rope that ran transversely aft out of the darkness amidships 
what gear it was i never stopped to consider but gripping it with my left hand swayed to it erect upon the rail whilst with my right i sheltered my eyes against the smarting rain of spray and stared at what i guessed to be a sail i have said that the creaming and foaming of the waters flung from the vessel's sides and bows made a light in the air and the sphere of my sight included a space of the poop deck to right and left of me albeit my gaze was fastened upon the distant shadow all on a sudden the end of the rope i grasped was thrown off the pin to which it was belayed and i fell overboard twas instantaneous and so marvellously swift as thought that i recollect even during that lightning-like plunge thinking how icy cold the sea would be and how deep my dive from the great height of the poop rail but instead of striking the water the weight of me swung my body into the mizzen channels by the rope my left hand desperately gripped i fell almost softly against a shroud coming down to a great dead eye there and dropped in a sitting posture in the channel itself which to be sure was a wide platform to windward and therefore lifted very clear of the sea spite of the ship's weather rolls my heart beat quickly but i was safe yet a moment after i had liked to have perished indeed for the rope i mechanically grasped was all at once torn from my fingers with so savage a drag from some hand on deck that nothing but the pitting of my knee against a dead eye preserved me from being tweaked into the hissing cauldron beneath i could see the rope plain enough as it was tautened through the pallid atmosphere and against the winking of the stars sliding from one wing of vapour to another and perceived that it was the main brace the lowering of the yard for reefing the sail having brought it within reach of my arm then with this there grew in me a consciousness of my having noticed a figure glide by me whilst i stood on the rail and putting these things together i guessed that van vogelaar having observed my posture had sneaked aft to where the main brace that was formed of a pendant and whip was made fast and had let go of it never doubting that as i leaned against it so by his whipping the end off the pin it would let me fall overboard i was terribly enraged by this cowardly attempt upon my life and was for climbing inboard at once and manhandling him ghost or no ghost then changed my mind and stayed a bit in the channel considering what i should do thin veins of fire crawled upon this aged platform as upon all other parts of the ship but the shrouds coming very thick with leather chafing gear to the dead eyes made such a jumble of black shapes that i was very sure van vogelaar could not see me if he should take it into his head to peer down over the rail after casting about in my mind the determination i arrived at was to treat my tumble from the rail as an accident for i very honestly believed this that if i should complain to vanderdecken of his mate's murderous intention i would not only harden the deadly malignity of that ghastly ruffian's hatred of me insomuch that it might come to his stabbing me in my sleep but it might end in putting such fancies into the captain's head as should make him desire my destruction and arrange with his horrid lieutenant to procure it indeed i had only to think of amboyna and the brutal character of the dutch of those times and remember that vanderdecken and his men belonged to that age and would therefore have the savagery which one hundred and fifty years of civilization arts and letters have somewhat abated in the hollanders to determine me to move with very great wariness in this matter but i had been dreadfully near to death and could not speedily recollect myself the white heads of the surges leaped boiled and snapped under the channels like wolves thirsting for my blood and the crying of the wind among the shrouds in whose shadows i sat 
and the sounds it made as it coursed through the dark night and split shrilly upon the ropes and spars high up in the dusk ran echoes into those raving waters below which made them as much wild beasts to the ear as they looked to the eye but little good could come of my sitting and brooding in that mizzen channel so being in no mood to meet the villain van vogelaar i very cautiously rose and with the practised hand of a sailor crawled along the lap of the covering board holding by the rail but keeping my head out of sight and reached the main chains whence i dropped on to the deck unseen among the tangled thickness of the shrouds and slided as stilly as the ghostliest man among that ghastly Chapter thirty four of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter thirty four My Sweetheart's Joy. Once asleep, I slept heavily, and it was twenty minutes past the breakfast hour by the time I was ready to leave the crazy and groaning dungeon that served me for a bedroom. I entered the cabin, but had scarcely made two steps when there sounded a loud cry in a girl's voice, half of terror, half of joy, a shriek so startling for the passions it expressed that it brought me to a dead stand. It was Imogene i saw her jump from her seat make a gesture with her arms as though she would fly to me then bring both hands violently to her heart with a loud hysterical ha ha as if she could only find breath in some such unnatural note of laughter whilst she stood staring at me with straining eyes that filled her violet beauty with a light like that of madness the clock struck the half-hour as she cried and the echo of her voice and the deep humming vibration of the bell were followed by the parrot's diabolical croak wiesen alverdomt god in heaven exclaimed vanderdecken in a tone deep with amazement i thought that man was drowned it was a picture of consternation that I should not have dreamt to expect in men who had outlived life, and in whom you would think of seeking qualities and emotions outside those which were necessary to the execution of their sentence. Vanderdecken, leaning forward at the head of the table upon his great hands, the fingers of which were stretched out, glared at me with a frown of astonishment. Prins, whose attendance upon me in my cabin had long been limited to his placing a bucket of salt water at my door without entering prins i say arrested by my entry whilst in the act of filling a cup of wine for the captain watched me with a yawn of wonder and stood motionless as though blasted by a stroke of lightning whilst van vogelaar with his head upon his shoulder the blade of the knife with which he had been eating forking straight up out of his fist that lay like a paralyzed thing upon the table eyed me with a sunk chin and under a double fold of brow his level enchained stare full of fear and cruelty and passion i saw how it was and giving the captain a bow and my darling a smile i went to my place at the table and sat down van vogelaar shrank as i passed him keeping his eyes upon me as a cat follows the motions of a dog and when i seated myself he fell away by the length of his arm dropping his knife and fork and watching me imogene breathing deeply resumed her seat nothing but vanderdecken's amazement hindered him from observing her agitation which was of a nature he could not possibly have mistaken, if indeed he still possessed the capacity of distinguishing such emotions as love. She merely said, letting out her words in a tremulous sigh, 
Oh, Geoffrey, thank God, thank God! The food in front of her was untasted, but what grief there had been in her face before was lost in the confusion of feelings which worked in her loveliness with a vitality that made her red and white in the same moment. She repeated under her breath to herself, Thank God! Thank God! This while the others stared. I turned to Van Vogelaar. Mine here, said I, you regard me with astonishment. He shrank a little further yet, and, after a pause, said, Are you man or devil? Captain Vanderdecken, said I, has your mate lost his reason? On this, Van Vogelaar cried out, Captain, by the Holy Trinity, I swear it was as I have reported. This Englishman, after prowling on deck last night, in the early hours of the middle watch, suddenly clambered on to the rail, for what purpose I know not, and leaned his weight against the starboard main brace, the sail then reefing. I looked round, on turning again he was gone, and Nicholas Holtzhausen, who was at the helm, swore he saw him rise black upon the white eddies of the wake. Vanderdecken frowningly questioned me with his eyes. I should have been acting a sillier part than a fool's to have jested with these men. Besides, I had long since resolved to be plain. Here, Van Vogelaar, said I, doubtless refers to my having fallen into the weather mizzen channel last night from the rail, whilst peering at what I believed to be a ship. The main brace upon which I had put my hand to steady myself yielded very suddenly, and here I shot a look at the mate. But I fell lightly, and after sitting a little to recover my breath, made my way to my cabin. Van Vogelaar's death-like face darkened. An oath or two rattled in his throat, and returning to his old posture, he fell to the meat upon his plate, with the ferocity of some starving beast, insomuch that the veins about his forehead stood out like pieces of cord. The feelings with which Vanderdecken received my explanation I could not gather. He gazed hard at me with fiery eyes, as though, mistrusting me, he sought to burn his sight down to my heart, and then, slowly resuming his knife and fork, went on with his breakfast in his familiar trance-like way, mute as a dead man. I constantly exchanged glances with Imogene, but held my peace since she remained silent. She struggled to compose her face, but her joy at my presence shone through her mask of reserve, twitching the corners of her mouth into faint smiles, and dancing in her eyes like sunshine, on the ripples of a sapphire pool. Her love for me spoke more in this quiet delight than she could have found room for in a thousand words. How sweet and fair she looked! The light of her heart lay with a fair rosiness upon her cheeks, which had been as pale as marble when she had risen with her shriek and laughter to my first coming. Presently Van Vogelaar left the cabin, going out scowling and talking to himself, but not offering so much as to glance at me. There was a piece of hung meat on the table, of what animal I did not know, it proved indifferent good eating. This and some cakes made of flour, with a goblet of sherry and water, formed my breakfast. I ate slowly, knowing that Vanderdecken would not smoke whilst I breakfasted, and wishing to tire him away that Imogene and I might have the cabin to ourselves. But my stratagem was to no purpose. He started suddenly from his waking dream, if indeed it was to be credited that any sort of intellectual faculty stirred in him when he lapsed into these cataleptic stillnesses, and bade Prins go and get cut up some of the tobacco they had removed from the wreck, and then, erecting his figure, and stroking down his beard, he looked from me to Imogene and back to me again, and said, The weather promises to mend, but this wind must come from a witch's mouth, and a witch of deep and steady lungs. 
i hope you may not have brought us ill luck sir i hope not said i shortly there are malign stars in the heavens he continued in a voice that trembled richly upon the air like the waving echoes of some deep-throated melodious bell and there are men born under them north of the baltic on muscovite territory is a nation of wretches who can bewitch the winds and sail their ships through contrary gales they are not far removed from britain said he significantly they are as close to holland mine heer said i oh captain cried imogene you do not wish to say that mr fenton has had a hand in the fixing of this wind he leaned his forehead upon his elbow and stretching forth his other hand drummed lightly on the table with his long lean leprous coloured fingers as he spoke why mine here fenton miss dudley must allow that a curious luck attends you how many of a crew went to your ship forty sir mark your star of forty men you alone fall overboard but fortune goes with you and you are rescued by van vogelaar observe again of forty men you alone are delivered into a ship whose nation is at war with yours yet fortune still attends you and you are hospitably received yea even made welcome and clothed and fed and housed i bowed more yet last night you fell from the bulwark rail what sorcery is it that sways you into the mizzen channel and presently unseen to your bed nicholas holtzhausen is noted among us for his shrewd sight did he not swear he saw you rise black after your plunge among the froth of the ship's wake what was it that he beheld can the soul shed its body as the butterfly its skin and yet appear clothed substantial real as flesh and blood i exactly explained that accident said i if there be sorcery in my having the luck to tumble into a ship's mizzen chains instead of the water then am i a witch fit for a broomstick and a grinning moon captain vanderdecken does but amuse himself with you mr fenton said imogene it is true mynheer she continued putting on an inimitable air of sweet dignity which was vastly reassuring to me as proving that she had recovered her old easiness of mind and was now playing a part that we believed you had fallen overboard last night and this being our conclusion you may judge how greatly your entrance just now amazed us for me i was so frightened that i shrieked out as you doubtless heard truly i thought you the dead arisen captain vanderdecken cannot recover his surprise and would have himself to believe that you are a sorcerer you who are so young and an english sailor she laughed out and a truer ring she could not have put into her forced merriment had she been a pritchard or a clive or a sibber indeed she added to be a necromancer you need a beard as long and as grey as the captain's there was no temper in the look vanderdecken cast upon her nay it almost deserved the name of mildness in him whose eyes were forever fiery with hot thought and passions of undivinable character but not the phantom of a smile showed in his face in response to her laughter madam said i putting on a distant air in conformity with the hint of her own manner i am no sorcerer for your sake i would i were for then my first business would be to veer this wind south and keep it there till it had thundered our ship with foaming stem into the smooth waters of the zuyder zee this seemed to weigh with vanderdecken he reflected a little and then said with something of lofty urbanity in his mode of addressing me had you that power mine here i do not know that i should object to your presence were you beelzebub himself imogene's smile betrayed the delight she felt in her gradual 
happy nimble drawing of this fierce man's thoughts away from his astonishing suspicions of me as a wizard have you ever heard mr fenton said she of that nation to the north of the baltic of whom captain vanderdecken has spoken oh yes madam i replied they are well known as russian finns and are undoubtedly wizards and will sell such winds to ships as captains require i knew a master of a vessel who being off the coast of finland grew impatient for a wind to carry him to a certain distant port he applied to an old wizard who said he would sell him a gale that should enable him to fetch the promontory of ruxella but no further for his breeze ceased to obey him when that point was reached the captain agreed holding that a wind to ruxella was better than light airs and baffling calms off the finland coast and paid the wizard ten cronen about six and thirty shillings of english money and a pound of tobacco on which the conjurer tied a woollen rag to the foremast the rag being about half a yard long and a nail broad it had three knots and the wizard told him to loose the first knot when he got his anchor which he did and forthwith it blew a fresh favorable gale that is so demanded vanderdecken doubtingly and folding his arms over his beard i knew the captain mynheer i answered his name was jenkins and his ship was a brig called the true love did the first knot give him all the wind he wanted asked he no sir it gave them a brisk west-south-west gale that carried them thirty leagues beyond the maelstrom in the norwegian sea then shifted on which captain jenkins untied the second knot which brought the wind back to its own quarter it failed them again but when the third knot was untied there arose so furious a tempest that all hands went to prayers begging for mercy for choosing to deal with an infernal artist instead of trusting to providence it was not easy to make out the thoughts in vanderdecken's mind not less because of the half of his countenance being densely clothed with hair than because of the white iron rigidity of as much of his face as was visible yet i could not doubt that he believed in those finnish wizards from a sudden yearning in his manner followed by a flashing glance of impatience at the cabin entrance that was for all the world as though he had cried out would to god there was a purchasable wind hereabouts but the reader must consider that this man belonged to an age when wise men soberly credited greater wonders than icelandish and finnish wind brokers by this i had made an end of breakfast and prins arriving with a jar full of the tobacco flaked and fit for smoking the captain filled his pipe first pushing the jar to me and then fell into one of his silences from which he would emerge at wide intervals to say something that was as good as a warrant he was thinking no longer of the sorcery of my fall and appearance when he had emptied his bowl he went to his cabin imogene instantly arose and came to my side oh my dearest she whispered with a sudden darkening of her eyes by the shadow of tears i did believe indeed you were lost to me for ever my senses seemed to leave me when vanderdecken accounted for your absence dear heart my precious one i answered fondling her little hand which lay cold with her emotion in mine i am still with thee and hope with us may remain fearless but it was a narrow escape van vogelaar came red-handed to this table for hours he has had my blood upon his devilish soul no wonder the villain quailed when i entered this cabin what did he do she cried i believed i saw a ship i answered i jumped on to the rail to make sure and leaned against the brace that governs the mainyard he slipped aft 
and let go the rope meaning that i should fall overboard but my grip was a sailor's and i swung with the rope into the mizzen chains the wretch he told vanderdecken that you had climbed on to the bulwarks and fallen i could kill him she clenched her white fingers till the jewels on them flashed to the trembling of the tension and a delicate crimson surged into her face i could kill him she repeated hush sweet one it is our business to escape and we need an exquisite judgment i too could kill the treacherous ruffian only that he is deathless you brave heart will advise me that we are not to know of this thing no let it be an accident of my own doing we are in a ship full of devils and must act as if we believed them angels her face slowly paled her fingers opened and the angry shining faded out of her eyes leaving the soft violet pensive light there yes you are right we must not know the truth of this thing said she musingly after a little but be on your guard geoffrey keep well away from that rogue his spanish treachery is made formidable by his dutch cunning how swiftly he acted last night his thoughts must have been intent for some time or even the demon in him would not have been equal to such readiness see to your cabin door at night oh geoffrey he might steal in upon you i smiled he has spoken once i shall not require a second hint oh that i had a man's arm geoffrey that i might be your sentinel whilst you slept precious one you shall sentinel me yet patience meanwhile it is this ship that makes home so distant once clear of this groaning vault and we shall be smelling the sweet briar and the violet vanderdecken came out of his cabin and went on deck he walked with impetuosity and passed without regarding us through the open door leading to the quarter-deck i saw him stand a minute with his face upturned and then toss his hand with a gesture of baffled rage he is cursing the wind said imogene how often has he done so since i have been in this ship and when will a last day come to him when there shall be no wind to curse when death shall have paralyzed his tongue and silenced his heart how fiercely it now throbs surely there is more stormy passion in one day of its beating than in twenty years of a human pulse oh my dear that you had the northern wizard's power of evoking prosperous gales i should be glad of that power said i for better reasons than to help this man to fight against his sentence can you guess what i would do i would straightway blow this old ship ashore dread the afric coast as you will dear one it will be our only chance i dread it for its savages the thought of captivity beyond the mountains is horrible i have heard my father tell of the wreck of an east india man named the grosvenor in which were ladies of distinction who were seized by the natives and carried far inland and made wives of that is not more than twenty years ago oh geoffrey sooner than that i would be content to die in this ship to go on sailing about in her till my hair was as white as the foam about our keel and as she said this she grasped a handful of her golden hair and held it to me unconscious in the earnestness of her fears of the childlike simplicity of her action i put my lips to the tress that flowed from her head through the snow of her hand and thence down like a stream of sunny light or the raining of the jet of a golden fountain and told her not to fear that i loved the natives as little as she and would contrive to give them a wide berth and then i changed the subject by wondering what the consequences would be if last night's business and vanderdecken's talk this morning put it into the minds of the crew that i was as much a wizard as any finn 
and could control the breezes if I chose. She shook her head. Better that they should regard you as what you really are, an English sailor. Suppose they persuaded themselves that you could raise and sell winds. They might determine to test you, and imprison, even torture you, in the belief you were stubborn and would not do their bidding. Or, if they came to consider you a wizard, they might think your presence in the ship unlucky, and, being half savages, with demons for souls, as I believe, and with instincts belonging to a time when the world was brutal and human life held in no account, there is no imagining how they would serve you. Oh, Imogene, cried I, you are my good angel. A true sweetheart must ever be that to the boy she loves, she whispered, looking down and softly blushing. You are my true sweetheart, Imogene, and how faithfully you are able to guide me. Through the marvelous experience we are both passing through, I know by the words you have just uttered. And I went on to tell her how Van Vogelaar had under his breath talked as if to himself of my being a curse in the ship. As I said this, Prins came to the cabin door and stood looking in. Perceiving him, Imogene rose and saying quietly, He has perhaps been sent to report if we are together. Go you on deck, dearest. I will join you. Chapter 35 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 35 We Tell Our Love Again. I had passed from the deck where I slept to the cabin in too great a hurry to notice the weather. Now, reaching the poop, I stood a moment or two to look around, being in my way as concerned about the direction of the wind as Vanderdecken himself. It still blew fresh, but the heavens lay open among the clouds that had thickened their bulk into great drooping, shining bosoms, as though, indeed, the crystalline blue under which they sailed in solemn procession mirrored the swelling brows of mighty snow-covered mountains." The sea ran in a very dark shade of azure, and offered a most glorious surface of colors, with the heave of its violet hills bearing silver and pearly streakings of sunshine and foam upon their buoyant floating slopes, and with the jeweled and living masses of froth which flashed from their heights and stormed into their valleys as they raced before the wind, which chased them with noisy whistlings and notes as of bugles. The death ship was close hauled. When was the day to come when I should find her with her yards squared? But on the larboard tack, so that they must have put the ship about since midnight, and the sun standing almost over the mizzen topsail yard arm showed me that we were doing some westing, for which I could have fallen on my knees and thanked God. The captain and the mate were on deck. Vanderdecken abreast of the tiller, Van Vogelaar twenty paces forward of him, both still and stiff, gazing seawards, with faces whose expressionlessness forbade your comparing them to sleeping dreamers. They looked the eternity that was upon them, and their ghastliness, the age and the doom of the ship, fell with a shock upon the perception to the horrible suggestions of those two figures, and of the face at the tiller, whose tense and bloodless skin glared white to the sun as the little eyes, like rings of fire, eating into the sockets beneath the brows, glanced from the card to the weather edges of the canvas. I quitted the poop, not choosing to keep myself in view of Vanderdecken and Van Vogelaar, and walked about the quarter-deck, struggling hard with the dreadful despondency which clouded my mind, whilst imagination furiously beat 
against the iron-hard conditions which imprisoned me as a bird rends its plumage in a cage till my heart pulsed with the soreness of a real wound in my breast the only glimmer of hope i could find lay as i had again and again told imogene in the direction of the land but who was to say how long a time would pass before the needs of the ship would force vanderdecken shorewards and if the wind grew northerly and came feeble how many weeks might we have to count ere this intolerable sailor brought the land into sight oh i tell you such speculations were sheerly maddening when i added to them the reflection that the heaving of the land into view might by no means prove a signal for our deliverance however by the time imogene arrived on deck i had succeeded in tranquillizing my mind she took some turns with me and then went to the captain on the poop and stayed with him that is stood near him though i do not know that they conversed till he went to his cabin whereupon i joined her neither of us deigning to heed the mate's observation of us and for the rest of the morning we were together knitting our hearts closer and closer whilst we talked of england of her parents the ship her father had commanded and the like amusing ourselves with dreams of escape till hope grew lustrous with the fairy light our amorous fancies flung upon it and lo here on the deck of this death ship with van vogelaar standing like a statue within twenty paces of us and the dead face of a breathing man at the tiller and silent sailors languidly stirring forwards or voicelessly plying the marlin spike or the serving mallet aloft where the swollen canvas swayed under the deep-breasted clouds like spaces of ancient tapestry from which time has sponged out all bright colors here in this fated and faded craft that surged with the silence of the tomb in her through hissing seas and aslant whistling winds did i in the course of our talk find myself presently speaking of my mother of the little town in which she lived of the church to which under god i would lead my sweetest there to make her my bride she blushed rosy with delight and i marked the passionate gladness of her love in the glance she gave me as she lifted the fringes of her white eyelids to dart that exquisite gleam whilst she held her chaste face drooped but looking as though some power drew me to look at van vogelaar i met his malignant stare full and the chill and venom of his storm-bruised countenance fell upon my heart like a sensible atmosphere and poison for the life of me i could not help the shudder that ran through my frame do you believe said i that the men of this death-ship have any power of blighting hope and emotion by their glance the mere sighting of this vessel it is said is sufficient to procure the doom of another she shook her head as though she would say she could not tell there is something said i to ice the strongest man's blood in the expression van vogelaar sometimes turns upon me there is an ancient story of a bald-pated philosopher who at a marriage feast looked and looked a bride and the wondrous pavilion which the demons she commanded had built into emptiness he stared her and her splendors into thin air sending the bridegroom to die with nothing but memory to clasp there may be no philosophy in yonder dutch villain but surely he has all the malignity of apollonius in his eyes do you fear he will stare me into air said she smiling i would blind him if i thought so said i with a temper that owed not a little of its heat to the heavy fit of superstition then upon me in the times of that rogue it was believed a man could pray another dead 
but did one ever hear of a stare powerful enough to dematerialize a body sweet one if that pale ruffian there could look you into space what form would your spirit take would you become to me as did the girl of his heart to the old poet the very figure of that morning star that dropping pearls and shedding dewy sweets fled from the greedy waves when i approached he cannot part us she exclaimed let me be your morning star indeed flying to you from the greedy waves not from you geoffrey do not speak to me of van vogelaar nor look his way tell me again dear of your mother's home talk to me of flowers of england Chapter Thirty Six of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter Thirty Six. We sight a sail. As the day advanced, the breeze weakened, the sea grew smoother, the surge flattened to the swell and the wind did little more than crisp with snowy feathers those long low broad-browed folds swinging steadily and cradlingly out of the heart of the mighty southern ocean every cloth the brave carried had been sheeted home and hoisted she looked as if she had been coated with sulphur as she slipped rolling up one slant and down another brimming to her channels the hue of her was as if she had been anchored all night near to a flaming hill and had received for hours the plumy pumice-colored discharge of the volcano there was nothing to relieve this sulphurous reflection with flash or sparkle the sunshine died in the green backs of the brass swivels it lay lustreless upon the rusty iron cannons it found no mirror in the dry and honeycombed masts and it touched without vitalizing the rounded canvas whose breasts had nothing of that hearkening seeking look which you find in the flowing swelling of a ship's sails yearning horizonwards to the land beyond the sea it was half past five o'clock in the afternoon i had come up from supper leaving vanderdecken smoking at the head of the table Imogene had gone to her cabin for her hat. Van Vogelaar was off duty, and very likely lying down. Arents had the watch. There was a fine sailing wind blowing, and but for the choking grip of the trim of the yards on the creaking high old fabric, I believe the ship would have got some life out of it. It was the first dog watch, an idle hour, and all the ghostly crew were assembled forward every man smoking for tobacco was now plentiful and their postures their faces their different kinds of dress their lifelessness save for the lifting of their hands to their pipes and above all their silence made a most wonderful picture of the decks their way the foreground formed of the boats a number of spare booms the close quarters for the livestock the cookhouse chimney coming up through the deck and trailing a thin line of blue smoke whilst under the arched and transverse foot of the foresail you saw the ship's beak the amazing relic of figurehead the clues of the sprit sail and sprit topsail pulling a slant between being the men a dismal white and speechless company with the thick foremast rising straight up out of the jumble of them whilst the red western light flowed over the pallid edges of the canvas that widened out to the crimson gold whose blaze stole into the darkened hollows this side and enriched the aged surfaces with a rosy atmosphere i stood right aft carelessly running my eye along the sea line that floated darkening out of the fiery haze under the sun on our weather beam till in the east 
it curved in a deep blue line so exquisitely clear and pure that it made you think of the sweep of a camel's hairbrush dipped in indigo i gazed without expectation of observing the least break or flaw in that lovely darkling continuity and twas with a start of surprise and doubt that i suddenly caught sight of an object orange-coloured by the light far down in the east that is to say fair upon our lee quarter it was a vessel's canvas beyond question the mirroring of the western glory by some gleaming cloths and my heart started off in a canter to the sight it being impossible now for a ship to heave into view without filling me with dread of a separation from imogene and agitating me with other considerations such as how i should be dealt with on a ship receiving me if they discovered i had come from the flying dutchman i waited a little to make sure and then called to the second mate who stood staring at god knows what with unspeculative eyes here arents yonder is a sail there as i point he quickened out of his death-like repose with the extraordinary swiftness observable in all these men in this particular sort of behavior came to my side gazed attentively and said yes how will she be heading he went for the glass and whilst he adjusted the tubes to his focus captain vanderdecken arrived with imogene what do you see arents asked the captain a sail sir just now sighted by here fenton vanderdecken took the glass and levelled it and after a brief inspection handed me the tube the atmosphere was so bright that the lenses could do little in the way of clarification however i took a view for courtesy's sake and seemed to make out the square canvas and long-headed gaff topsail of a schooner as the sails slided like the wings of a seabird along the swell how doth she steer mynheer said vanderdecken as i passed the telescope to arents why i answered unless the cut of her canvas be a mere imagination of mine she is close hauled on the larboard tack and looking up for us as only a schooner knows how what do you call her he exclaimed imperiously a schooner sir whether he had seen vessels of that rig since their invention i could not know but it was certain the word schooner conveyed no idea it was amazing beyond language that hints of this kind should not have made his ignorance significant to him the sight of the amber shadow on the lee quarter put an expression of anxiety into imogene's face she stood looking at it in silence with parted lips and shortened breathing her fragile her too fragile profile like a cameo of surpassing workmanship against the soft western splendor the gilding of which made a trembling flame of one side of the hair that streamed upon her back presently turning and catching me watching she smiled faintly and said in our tongue the time was dear when i welcomed a strange sail for the relief the break it promised but you have taught me to dread the sight now i answered speaking lightly and easily and looking towards the distant sail as though we talked of her as an object of slender interest if our friend here attempts to transfer me without you i shall hail the stranger's people and tell them what ship this is and warrant them destruction if they offer to receive me the time passed imogene and i continued watching now and again taking a turn for the warmth of the exercise as on the occasion of our pursuit by the centaur so now vanderdecken stood to windward rigid and staring at long intervals addressing arents who from time to time pointed the glass as mechanically as ever vanderdecken's piping shepherd lifted his oaten reed to his mouth shortly after six arrived van vogelaar who was followed by the boatswain jans and there they hung a grisly group whilst the crew got upon the booms or overhung the rail or stood upon the lower ratlines with their backs to the shrouds 
suggesting interest and excitement by their posture alone for as to their faces twas mere expressionless glimmer and too far off for the wild light in their eyes to show thus in silence swam the death ship heaving solemnly as she went with tinkling noises breaking from the silver water that seethed from her ponderous bow as though every foam bell were of precious metal and rang a little music of its own as it glided past but by this time the sail upon our lee quarter had greatly grown and the vigorous red radiance rained by the sinking luminary in such searching storms of light as crimsoned the very nethermost east to the black water-line clearly showed her to be a small but stout schooner hugging the wind under a prodigious pile of canvas and eating her way into the steady breeze with the ease and speed of a frigate bird that slopes its black pinions for the windward flight her hull was plain to the naked eye and resembled rich old mahogany in the sunset her sails blending into one she might to the instant's gaze have passed for a great star rising out of the yellow deep and somewhat empurpled by the atmosphere it was our own desperately sluggish pace that made her approach magical for swiftness but there could be no question as to the astonishing nimbleness of her heels after a while vanderdecken and his men warmed to the sight and fell a-talking to one another with some show of eagerness and a deal of pointing on the part of jans and arents whilst van vogelaar watched with a hung head and a sullen scowl occasionally vanderdecken would direct a hot interrogative glance at me suddenly he came to where we stood what do you make of that vessel mine here said he sir i replied to speak honestly I, I do not like her appearance two voyages ago my ship was overhauled by just such another fellow as that yonder she proved to be a spanish picaroon we had a hundred and fifty troops who with our sailors crouched behind the bulwarks and fired into her decks when she shifted her helm to lay us aboard and this reception made her i suppose think us a battleship for she sheered off with a great sound of groaning rising out of her and pelted from us under a press as if satan had got hold of her tow-rope what country does her peculiar rig represent he asked looking at the vessel with his hand raised to keep the level rays of the sun off his eyes i cannot be sure mine here french or spanish i do not believe her english by the complexion of her canvas she may prove an american for you may see that her cloths are mixed with cotton the word american seemed to puzzle him as much as the word schooner had for in his day an american signified an indian of that continent however i noticed that if ever i used a term that was incomprehensible to him he either dismissed it as coming from one who did not always talk as if he had his full mind or as some english expression of which the meaning as being english was of no concern whatever to his dutch prejudices doth she suggest a privateer to your judgment he inquired i answered yes and more likely a pirate than a privateer if indeed the terms are not interchangeable on this he went to the others and they conversed as if he had called a council of them but i could not catch his words nor did i deem it polite to seem as if i desired to hear what was said do you really believe her to be what you say geoffrey said imogene i do indeed the dusk will have fallen before we shall have her near enough to make out her batteries and judge of her crew but she has the true piratical look a most lovely hull low-lying long and powerful do you observe it dearest a cutwater like a knife a noble length of bowsprit and jibbooms and a mainsail big enough to hold sufficient wind to send a royal george along at ten knots if she be not a picaroon what is her business here 
no trader goes rigged like that in these seas twould be otherwise were this the pacific she may be a letter of mark look cried imogene she hoists her flag i hollowed my hands and used them for telescopes the bunting streamed away over the stranger's quarter but it was a very big flag and its size coupled with the wonderful searching light going to her in crimson lancing beams out of the hot flushed west helped me to discern the tricolor french i exclaimed fetching a quick breath vanderdecken had seen the flag and was examining it through his ancient tubes after a little he gave the glass to van vogelaar who after inspecting the color handed it to arendt then jans looked vanderdecken called to me what signal is that she hath flying i responded the flag of the french republic he started gazed at the others and then glanced steadfastly at me as if he would assure himself that i did not mock him he turned again to the schooner taking the telescope from john's the french republic i heard him say with a tremble of wonderment in his rich notes the mate shrugged his shoulders with a quick insolent turning of his back upon me and the white fat face of john's glimmered past him staring with a gape from me to the schooner but now the lower limb of the sun was upon the sea line it was all cloudless sky just where he was and the vast rayless orb palpitating in waving folds of fire sank into his own wake of flames the heavens glowed red to the zenith and the ruby-colored clouds moving before the wind looked like smoke issuing from behind the sea where the world was burning furiously the gray twilight followed fast and the ocean turned ashen under the slip of moon over the fore yard arm the stealing in of the dusk put a new life into the wind and the harping in our dingy faded heights was as if many spirits had gathered together up there and were saluting the moon Chapter thirty seven of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Newberry. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter thirty seven. The death ship is boarded by a pirate. I will not say that there is more of melancholy in the slow creeping of darkness over the sea than in the first pale streaking of the dawn, but in the shining out of the stars one by one, in the stretching of the great plain of the deep into a midnight surface, whether snow covered with tossing surges, or smooth as black marble and placid as the dark velvet sky that bends to the liquid confines there is a mystic character which even if the dawn held it would be weak as an impression through the quick dispelling of it by the joyous sun but which is accentuated in the twilight shadows by their gradual darkening into the blackness of night I particularly felt the oncoming of the dusk this evening. The glory of the sunset had been great, the twilight brief. Even as the gold and orange faded in the west, so did the canvas of our ships steal out spectrally into the gray gloom of the north and east. The water washed past, wan as the light of the hoary pairing moon. The figures of the four men to windward were changed into dusky, staring statues, and the wake sloped out from the starboard quarter full of eddying sparkles as green as emeralds. The canvas of the schooner, 
that had shone to the sunset with the glare of yellow satin, faded into a pallid cloud that often bothered the sight with its resemblance to the large puffs of vapor blowing into the east. I should be glad to know her intentions, said I uneasily. If she be a piratical craft, it will not do for you to be seen by her people, Imogen. Is it curiosity only that brings them racing up to us? Maybe, maybe. They will be having good glasses aboard and have been excited by our extraordinary rig. Why should I not be seen, Geoffrey? asked my innocent girl. Because, dearest, they may fall in love with and carry you off. But if they should take us both, said she, planting her little hand under my arm. Aye, but one would first like to know their calling, I replied, straining my eyes at the vessel that, at the pace she was tearing through it, would be on our quarter within hailing distance in twenty minutes. What did Vanderdecken mean to do? He made no sign. Fear and passion enough had been raised in him by the centaur's pursuit. Was I to suppose that yonder schooner had failed to alarm him, because he was puzzled by her rig, and by the substitution of the tricolor for the royal fleur-de-lis? Speak to him, Imogen, said I, that I may follow. They may resent any hints from me if I break in upon them on a sudden. Captain, she called in her gentle voice, is not that vessel chasing us? He rounded gravely upon her. She is apparently desirous of speaking with us, my child. She will be hailing us shortly. But if she be a pirate, Captain, doth Herr Fenton think her so? he demanded. She has the cut of one, sir, said I, and in any case her hurry to come at us, her careful luff and heavy press of sail, should justify us in suspecting her intentions and preparing for her as an enemy. Will the Englishman fight, think ye, Captain, if it comes to that? exclaimed Van Vogelaar in his harshest, most scoffing voice. Taking no notice of the mate, I said in a low voice to Imogen, speaking quickly, They have nothing to fear. It is not for a Frenchman's cutlass to end these wretches' doom. I am worried on your account. Dearest, when I bid you, steal to my cabin. You know where it is? Yes. And remain there. Tis the only hiding place I can think of. If they board us and rummage the ship, well, I must wait upon events. In a business of this kind, the turns are sudden. All I can plan now is to take care that you are not seen. I should have been glad to arm myself, but knew not where to seek for a weapon. But thinking of this for a moment, it struck me that if the schooner threw her people aboard us, my being the only man armed might cost me my life. Therefore, unless the whole crew equipped themselves, I should find my safest posture one of defenselessness. Do these men never fight? I asked Imogen. There has been no occasion for them to do so since I have been in the ship, she answered. But I do not think they would fight. They are above the need of it. Yet they have treasure. They value it. And this should prove them in possession of instincts which would prompt them to protect their property. God manages them in his own fashion, said she. They cannot be reasoned about as men with the hot blood of life in them and existing as we do. Yet their apathy greatly contradicted the avidity with which they seized whatever of treasure or merchandise they came across in abandoned ships. Nor could I reconcile it with the ugly cupidity of the mate, and the lively care Vanderdecken took of those capacious chests of which he had exposed me to the sparkling contents of two. Blind as they were, however, to the illustrations of the progress of time which they came across in every ship they encountered, 
they could not be insensible to the worthlessness of their aged and cankered sakers and their green and pivot-rusted swivels. Their helplessness in this way, backed by the perception in them all, that for some reason or other no harm ever befell them from the pursuit of ships or the approach of armed boats, might furnish a clue to the seeming indifference with which they watched the pale shadow of the schooner enlarging upon the darkening froth to leeward. Though I am also greatly persuaded that much of the reason of their stolidity lay in their being puzzled by the rig of the schooner and the flag she had flown, nor, perhaps, were they able to conceive that so small a craft signified mischief, or had room for sailors enough to venture the carrying of a great tall craft like the Brave. But Vanderdecken could not know to what heights piracy had been lifted as a fine art by the audacity and repeated triumphs of the rogues, whose real ensign, no matter what colors they fly, is composed of a skull, crossbones, and hourglass upon a black field. The moon shed no light, but the wind was full of a weak dawn-like glimmer from the wash of the running waters, and from the stars which shone brightly among the clouds. In all this while the schooner had never started a rope-yarn, her white and leaning fabric, swaying with stately grace to the radiant galaxies, resembled an island of ice in the gloom and the illusion was not a little improved by the seething snow of the cleft and beaten waters about her like the boiling of the sea at the base of a berg. She showed us her weather side, and heeled so much that I could not see her decks, but there was nothing like a gun muzzle to be perceived along her. A gilt band under her wash streak shone out dully at intervals to her plunges, as though a pencil had been dipped in phosphorus and a line of fire drawn. She was looking up to cross our wake and settle herself upon our weather quarter. Nothing finer as a spectacle did I ever behold at sea than this spacious winged vessel when she crossed our wake, rearing and roaring through the smother our own keel was tossing up, flashing into the hollows and through the ridges with spray billowing aft over her, as though she were some bride of the ocean and streamed her veil behind her as she went, the whole figure of her showing faint in the dull light of the night, yet not so feeble in outline and detail, but that I could distinguish the black snake-like hull hissing through the seas, her sand-colored decks, a long black gun on the forecastle, and a glittering brass stern chaser abaft the two black figures gripping the tiller, the great surface of mainsail going pale to its clue at the boom end. A full fathom over the quarter, the swelling and mounting canvas, from flying jib to little fore royal, from the iron hard stay foresail to the thunderous gaff topsail on high dragging and tearing at the sheets and bringing shroud and backstay guy and hillard sheet and brace so taunt that the fabric raged past with a kind of shrieking music filling the air as though some giant harp were edging the blast with the resonance of fifty wind-wrung wires great heaven how did my heart go to her Oh, for two months' command of that storming clipper with Imogen on board. T'was a rush past with her, all that I saw I have told you, save a few men in the bows and a couple of figures watching us near the two helmsmen. If she mounted guns or swivels along her bulwarks, I did not see them. I overheard Vanderdecken exclaim, It is as I surmised. She hath but a handful of a crew. She merely wishes to speak us. Van Volgular returned some gruff answer in which he introduced my name, but that was all I heard of it. Once well on our quarter-deck, the schooner ported her helm, luffing close. Her gaff, topsail, flying jib, royal, and top-gallant sail melted into the hauling upon clue-lines and downhauls 
as though they had been of snow and had vanished upon the black damp wind but even with the tack of her mainsail up they had to keep shaking the breeze out of the small sail she showed to prevent her from sliding past us oh the ship ahoy sung out one of the two figures on the quarter-deck the man coming down to the lee rail to hail what sheep are you as with the centaur so now vanderdecken made no response to this inquiry he and the others stood grimly silent watching the schooner as immobile as graven images i said to imogen tis dark enough to show the phosphor upon the ship that should give them a hint mark how vividly the shining crawls about these decks the ship ahoy shouted the man from the schooner that lay to windward tossing her bows and shaking the spray off her like any chomping coverting steed angrily reined in and smoking his impatience through his nostrils what sheep are you vanderdecken stepped his towering figure on to the bulwark the brave he cried sending his majestic voice ringing like a note of thunder through the wind what is your country yelled the other vanderdecken did not apparently understand the question but probably assuming that these sea interrogatories followed in the usual manner answered from batavia to amsterdam speaking as the schooner's man did in english but with an accent as strongly dutch as the other's was french thought i he will see that we are a holland ship and as france and their high mightiness are on good terms he may sheer off but even as this fancy or hope crossed my mind a sudden order was shouted out on the schooner and in a breath the vessel's hatches began to vomit men they tumbled up in masses blackening the white decks and a gleam of arms went rippling among them captain vanderdecken i bawled that fellow is a pirate mine sir or she will be aboard of you in another minute and not stopping to heed the effect of my words i grasped imogen by the hand and ran with her off the poop get you to my cabin dearest they are pirates and will be tumbling in masses over the rail directly i pressed my lips to her cheek and she glided like a phantom down the hatch ladder what i relied on by advising her concealment i could not have explained since those who rummaged the vessel were pretty sure to enter the cabins but my instincts urging me to hide her away from the first spring of the men on to our deck i took their counsel as a sort of mysterious wisdom put into me by god for her protection it coming to this in short that there might be a chance of their overlooking her if she hid below whereas they were bound to see her if she remained on deck to be ravished by her beauty and supposing them pirates to carry her off as a part of their booty according to the custom of those horrid villains i stepped away from the hatch lest it might be supposed i was guarding it and stationed myself in the deep shadow under the quarter-deck ladder where it and the overhanging deck combined cast an ink-like shade there was small need to look for the schooner you could hear her hissing like red-hot iron through the water as she came sweeping down upon our quarter under a slightly ported helm ready to starboard for the heave of the grapnels and the foaming range alongside there was no show of consternation among the crew of the death ship nay if a motion of any sort were at all visible you would have termed it a mere kind of dull muddled dutch curiosity i had fancied they would jump to arm themselves and assume some posture of defence instead of this they had gathered themselves together in several lounging groups about the waist and gangway many of them with pipes in their mouths the fire of which glowed in bright red spots against the green and lambent glitterings upon such woodwork 
as form their background. And thus they hung, with never a monosyllable uttered among them. Their silence, their indifference, their combination of ghostly characteristics, with their substantial gloaming shapes, more terrifying to my mind than had every man of them a carbine pointing from his shoulder, with a crew forward as numerous again, standing match in hand at twenty murdering pieces. All in an instant the shadow of the schooner's canvas was in the air, deepening the gloom upon our decks with a midnight tincture. You heard the snarling wash of water boiling between the two vessels, the claws of the grapnels flung from the bows and stern of the Frenchman gripped our aged bulwark with a crunching sound, and the mystical fires in the wood burnt out to the biting iron like lighted tinder blown upon. Then, in a breath, I saw the heads of twenty or thirty fellows along the line of the bulwark rail, and as they sprang as monkeys might into our ship, one of them that grasped a pistol exploded it, and the yellow flash was like the swift waving of a torch, in the glare of which the faces of the silent, staring, indifferent sailors of the Brave glanced in a very nightmare of white, unholy countenances. There was some yelping and howling among the Frenchmen as they tumbled in board. Indeed, the seamen of that nation cannot budge an inch without making as much noise as would last a British forecastle several voyages. But their clamor sounded to me very much like the cries of men who did not relish their errand, and raised these shouts for the same reason that sets a boy whistling on a road in a very dark night. They jumped from the rail in slapdash style indeed, waving their cutlasses and flourishing their pikes. But whether it was that they were suddenly confounded by the silence on our decks, or that they had caught sight in the pistol flash of the faces of the death ship's crew, or that the suspicion of our true character, which must have been excited in them by the glow upon our hull, and by the ancient appearance of our spars, was quickly and in a panic way confirmed and developed by the glitterings upon our deck. The aspect of our ordnance, the antiquity suggested by the arrangement of our quarter-deck and poop, all these points visible enough in the wild, faint light that swarmed about the air, but all of them taking ghastly and bewildering eye and terrifying emphasis from the very dusk in which they were surveyed. Whatever the cause, tis as sure as that I live who write this, that instead of their making a scamper along the decks, charging the Dutch seamen, flinging themselves down the hatchways and the like, all of which was to have been expected, they suddenly came to a dead stand, even massing themselves in a body, and shoving and elbowing one another, for such courage, maybe, as is to be found in the feel of a fellow being's ribs, whilst they peered with eyes bright with alarm at the phlegmatic sailors of Vanderdecken, and around then at the ship, talking in fierce short whispers and pointing. It takes time to record the events of thirty seconds, though all that now happened might have been compassed while a man told that space. Twas as if the frosty, blighting curse of the ship they had dashed into had come upon their tongues and hearts and souls. Over the side where the grappling schooner lay, heaving with a cataractical roaring of water sounding out of the sea between as the flying Dutchman rolled ponderously towards her. Loud orders in French were being delivered, mixed with passionate callings to the boarders upon our decks. The schooner's sails waved like the dark pinions of some monstrous sea-fowl past ours, which still drew, no brace having been touched. I guessed that there were thirty in all that had leapt aboard, some of them negroes, 
all of them wildly attired in true buccaneering fashion, so far as the darkness suffered my eyes to see, in boots and sashes, and blouses and lolling caps. There they stood in a huddle of figures with the lightning-like twitching gleams shooting off their naked weapons as they pointed or swayed or feverishly moved, staring about them. Some gazed up at the poop, where, as I presently discovered, stood the giant figure of Vanderdecken, his mates, and the boatswain beside him, shapes of bronze motionlessly and silently watching. But the affrighting element, more terrible than the hellish glarings upon the planks, bulwarks, and masts, more scaring than the amazing suggestions to a sailor's eye of the old guns, the two boats, and all other such furniture as was to be embraced in that gloom, was the crowd of glimmering faces, the mechanic postures, the graveyard dumbness of the body of spectral mariners who surveyed the boarding party in clusters, shadowy and spirit-like. I felt the inspiration, and with the prang of heaven-directed sympathy with the terrors working in the Frenchmen's breasts, which needed but a cry to make them explode, I shouted from the blackness of my ambush, in a voice to which my sense of the stake the warning signified in its failure or success lent a hurricane note. Soyez-vous, soyez-vous, c'est le champ Holland volant. What manner of Paris speech this was, and with what accent delivered, I never paused to consider. The effect was as if a thunderbolt had fallen and burst among them. With one general roar of Holland volant, the whole mob of them fled to the side, many dropping their weapons, the better to scramble and jump. Why, you see that shout of mine exactly expressed their fears. It made the panic common, and t'was with something of a scream in their way of letting out the breath in their echoing of my shout that they vanished leaping like rats without looking to see what they should hit with their heads or tails. I sprang up the quarter-deck ladder to observe what followed, and beheld, sure enough, the towering outline of Vanderdecken standing at the rail that protected the forepart of the poop-deck, gazing down upon the schooner with his arms folded, and his attitude expressing a lifelessness not to be conveyed by the pen though the greatest of living artists in words ventured it. Against the side were the two mates and yawns, looking on at a scene to whose stir, clamor, excitement they seemed to oppose deaf ears and insensible eyes. Small wonder that the Frenchmen should have fled to my shout, fronted and backed as they were in that part of the ship into which they had leapt, and where they had come to an affrighted stand, by the grisly and sable shapes of Vanderdecken and his comrades aft, and by the groups of leprous tinctured anatomies forward. I peered over the rail. The two vessels lay grinding together, and as the tall fabric of the death ship leaned to the schooner, you thought she would crush and beat her down. But with the regularity of a pulse, the dark folds of water swept the little vessel clear, sometimes raising her when our ship lay aslant to the level of our upper deck, and giving me, therefore, a mighty good prospect of what was happening in her. Both vessels were off the wind, and were surging through it with a prodigious hissing betwixt their sides. The fright of the boarders had proved contagious. I shall never forget the sight. Small as the schooner was, there could not have been less than ninety men on her decks, and they made a very hell of the atmosphere about them with the raving notes and their cries and bawlings. My knowledge of French was small, but some of their screams I could follow, as, for instance, "'Tis the flying Dutchman! Cut us adrift! Cut us adrift! Flatten in those head-sheets! Shove her off! Shove her off! 
Pull her, my children, with a couple of sweeps. Now she starts. No! What holds her? Ha! Ha! The weather topsail brace has fouled the Hollander's foresail yard arm. No use going aloft. Let go of it, let go of it, that it may overhaul itself. Imagine about fourscore throats, some with the guttural thickness of the Negro's utterance, all together roaring and delivering orders such as those of which I have given you specimens. Figure the decks throbbing with men, rushing with apparent aimlessness from one side to the other, from one end to the other, not a vestige of discipline among them, a drowning yell or two coming up from between the ships, where some wretch that had fallen overboard was holding on, the sails shaking, the water washing beyond in a glaring white that gave a startling distinctness to the shape of the schooner as she rose softly to the level of our upper deck bulwarks upon the seething snow. No matter how strongly imagination should present the picture, what is the simulacrum as compared to that reality which I need but close these eyes to witness afresh? The wildness of the scene took a particular spirit from the frowning rocking mass of the death ship, the tomb-like silence in her, the still and gloaming shapes watching the throes and convulsions of the terrified Frenchmen and Negroes from the poop and forward over the rail, the diabolic glowing in her timbers, the swaying of her dusky canvas, like the nodding of leviathan funeral plumes, the dance of the slender slip of moon among the rigging, defining the vast platforms of the barricaded tops, monstrous bulgings of blackness up there, as though a body of electric cloud swung bulbously at each lower masthead. They had the sense to cut the lines which held them by their grapnels to our ship, and presently to my great joy, for if they were true pirates, as there was good reason to believe from their appearance and manner of laying us aboard, t'was impossible to feel sure that the fiercer spirits among them might not presently rally the rest. The schooner went scraping and forging past ahead of us, snapping her top gallant mast short off, with the royal yard upon it, by some bray stay or backstay fouling us in a way the darkness would not suffer me to witness. And in a few minutes she had crossed our bows, and was running away into the northeast, rapidly expanding her canvas as she went, and quickly melting into the darkness. I stopped to fetch a few breaths and to make sure of the Frenchman's evanishment by watching. More excitement and dread had been packed into this time than I know how to tell of. I slipped to the hatch on the upper deck, descended a tread or two, and softly called. In a minute I espied the white face of my dearest upturned to me amidst the well-like obscurity. "'They are gone,' said I. "'The danger is over.' She instantly stepped up. "'I heard you cry out, the flying Dutchman, save yourselves!' she exclaimed, with a music almost of merriment in her voice. It was a bold fancy. What helter-skelter followed! I took her hand, and we entered the cabin. The richly colored old lamp was alight. The clock ticked hoarsely. You heard the scraping of the parrot clawing about her cage. Oh, she cried, what a dismal place it is that they have given you to sleep in. I believed I was hardened to the dreadful flickerings upon the deck and sides, but they scared me to the heart in that cell, and the noise, too, in the hold. Oh, Geoffrey, how severe is our fate! Shall we ever escape? Yes, my dearest but not by ships, as I have all along told you. A chance will offer. And be you sure, Imogen, it will find me ready. Wondrous is God's ordering. Think, my dear, that in the very curse that rests upon this ship has lain our salvation. Suppose this vessel, any other craft, and boarded by those villains, Negroes of the Antilles, and white ruffians red-handed from the Spanish main. Tis likely they were so, and are cruising here for the rich traders. By this time where would my soul be? 
and you ay there is virtue in this curse it is a monstrous thought but indeed i could take vanderdecken by the hand for the impiety that has carried you clear of a destiny as awful in its way as the doom these unhappy wretches are immortally facing she shuddered and wept a little and looked at me with eyes the brighter for those tears which i dared not kiss away in that public cabin End of chapter thirteen. Chapter thirty eight of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit. LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 38 My Life is Again Attempted. Vanderdecken and the mate came below soon after this, and Prince set a bowl of punch before them. The captain seated himself in his solemn way, and the mate took Imogene's place, that is, over against my seat, she being at my side. They filled their pipes and smoked in a silence that, saving Vanderdecken's asking me to drink, would, I believe, have remained unbroken but for Imogene. She said, "'Captain, there is no fear, I hope, of those pirates attempting to board us again in the darkness.' "'Did hear Fenton tell you they were pirates?' he replied, with the unsmiling softness of expression he was used to look upon her with. "'Surely they were pirates!' she cried. "'Be it so, my child,' said he. "'What doth it signify? They are gone. I do not fear they will return.' Being extremely curious to know what sense he had of this strange adventure, I exclaimed, "'It is very surprising, mynheer, that a score of ruffians, armed to the teeth, should fling themselves into this ship for no other purpose, seemingly, than to leap out of her again.' "'They imagined us English here, Fenton,' said Van Vogelaar, with a snarl in his voice and a sneer on his lip. I did not instantly catch the drift of his sarcasm. "'Doth any man suppose,' said Vanderdecken, rearing his great figure and proudly surveying me, "'that the guns of our admirals have thundered in vain? You seek an interpretation of the Frenchman's behavior. Surely, by this time, all Englishmen should understand the greatness of the terror our flag everywhere strikes. Twice you have witnessed this, in the hasty retreat of your man-of-war, and this night in the conduct of the French schooner. Tell me, he cried, with new fires leaping into his eyes, how am I to resolve the panic terror of the boarding party, if I am not to believe that, until they were on our decks, had looked round them and beheld our men, they knew not for certain the nation to which the Brava belonged. I bowed very gravely as I acquiesced. Skipper, cried Van Vogelaar, is it not likely that they imagined us English? They showed no fear till our country spoke in the faces of our sailors. A faint smile of scorn curled the lips of Imogene, but the contempt of her English heart quickly faded into an expression of compassion and sadness when she let her eyes travel from the sinister and ugly mate to the majestic countenance of the commander. But no more was said. The two men puffed at their pipes and sipped at their silver mugs in silence, and at long intervals only did Imogene and I exchange a word. The girl withdrew to her cabin at about half an hour after nine. Vanderdecken went on deck, and I sat alone smoking, thinking of the surprising events of the evening scheming how to escape, and making my heart very heavy with a passionate hopeless yearning for the time to come, when, secure upon the soil of our beloved land, I should be calling the delicate, lovely, lonely girl, the amber-haired fairy of this death-ship, my own. The slow, rusty, saw-like ticking of the ancient clock was an extremely melancholy noise, and I abhorred its chimes, too not because of the sound, that was very sonorously melodious, 
but because it startled the parrot into its ugly hobgoblin croak. It was a detestable exclamation to salute the ears of a man whose thoughts ran in the very strain of that coarse, contaminatory confirmation of them. The ancient salt and weedy smell of the ship, a distinguishable thing in the afterpart, if it was somewhat mitigated forward by the greasy smoke and steam of the cookhouse, lent a peculiar accentuation of the various shinings of the lamp, in whose many-colored radiance some of the dusky oval-framed paintings loomed out red, others green, the ponderous beams of the upper deck blue, the captain's tall, velvet-backed chair yellow, and so on. All these tints blending into a faint, unearthly atmosphere as they stole dying to the bulkhead of the stateroom, behind whose larboard door my love lay sleeping. I was glad to quit the place, and went on deck. There was nothing to be seen, saving the foam that flashed near and crawled afar, the glitter of the low-lying stars like the sparkle of torches on ships dipping upon the horizon, a sullen movement of dark clouds on high and the moon red as an angry scar upcurled over the western horizon. Twas on a sudden I noticed that we were making a fair wind of the breeze. Yes, on looking aloft, I perceived that the yards were braced in, lying so as to show the wind to be blowing about one point abaft the beam. It was strange that in the cabin I had not heard any noise to denote that the men were trimming sail no sound of rope flung down in coils, no rusty cheeping cry from the aged blocks, no squeak of truss or peril or tread of foot. That was, maybe, because the men had fallen dumbly, as usual, to the job of hauling and pulling, so that my attention had not been drawn to such noises as were raised. Be this as it may, for the first time since I had been in the ship the wind had come fair but the situation of the cross I guessed she was being headed about west-northwest, which would carry us to Agullus and also into the Ethiopic Sea. For a little bit I was sensible of a degree of excitement. There had come a break. It was no longer a hopeless ratching to the north, than a bleak, slanting drift into the mighty solitude of the south. The ship was going home. But with that thought my spirit sank home? What home had she but these wild, wide waters? What other lot than the gentle cradling or tempestuous smiting of these surges, the crying of the winds of the southern ocean in her rigging, the desolate scream of the lonely seabird in her wake, the white sunshine of the blue heavens, the leaven brand of the electric storm, the midnight veil of the black hurricane? the wide, snow-like light of the northern moon, over and over again. No, I was mortal, at least, with the plain understanding of a healthy man, and was not to be cheated by a flowing sheet as though mine, too, was the unholy immortality with its human yearnings and earthly labors of the men who manned this death-ship. The change was but one of the deceits of their heavy sentence, and with an inward prayer that for me and my precious one it might work out some profitable issue, I went to my cabin. The door hung on a hook that held it open by the length of a finger. Outside swung the lamp that sent light sufficient to me through the interstice. At midnight this lamp was borne away by Prinz, whose final duty before going to his sleeping place lay in this. It was a regular custom and whenever it happened that I stayed on deck beyond midnight, then I had to turn in as best I could in the dark. Yet dark I could not turn my cabin at night, t'was rather darkness visible, as Milton hath it, for though the glowing crawlings yielded no radiance, no, no more than a mirrored star shining out of the wet blackness of a well, yet such objects as intercepted it it revealed as a suspended coat, for instance, that, hanging against the bulkhead, had its figure limbed against the phosphor, as though twas blotted there in ink, very faithful in outline. There was enough in the events of the evening to keep my brain occupied and my eyes open, and I lay thus for some half-hour, 
thinking and watching the unnatural lights, and wondering why they should be there, since I had never beheld the like glowing in the most ancient marine structure I had ever visited, when on a sudden I was sensible of someone standing outside the cabin door and listening as it appeared. It was a peculiar, regular breathing sound that gave me to know this, a respiration as rhythmic as that of a sleeping man whose slumber is peaceful. An instant after I heard the click of the hook of the door lightly lifted out of the stable, but all so quietly that the noise would have been inaudible amid the straining of the rocking vessel if my attention had not been rendered piercing by that solemn and strong breathing, rising very plainly above the sounds in the hold. I sprang onto the deck. Being in my socks, I fell on my feet noiselessly. Against the greenish glitterings about the cabin I easily made out the figure of a man, standing within the door, holding it in a posture of eager listening. My breath grew thick and short. The horror of this situation is not to be conceived. It was not as though I were in an earthly ship, for in that case, no matter who the midnight intruder, he would have had a mortal throat for my fingers to close upon. But whoever this shape might be, he belonged to the death ship, and t'was frightful to see his outline, black as the atmosphere of a churchyard grave, thrown out in its posture of watching and listening, by the fiery, writhing fibrins of the phosphor, to know that the deep and hollow breathing came from a figure in whom life was a monstrous simulation, to feel that his confrontment by an Hercules or a Goliath would as little quail his endeviled spirit as the dead are to be terrified by the menaces of the living. I watched with half-suffocated respiration. Since his outline was plain, it was sure mine was so likewise, but I could not distinguish that he was looking towards the place where I stood, that is, in the middle of the after bulkhead, a couple of paces from the foot of the bed, whither I had backed on his entering. He very softly closed the door, on which I drew myself up, waiting for the onslaught I was certain he designed, though when I considered what thing it was I should be dealing with, the sense of my helplessness came very near to breaking me down. Having closed the door, he approached the bed, and bent his head down as though listening. Then, with amazing swiftness, stabbed at the bed four times each blow with the vehemence of it making a distinct sound, after which he hung over the bed with his arm uplifted and his head bent as though he would make sure by listening that he had dispatched me. His figure was so plain that it was as if you should cut out the shape of a man in black paper and paste it upon a dull yellow ground. From the upraised hand I could distinguish the projection of a knife or small sword not less than a foot long. He was not apparently easily satisfied that I lay dead, for he kept his menacing, hearkening posture while I could have counted sixty. He then went lightly to the door, opened it, and passed out. Whether he walked in his sleep, and certainly his motions were those of a somnambulist, or whether he was influenced by some condition of his doom, of a character as unconjecturable as the manner in which vitality was preserved among the crew, who were years and years ago dead in time, I could not conceive. But resolved to discover him if I could, I followed on his heels, catching the door as it swung from his grasp. But there was no need to close it, nor slip a foot beyond the combing, for the glimmer all about serving my sight, I saw him enter the cabin opposite that in which Van Vogelaar slept, whereby I knew who it was that would have assassinated me that night had I slept when I lay down. You will easily credit that this man had murdered sleep so far as I was concerned. I would not go on deck, and I would not lie down either, for what I had beheld had so wrought in my imagination that the mere idea of resting upon the holes which the villain's blade had made in the aged mattress filled me with horror. So, for the rest of the night, I walked about the cabin or rested on the edge of the bed, praying for daylight, and repeatedly commending myself to God. 
for this being the second time my life had been attempted by the same hand, I could not question, if it was the will of heaven, this hideous cruise should be prolonged, the third venture would be successful, and in the dreadful loneliness and luminous blackness of that cabin I viewed myself as a dead man, and could have wept with rage and grief when thinking of my helplessness and of Imogene's fate. I brought a haggard face with me to the breakfast-table, and Imogene surveyed me with an eye full of inquiry and anxiety. My thoughts, acting with my wakefulness, had told, and I fancied that even Vanderdecken suffered his gaze to rest upon me as though he marked a change. Van Vogelaar's manner satisfied me that he had acted in his sleep, or under some spell that stupefied the understanding whilst it gave the spirit full play, for he discovered nothing of that wonder and terror which had been visible in him when I entered the cabin after his former attempt to destroy me which certainly had not been the case when he quitted my bedside in the belief that I was dead of my wounds. Vanderdecken talked of the fair wind. A sort of satisfaction illuminated his sombre austerity. Though his dignity was prodigious, and his commanding manner full of an haughty and forbidding sternness, he was nevertheless politer to me than he had ever yet been, going to the length of talking about the food on the table the excellent quality of the African guinea-fowl and bustard, recommending me to taste of a dish of marmalade, and relating a story of a privateer having left behind him, in a ship he had clapped aboard of, a number of boxes which seemed to be full of marmalade, but which in reality were loaded with virgin silver. But it was the fair wind that produced this civility, though, after last night's business, "'twas welcome enough let the cause be what it would. "'No sooner had Imogene and I a chance of speaking alone "'than she asked me what was the matter. "'I told her how Van Vogelaar had entered my cabin "'and stabbed at my bed. "'She turned white. "'Her beautiful eyes grew large and bright with terror. "'She clasped her hands and for some moments could not speak. "'Her agitation diminished, however, when she understood that Van Vogelaar walked in his sleep, though she was still very white when she cried, "'If you had been sleeping when he entered, you would now be dead.' I answered, "'What he does in his sleep he may do awake. This action is like the whisper of a dreamer, babbling out his conscience. It is in his soul to kill me, and long thinking upon it has moved him to the deed in his sleep.' Oh, Geoffrey, did I not beg you to secure your door? Ay, that shall be looked to in the future, I warrant you. But why should this man, of all the others, especially thirst for my life? How have I wronged him? She replied by pointing out that the crew of my ship had fired upon him, also that in the days of his natural life he was no doubt a villain at heart, and that all the features of his devilish nature attended him through his doom, that being more jealous, rapacious, and avaricious than the others, he might regard my presence as a menace to his share of the treasure, and hunger after my destruction, so that, come what might, I should never be able to report the wealth that lay in the ship's hold. There was no doubt my darling was right impossible, as I found it, to reconcile these earthly and human passions and motives with his supernatural being, and particularly the indifference he exhibited on the previous evening, when the Frenchman came running us aboard, with his concern for his share in the gold, jewels, and plate below. But I had long abandoned all speculation concerning what I must term the intellectual aspect of these miserable creatures. You will suppose that we found a fruitful text in this mate's somnambulistic attack upon me, and that we talked at great length about our chances of escape, and the necessity Van Vogelaar's malignant hate put me under of inventing some method to deliver ourselves by, be the risks of it what they might. Yet it was but talk. Indeed, never did prisoner's outlook appear more hopeless. Compared to this floating jail, Compassed about by the mighty sea, the walls of a citadel were as paper, the bars of a dungeon's window as pack-thread. But the most bitter and invincible barrier of all was Cap.
Chapter 39 of The Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death Ship by William Clark Russell. Chapter 39 A Tempest Bursts Upon Us. I did not, as I had told Imogene, need a second hint to secure my life by night, however it might fall out with me in the day. By looking about, I met with a piece of ratline stuff which I hid in my cabin, and when the night came I secured one end to the hook of the door, passing the other end through the staple and then making it fast to my wrist, so that, the door being shut, no one could enter without tweaking or straining my arm with such violence as was sure to awake me. Meanwhile the fair wind hung very steady, blowing about south, a pleasant breeze that yielded a pure blue sky and small puff-shaped clouds exceedingly white. The sea was also of a very lovely sapphire, twinkling and sparkling in the north, like a sheet of silver cloth set a-trembling. The brava stole along softly, with but little seething and hissing noises about her now that her yards lay braced well in. I would think whilst I watched her flowing sheets, the long bosoms of her canvas swelling forwards with the slack bolt-ropes arched like a bow, and the mizzen rounding from its lanteen-yard, backed by the skeleton remains of the great poop-lantern, that she needed but the bravery of fresh paint, a new ancient, pennons and streamers, bright petereros or swivels, glass for the lanterns and gilt for her galleries and beak, to render her as picturesque and romantic a vessel as ever sailed in that mighty procession, in whose van streamed the triumphant insignia of the great Spanish, Dutch, and Portuguese admirals. T'was impossible to doubt that every man in the ship believed that he was going home this time. There was an air of alacrity in them that had never before been noticeable. They would look eagerly seawards over the bows, gazing thus for long minutes at a time. Whenever the log was hove, I'd mark one or more inquire the speed of the men who had held the reel or dragged in the line, as they went forward. They smoked incessantly, with an air of dull and heavy satisfaction in their faces. I observed a lifting, so to speak, of the stupor off Vanderdecken. His trances, I mean those sudden fits of death-like insensibility which I can only liken to cataleptic attacks, were few, whence I concluded that his spirit, or whatever might be the nature of the essence that owned his great and majestic frame for a tabernacle, had gathered an increase of vitality from the invigorated hope and brisk desires which the fair wind had raised. In Van Vogelaar I witnessed no change. Possibly the dark shadows of my fears being on him held him gloomy and malignant to my sight. Likewise I was careful to keep a wide space between us, save at meals, and never to have my back upon him, for to be sure, if I was to be murdered by the rogue, it should not be for the want of a bright lookout on my part. This state of things continued for three days. A powerful current runs to the westward in these seas, and, adding its impulse to our progress, I calculated that in those seventy-two hours we made not less than an hundred and thirty-three leagues. As time passed, my wonder increased, for, though I knew not our position, and never durst ask Vanderdecken what situation his dead reckoning assigned us, I could not conceive, recollecting the place in which the Saracen was when we sighted the death-ship, that we had been blown, during the time I had been on board, into a very remote sea, and hence t'was reasonable that I should think it wanted but a few days sailing after this pattern to carry us round the Cape. Therefore, I say, my wonder grew, for whilst it was impious to suppose that the devil could contrive that this ship should outwit the sentence, yet our steady progress caused me to waver in my faith in the stern assurance of the vessel's doom. I would say to Imogene, The breeze holds, 
see how steady is the look of the southern sky. Is it possible that this wind will carry her round? To which she would answer, No, the change will come. Oh, Geoffrey, it will come, though no more than the ship's length lay between her and the limit which you believe the curse has marked out for her upon this sea. Then I would agree with her. But afterwards, coming on deck in the afternoon or next morning, and finding the death ship pushing along, her head pointing northwest, her sails full, the wake sliding away astern in a satin smoothness, wonder and doubt would again possess me, and twenty-odd fancies occur, such as, Suppose the sentence has been remitted. Suppose it be the will of heaven this ship should return to Amsterdam, that a final expiation of Vanderdecken's wrongdoing might be accomplished in his and his miserable crew's beholding with their own eyes the extinction of those houses they had yearned for, and the tombs, if aught of memorial in that way remain, of those hearts whose beating they hoped to feel upon their own. Such thoughts would set me talking to Imogene. Conceive of this ship's arrival in Texel. What consternation! What astonishment would she arouse! What mighty crowds would flock to view her! And in the hurry and ardency of my imagination I would go on figuring the looks and behavior of the people as our ghastly crew stepped ashore, asking one and another after their wives and children, those Alidas, Gertrudas, Titias, Emilies, Cornelias, Johannas, Fedoras, Angelinas, and Christinas, and those Antonies, Hendricks, Jans, Charts, Ludwigs, Abrahams, Willems, Peters, and Fredericks, whose very memory, let alone their dust, was as utterly gone as the ashes in any pipe forward there, when the fire had been tapped out of the bowl overboard. During the night of the third day the wind held steadily. I left the deck a little before midnight having passed some hours of the darkness in the company of my love, and our sails were then full with the prosperous wind, the ship passing along over the quiet sea in a great shadow, the stars very piercing, and the light of their colors sharp and lovely. But on coming from my cabin next morning I found the breeze gone, the ship was rolling upon a swell coming with some power from the westwards, and the dead cloths of the canvas striking a small thunder into the motionless air as they beat against the masts with the weary, monotonous swaying of those spars. The change had come. The swell was full of foreboding. It was as my heart had foreseen, spite of the wonder and inventions of my imagination. But nevertheless, the perception of that polished sea heaving into the dimness of the distant sky, the sight of the deadness of the calm that had slewed the death-ship till her sprit topsail veiled and disclosed the oozing sun as she bowed with her beak pointing into the east, brought a disappointment that sickened me to the soul. "'Great God!' I cried within myself. "'Is this the experience to end only with my death?' and I entered the cabin in so melancholy a mood that I could scarce hold up my head for the heaviness in my eyes and brain. Imogene was alone. I kissed her hand and fondled it. She instantly observed my depression and said gently, I feared this calm would dishearten you. But it was inevitable, dear. It was impossible a change of some kind should be delayed. Yes, but it breaks me down to think of another long, soul-starving, stormy drive into the southeast, another terrible spell of Vanderdecken's savage manners, of Van Vogelaar's murderous attempts, and of the hopelessness afterwards. Oh, my love, the hopelessness afterwards, when the weather breaks and the wind blows fair again, will it never end? She cast her eyes down with a swift motion of her finger to her lips. I turned as Venderdecken approached. The darkness of his inward rage lay heavy upon the folds of his brow. Tis no exaggeration to apply to his appearance the strong words of Beaumont. 
there are a thousand furies in his looks, and in his deadly silence more loud horror than when in hell the tortured and tormentor contend whose shrieks are greatest. He came without speaking to his chair, turning his fiery eyes from Imogene to me without saluting us. A moment after, Van Vogelaar arrived. We took our places, but none spoke. One sidelong look the mate darted at me under his parchment-colored lids, and malice and hate were strong in it. I could see that Imogene was awed and terrified by the captain's manner. You dreaded to hear him speak. His stillness was that of a slowly ripening tempest, and his sultry, forbidding, darkening bearing seemed to thicken the very atmosphere about him till you drew your breath with labor. He drank a silver cupful of wine, but ate nothing. The mate, on the other hand, plied his knife and fork with a surly hardiness. For my part, I felt as though a mouthful must choke me. Yet I made out to eat, that these men should not think I was afraid. I believe Imogene would have gone to her cabin, but for her anxiety to support and encourage me, so to say, by her presence. "'What horrible curse do we carry in this ship?' presently exclaimed Vanderdecken, speaking with a hoarse muttering that had no note of the familiar melodious richness. "'That all the winds which might blow us westwards die before the meridian of Agullus is reached. What is there in these masts to poison the breeze? Do we spread sails woven in the devil's loom? Have we a Jonah among us?' "'Skipper!' cried Van Vogelaar. Is it here Fenton, think you? Measure the luck he carries by what hath happened since he has been in this ship. Six days of storm. He held up his fingers with a furious gesture. Twice, in a few hours, have our lives, our treasure, our ship been imperiled. Note now, this westerly swirl, this stagnant atmosphere, and a dimness in the west, that will have grown into storm and wind ere the afternoon watch be ended. "'He speaks to my prejudice,' I exclaimed, addressing Vanderdecken. "'Let him be candid. His tongue is injurious to the Hollander's love of honour. Mine here, consider. He talks of the six days of storm. That weather had been brewed before my ship sighted yours. Of the English man-of-war and the French pirate?' Why not of the wreck that yielded you a bountiful store of needful things? He knows, as you do, Heer Vanderdecken, that Englishmen, least of all English mariners, are not among those who practice sorcery. The change is the concern of that being who has yet to judge this man. If he charges me with the control of the elements, then, by the majesty of heavens, he basely lies even in his rash and impious effort to do me a weak and erring mortal honour. With which I turned upon the villain and stared at him with eyes fuller of more potent fury flashed into them by the rage of my healthy, earthly manhood than could possibly possess him out of that dusty sepulchre of his body which lived by the curse alone. He shrunk away from me, looking at his skipper. "'Captain Vanderdecken,' broke in the sweet voice of Imogene, "'you will not let Heer Van Vogelaar's intemperate accusations influence your love of justice. Heer Fenton is not accountable for this calm. Tis monstrous to suppose it. Charge me sooner with witchcraft. I have been longer in this ship than he. In that time you have met many adverse winds. And if his being an Englishman is his wrong—' Hold me also answerable for the failure of your hopes, since I am English too. He looked at her, then at me, then back to her, and methought her beauty colored the stormy cloud of his expression with a light of its own, not softening it, but robbing it somewhat of its terror. He moved his lips, talking to himself, folded his arms, and leaned back, staring straight up at the deck. I fancied by saying more yet I could mend my case, and would not meet Imogene's eye for fear of being checked. Captain Vanderdecken, 
I am here as a shipwrecked man, dependent upon your generosity as a fellow being, of which you have given me so abundant an illustration that my heart sinks when I consider that I am too poor to make you any return saving in thanks. Had I tenfold the powers your maid imputes to me, could I work you evil? Give me control of the wind, and such a gale would follow this ship that you should be speedily counting the date of your arrival at Amsterdam in hours. Is it reasonable that I should seek to delay this voyage? I, who have but these clothes in which I stand, who am divorced from my home, who am helpless and defenseless among the enemies of my country, among men from whom I should have nothing to hope if they had not long given the world to know that their generosity as foes is alone equalled by their heroism as mariners. He had slowly turned his eyes upon me when I began to speak, and now made a haughty gesture with his hand as if bidding me hold my peace. And perhaps my conscience felt the rebuke, though he merely designed to let me know that I had said enough, for between ourselves— I had as little opinion of Dutch generosity as I had of Dutch valor, and should have despised myself for this flattering had I been talking to human beings. Happily nothing more came of the tempest that lay muzzled in the captain's breast. Whether my standing up for myself, my heated manner towards his mate, gave a new turn to his mood, he did not speak again of the change of weather, and as speedily as ceremony would permit, I got up made my bow, and went on deck. The appearance in the west was sullen enough, though merely with a faintness there that was unrelieved by any edging or shouldering outline of cloud. A few patches of vapor lay streaked along the sky. Otherwise the heavens hovered in an unstained hollow, but of a faded, watery blue, unwholesome and with a sort of blindness of fog in it and up in the northeast hung the sun, shorn of his rays, a squeezed yet uncompacted mass of dazzle, like as I have seen him show when setting in a belt of vapor that has not entirely hid him, and casting a wake as dim as burning oil. The swell had grown in weight even while we were breaking our fast. There being not the faintest draft of air to steady the vessel— no, not so much as to put the most delicate curl of shadow upon the heads of the muddy blue, grease-smooth, liquid roundings which came with a sulky brimming to the channels. She rolled with stupid heaviness, her sails rattling like a discharge from great ordnance, and a sort of song-like cries twanging out from the sharp, fierce strains put upon the shrouds and backstays, and many noises in her hold. You would have thought that her huge round tops and heavy furniture of spar and rigging would have given some regularity to her pendulous swaying. But the contrary was the case, her action being so jerky, abrupt, and unforgatherable by the legs that walking was impossible. I passed the morning partly on deck, partly in the cabin, nearly all the while in Imogene society. Vanderdecken's passionate mood being too vehement to suffer him to notice either me or my dearest. Indeed, I sought the cabin chiefly to remove myself from his sight, for as the weather darkened round his wrath mounted with it, visible in his tempestuous stridings, and above all in the flaming and cursing eyes he would again and again level at the heavens. And I sometimes felt that Nothing less than my life might be the forfeit if my even provoking his regard and constraining his attention to me in his present satanic posture of mind. When the dinner hour came, he fiercely ordered Prince to bring him some drink on deck. He could not eat. All the morning he had been directing his gaze into the south and north and east for any blur of the polished folds that should exhibit movement in the air in those quarters and from the undulating sea-line, which he searched in vain, his eyes seemed to reel with the very sickness of wrath into the west, where, as I knew, the curse was busy. Imogene and I were as mute as images at table. We had agreed not to utter a syllable whilst the mate was present. 
and some time before he had finished his meal we left the cabin for the quarter-deck, where we sat hidden from Vanderdecken, who marched about the poop near the tiller, with a tread whose echo rang through the solid deck, and with a mien that made me ready to witness him at any minute repeat, waking and sensible, the horrid, blasphemous part he had performed in his sleep. The faintness in the west deepened into thickness. The atmosphere grew hot, and the fanning of the canvas that had before filled the decks with chilling draughts became a refreshment. By two o'clock in the afternoon the heads and shoulders of ponderous storm-clouds had shaped themselves above the dingy, bluish obscurity in the west. They jutted up with a ghastly sheen of sickly bronze upon their peaks and brows, and made a very frightful appearance. You would have thought there was a great motionless fold of heat suspended, viewless, in the middle of the heavens, and that it was magnetically drawing up volumes of black fumes from some pestilential land lying hidden behind the sea. The strange light, rusty with the ominous storm-tinge, made the sea appear round and hard, shading the eye with the elusive complexion, till the eastern sea-line looked thirty leagues distant and not closer westwards either, in spite of its fading out in a jumble of ugly shadow that way. The sky still had a dirty sort of blue where the sun went out behind it, and I tell you was scaring to find him sunk out of sight in a kind of ether, whose hue, deceptive as it was, caused it to look clear enough for him to float in. It was in its way a sheer drowning of the luminary, like the foundering of a flaming fabric in the sea. The gloom stole gradually into darkness, as though some giant hand was warily drawing a sable curtain over our mastheads. Never did I watch the growth of a storm with such awe as now filled me. To my alarmed sight the gathering seemed like an embodiment of the curse in dreadful, swelling, livid vapors, whose dull, hectic, whose sallow bronze glaring out of the murkiness showed like the overflowing of the blue and scarlet and sunlight fires pent up in those teeming, surcharged bosoms. My plain sense assured me that the tempest could not hold for this death-ship the menace that would render its aspect terrifying to the mariner on board an earthly craft, yet it was impossible for my instincts as a seaman to accommodate themselves to the supernatural conditions which begirt me and I found myself trembling for the safety of the ship when I discovered that the tempest was suffered to grow without an order being given to the men to shorten sail and prepare for it. I left Imogene and stepped furtively along the quarter-deck to command the poop, and saw Vanderdecken standing aft, surveying the storm with his arms folded, his chin depressed, and his face staring out ashenly against the gloom. I watched him for some minutes, but never once did he stir. Arents and Van Vogelaar were on the other side of the deck, leaning over the rail, gazing at God knows what, but never speaking, as I could be sure in the silence that rested upon the ship. The men hung about in groups forward, mere cunningly devised shapes of human beings without the faintest stir of restlessness among them. Many of them smoked, and the pale wreaths went from their paler lips into the air straight as staffs. "'Imogene, look at that sky,' I whispered. "'Did mortal ever behold the like of it?' "'Twas two o'clock, a tempest-colored twilight, in which the sails to the flattened swell swayed like visionary wings grown languid with the long flight, and feebly hovering and almost noiselessly beating over the ship. Out of the gloom over the side came now and again the yearning moan of water, foamlessly laving the bends and run of the vessel. In each death-like pause you heard the silence tingling in the air, with the low, phantasmal muttering of a weltering sea, a sound as of an imagination of unreal breakers upon a fairy shore. With hands clasped upon my arm, my darling looked as I pointed. In the extreme west the shade of the heavens was a sort of dismal slate, and there was an incessant winking of lightning all about it, like a mad dancing of stars of piercing brilliance. 
this enlarged into dense masses of dark vapor, streaked as sand is ribbed by the action of surf. Then zenithwards was a space of faint green sky, very dim as though beheld through smoke, and past this lay a floating body of thin vapor thickening over our mastheads into an amazing appearance of clouds like to the bush that shags the New Holland slopes, merging eastwards into a vast array of clouds twisted into the aspect of whirlpools, and in their brooding motionlessness resembling vortices suddenly arrested when most madly gyrating. But this description, though imitated to the life, conveys not the least idea of the horrid appearance of that sky, for there is nothing in words to express the effect upon the mind of the contrast of the several shades of color, all combining to fill the sea with a malignant hue, and the keen throbbing of the lightning low down, the washing sweep of the sick and ghastly ocean into the western dusk, the stooping soot of the vaporous maelstroms overhead, only waiting, as it seemed, for some storm signal to start off every one of them into a very madness of revolution, boiling out into wet and crimsoned tempests. After a little, all these appearances melted into one great cloud of an indigo tint, ridged with layers of vapor and blackening into very midnight on the western seaboard where the lightning was shooting. The sea had strangely flattened. The weighty swells which had precursed the growth of the storm had run away down the eastern waters. It was as though the hot heaviness of the rising and spreading blackness had pressed down the ocean into a smooth plain. As not an order had yet been given, not a clue-line nor a halyard touched, I had made up my mind to presently behold an astonishing exhibition of magic. That is to say, I was to witness a sudden violent blast of a storm strike this death-ship with every sail she carried aboard, and no harm to come to her from it. All at once there was a great stroke of lightning that flashed up the heavy, oppressive obscurity, and the whole ship leapt to the eye in a blaze of emerald fire. There fell a few huge drops of rain, covering the decks with circles as big as saucers. A sullen shock of thunder boomed in a single report out of the west. And then it was that the voice of Vanderdecken rang out like a vibratory echo of the deep storm-note that had died away. "'Crew up the topsails and top-gallant sails! In spritsail and get the yard fore and aft! Some hands this way and stow the mizzen! Lower the main-yard and furl the sail!' Stand by to double-reef the forecourse. These and other orders he delivered one by one, and they were repeated by the two mates and the boatswain. I cannot believe that any fantastic vision was ever wilder, stranger, more impressive than the picture offered by the death-ship when her men went to work to snug her down. Their mechanically moving shapes hauling up the ropes, running like shadows along the decks, vanishing in the sullen, swarming thickness as they mounted the shrouds, every man as silent as a spectre, the fitful trembling out of the whole vessel to the white and green and violet glimmer of the yet distant lightning. The dark sea dimly glancing into a kind of light, wan and indeterminable as the sheen of stars in polished steel under the play of those western glitterings. The blackness overhead now settled down to the eastern seaboard, over the horizon of which there yet hovered a streak of dusty green. It was a spectacle to need the hand of Dante or Milton. Compared to these storms, death is but a qualm. Hell somewhat lightsome, the Bermuda's calm. Darkness, light's eldest brother, his birthright, claims o'er the world. It was black as night. What the men were about, with what dispatch they worked, it was impossible to see. No songs or cries came from them to enable me to guess their movements. If ever Imogene and I exchanged a word, it was in a whisper, so heart-subduing was the darkness and the horrible element of suspense and uncertainty in it. I had her close to the cabin front under the poop, 
ready for the shelter of it at the outburst. Ten minutes went by, and then it seemed to me as if a deeper shade yet had penetrated the darkness. Suddenly I heard a far-off humming noise, a kind of growling sound, not to be likened to thunder, though you seemed to catch the note of that too in the multitudinous crying. It was as if the denizens of a thousand forests were flying before the roaring of a tornado among the trees, every savage beast raising its own savage cry as it went, the whole uproar so remote as to resemble a mountain's reverberation of the horrible clamor leagues and leagues distant inland. "'What is that?' cried Imogene. Ere I could speak, the heavens were split in twain by a blast of lightning that looked to fly like a dazzling shaft of flame from the north, sheer over our mastheads into the south. It was almost instantly followed by a crash of thunder, ear-splitting as the explosion of the batteries of a dozen first-rates all discharged at one moment. And then fell the rain in a whole body of water, charged with hailstones as big as pigeons' eggs. The fall raised such an uproar on our decks that you looked to see the whole substantial fabric shattered by it. The surface of the sea foamed in fire to that lashing of water and hail. There was now a perpetual blaze of lightning, but the thunder merely deepened the prodigious noise of the rushing wet without, its claps being distinguishable in the dreadful tumult. We had immediately withdrawn to the cabin, and closing the door, stood looking on through the window. The decks were full of water, which, cascading through the ports and all other freeing orifices, added its roaring to the other notes of the tempest. The ship seemed on fire to as high as we could see with the hellish and continual flaming of the lightning. Twas of several colors, and in the same breath you saw spars, rigging, bulwark rails, all blazing out as though lumined with brushes dipped in blue and crimson, and star-white and yellow and dark violet fires. But no wind as yet, not a breath. That I could tell by the droop of the forecourse hanging by its gear, and faintly fanning dark and wet from its yard. But I knew it could not be far off. Those sounds I had heard as of a thousand affrighted wild beasts were— my ear well knew the noise, the echoings high in the middle air of a prodigious wind bellowing as it swept the ocean into white rage. My heart beat swiftly. All was so fearfully real that I could not grasp the supernatural conditions of the life of this ship and crew, which had otherwise assured me that the curse that triumphed over the monarch death must be superior to the wildest hurricane that ever piled the ocean into mountains. "'Hark!' I exclaimed. "'It is upon us!' And as I spoke, the gale smote us like a bolt from heaven, falling upon us with a long and frightful scream, and amid a volley of lightning that made the sky a blinding purple dazzle from sea-line to sea-line. I held with both hands to one side of the frame of the window and Imogene, half swooning with terror, lay against me, nothing but my body saving her from being dashed against the side of the cabin. Such was the sharpness of the angle to which the first frenzy of the liberated hurricane healed the vessel, that for some minutes I veritably believed she was foundering. The ocean boiled in a flat plain of froth, and the ship lay steady upon the enraged whiteness, with the rail of her bulwarks under, and you heard amid the seething and shrill shrieking of the wind the sound of the water pouring onto her decks over the upper and quarter-deck and forecastle rails as the cataract thunders coiling with a pure head over the edge of some rocky abrupt if i had opened the door if indeed i could have taken action on that violent headlong steep of deck it would have merely been to drown the cabin and imogene and myself there was nothing to be done but attend the issue, and for several minutes, I say, I stood holding on, my dearest clasping me and so supporting herself, scarce knowing whether the vessel was under water or not, unable to speak for the horrible clamor without, the lightning continuously holding the fabric visible through the window in its many-colored blaze, 
and the enduring steadiness of the hull upon the flat foam putting a terror into the situation you would not have remarked in her laboring in a hollow sea. Presently, to my great joy, I perceived that she was recovering her upright posture. They had succeeded in getting her to pay off, and after a little, giving her tall stern to the gale, she went before it as upright as a church, the water on her decks pouring away overboard, the piercing fury of the wind robbed to the extent of the velocity with which the vessel drove, and no other sound rising up off the sea but the amazing hissing of foam. "'Curse or no curse,' said I, "'Vanderdecken knows his business as a sailor, and call me a Dutchman if here has not been a noble stroke of seamanship.' Faisinal verdomed, said the parrot. Chapter Forty of the Death Ship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE DEATH SHIP by William Clark Russell CHAPTER Forty, WE SPRING A LEAK I never remember the like of such a storm as this in these seas, though I have made passage of the Cape four times, and have met some frightful weather off the great Agullis Bank. Amazing suddenness and violence in the first bursting of a storm, you have reason to expect in the intertropical regions eastwards of the African continent, but not down here. Captain George Bonney, of the ship Elizabeth Tudor, is the only person that I am acquainted with who has had experience of so sudden a tempest as I have attempted to describe off this African headland. And who is to say that he had not happened upon the neighborhood of the death ship, and unwottingly tasted somewhat of the doom of that vessel? whose passage over the limits of her fate the storm the Elizabeth Tudor encountered was designed to furiously arrest. Be this as it will, I pass from the cabin into as raging and affrighting a scene as was ever witnessed in any ocean. The sky was made unearthly by the flashes of lightning, whose blinding leaps seemed to bring the blackness down like a wall upon the eyes and if ever an interval lasted long enough to suffer the light to resume its powers, then you found that blackness horrible with the unspeakable shade it took from the plain of boiling froth that stretched like a world covered with snow to the sea-girdle, fading from startling, staring, glaring whiteness around us into a pallid, ghastly dimness, where it sank and melted into the leaven-riven inky folds. I struggled on to the poop, and crawled on my hands and knees to the little deck-house, against the foremost end of which I stationed myself. And here I was protected from the rain and wind. Straight as an arrow over the seething smother the death-ship was running, and her keel slided smooth as a sledge through the feathery surface. The tempest lay like a red-hot iron sheet upon the waters, making it boil and furiously hiss but stifling all life of billow, eye of ripple even, out of it. The men had contrived to shorten sail down to the double-reefed forecourse, and under that strip of curved and lifted canvas, a steel-hard belly, black as a cloud against the white water beyond the bows, the ship was driving, three men at the great tiller, and others attending the tackles attached to it. With every blue or green or yellow flash, you saw the rain sweeping along in crystal lines, complexioned by the electric dartings, now like silver wire, now as if the heavens were shedding blood. Twas like a sea of water in the wind, and the shrill, harsh singing of it above, and the vehement sobbing of it above the decks, were sounds of themselves amid the universal shrieking and hissing. There was an incessant explosion of thunder, sometimes right overhead, the echoes answering in volleys, and the rattling sharper than the speaking of great guns in mountain scars and hollows. The dazzling play made a fiery tapestry of the scene, and the flying ship came and went in flames, leaping out of the black tempest, then vanishing like a burning shape 
eclipsed and revealed by the speeding of sooty vapors. Amid these fierce swift shinings I would catch sight of the towering form of Vanderdecken, standing at the mizzen-rigging, one hand on a shroud or backstay, sloping his figure against the tempest and his beard blown straight out before him. The others being abaft the little house I could not see. The sea now did indeed astonishingly realize the doubtful traditions which depicture the flying Dutchman, perpetually sailing amid storm. Since I had been on board, I had viewed her in many conditions of weather. But though her supernatural qualities and characteristics best appeared when they stole out to the faint, waving silver of the moonshine trembling along the oil-like blackness of a midnight calm, yet she could never be more impressive than when, as she was now, fleeing like a witch driven mad by pursuing demons, whose numbers darken the heavens, the lightning streaming about her like ordnance in titanic hands fired to bring her to, all her rigging in a scream as she ran, showing in the spaces of dusk betwixt the flashes a great, black, phantasmal shape upon the floor of ringing and frenzied whiteness, which the tempest swept along with her, and which broke out therefore in the lightest curl from her stem, nor yielded a hand's breadth of wake. She was flying dead into the east, and every minute her keel passed over as many fathoms of sea as would take her hours of plying to recover. I frequently directed my eyes at Vanderdecken, suspecting his wrath, and prepared for a tragical exhibition, whose furiousness should be in awful correspondence with this insanity of sea and sky. But had the life been struck out of him as he stood there, his posture could not have been more fixed and unmoving. It was, however, impossible for such wind as this to blow many minutes without raising a sea. The increased soaring and falling of the black wing of canvas forward, against the boiling that rose in a faintness of spume and luster of its own into the air, denoted the gradual hollowing of the water, and then no sooner had the talons of the storm succeeded in scooping shallow troughs out of the levelness of foaming snow than the surge grew magically. Every liquid side was shouldered by the tempest into hills, and the hills swelled into such mountains as you must come down into these seas to behold the like of. Half an hour after the first of the hurricane, the ship was plunging and lying along amid a very cauldron of infuriate waters, scarcely visible amid the fleecy fog of spray. Heights of the sea reaching to her tops, spouting their prodigious lengths alongside, sometimes tumbling in thunder upon her forward decks, sometimes curling in blown snakings ahead of her. Heavy as had been some of the hours of my first six days of storm, the wildest of that time was but as a feather to the weight of this tempest. The lightning ceased, and but for the evening that was now descending, and that had put the shadow of night into the shade of the storm, the heavens must have shown somewhat pale by the thinning of the electrical vapor. But this scarce perceptible clearance did but leave larger room for the wind, and it was now blowing with extraordinary spite. It would be impossible for the ship to run long before the swollen acclivities, whose foaming heads appeared to brush the black ceiling under which they coursed as they arched in the wake of the vessel's narrow stern and methought they would have to bring her to speedily, if she was not to be pooped and swept and smothered. Even whilst I thus considered, the tempestuous voice of Vanderdecken swept in a roar along the deck. "'Settle away the foreyard, and secure the sail! Some men aft here, to the mizzen, and show the foot of it as she rounds!' "'Twas more like the spiriting of canvas than the hands of men going prosaically to work on jeers and clue garnets, when the foreyard slowly slided down to the bulwark rails, and the sail was smothered as though frapped by airy fingers forked out of the whirling dusk. Some of the crew with glimmering faces came crawling aft, probing the solid substance of the wind with figures bowing sheer into it and all in silence the helm was put down amid a sudden mad flogging of liberated cloths aft, and the ship lying along gave her round bow and side to the seas, which flashed in storms of water over her as she met them to the pressure of the hard-over rudder. 
Once with the sea fair upon the bow, the ancient structure rose as buoyantly as a wooden castle to the heave of the mighty surge, for all her laboring with full decks and the veiling of her by clouds and storms of spray. But had her situation looked to be one of frightful and imminent peril, I must by this time have viewed it with unconcern. The sense of the curse that held the ship vital was strong in me. Out of the first terrific blast of the hurricane, twas odds if the newest and stoutest ship could have emerged without damage, supposing she had not been sunk outright. Yet did this vessel survive that fearful outfly, aged as she was. Not a yarn of her old ropes broken, not a spar nor yard, whose rottenness caused them to glow in the dark, sprung or strained. More staunchly that could have been possible to her, even in the hour of her launch, did she breast the great black seas which swept her to their mountain tops with yelling rigging and masts aslant to hurl her a breathless moment afterwards into stagnant valleys, echoing the thunder of the gale that touched not their depths. I quitted the deck and returned to Imogene in the cabin. The lighted lamp swung wildly, and though the uproar of the tempest was muffled below, yet the noise of straining was so great that I had to put my lips close to my dear girl's ear to make myself heard. I gave her a description of the sea, acquainted her with the posture in which the ship lay, and told her that the incredible violence of the storm was promise enough that it would not endure, though it was horrible to think of the miles we had been forced to run into the eastwards, and of the leagues off our course the drift of the ship, even in twelve hours, would compel us to measure. Prince came to inquire if we would eat. We answered no. That evening was the most dismal I had ever spent in the accursed ship. I held my sweetheart's hand, and speech being, as I have said, as good as impossible, I afflicted myself with a thousand miserable thoughts and dark and ugly fancies. Great heaven! With what loathing did I regard the sickly mask of the ship's side, the gloomy ovals, the ghastly revelry of the lantern's colors flashing to the prodigious swinging of the tempest-tossed fabric, and from time to time the parrot, affrighted by the noises and by the dashing of her cage against the bulkhead, burst suddenly out with her horrid croak of, "'Faisiai net verdomed!' Neither Vanderdecken nor his mate came below. Nothing could better have illustrated their ignorance of their true state than the anxieties which held them to the deck in the heart of that raging wind. Their solicitude might indeed deserve another name, for the impious passions which informed it, yet it had a character sailorly enough to make it intelligible to human sympathy, and was truly soul-subduing to sit in that cabin and hear the uproar of the tormented waters without the outcry in the rigging, the straining and groaning below, and think of those men, of Vanderdecken at all events, watching his ship as though Batavia were but six weeks distant, and Amsterdam a certain port presently. At half-past nine Imogene withdrew. I led her to her cabin door, tenderly kissed her, then, returning, called for a cup of spirits and water, and went to my sleeping-place. I thought to have stayed a minute on deck to look about me, but the wind came with so much fury of wet in it that, having no mind to turn in with drenched clothes, I hastily raised the hatch and dropped below. I believe I lay awake the greater part of the night. My memory is not clear owing to the confusion my brain was in. It was not only a feeling akin to conviction that my fate was sealed, that my dearest and I were never to be rescued, nor suffer to deliver ourselves from this death-ship, though, to be sure, such apprehensions, so keen and fierce, might have caused a stouter mind than mine to fall distraught. The movements of the ship were so excessive, being very high, light, and broad, and the sea so extraordinarily hollow, that, without disordering me with sickness, they wrought an alarming giddiness in me, and I lay as one in a sort of fit. In some condition as this I languished, I believe, through the greater part of the night, but contrived to snatch sleep enough to refresh me, so that when I awoke I felt better, the dizziness gone, and with it something of the distress of mind. 
the action of the ship showed that the gale was considerably abated, but I had no sooner my senses than I took notice of an unusual sound, like a slow and measured beating in the ship, as though some stout fellow with a heavy mallet regularly struck a hollow object in the hold. This excited my curiosity, and I went on deck. The moment my head was through the hatch I saw what produced the noise. The men were pumping. There was but one pump seemingly that would work, and this four seamen were plying, the water gushing freely from the pipe and washing away overboard through the scuppers. The old engine made so melancholy and uncommon a sound that I might have lain a week in my bed speculating upon it, without even hitting the truth. I took notice that the water came up clear and bright as glass, a sure sign that it was entering freely. A sullen shade still hung in the weather. The sky was of slate, with a small scud flying under it of the hue of sulphur, but the breeze was no more than a fresh gale of which we were making a fair wind. The yards braced very nearly square, and the brava sulkily swinging through it with the noise of boiling at her bows. I was not a little excited by this combination of glass-bright gushing and square yards, and after going forward for the comfort and sweetness of a canvas bucketful of salt water, foaming like champagne as I lifted it out of the snow-flaked dark green surge, I walked on to the poop, where stood Aaron's alone, and stepped up to the binnacle. The card made a west-northwest course, the wind on the larboard quarter. I ran my eye over the sea, but the olive-complexioned hue worked with a sulky sinuosity naked against the livid shadow, and the deep looked indescribably gloomy and swollen and confused, though the sun had been risen above half an hour. Arents was not a man I held in awe, albeit many might have deemed his unearthly pallor more dreadful than most of the others because of the great breadth of fat and hairless face it overlay. Yet I was determined not to question him lest he should repulse me. I therefore contented myself with a short salute and lay over the rail watching the swollen bodies of water and wondering what plan Vanderdecken was now upon, until the chimes of the clock in the cabin made me know it was breakfast time. The captain came to the table with a stern and bitter expression in his countenance. It was possible he had been on deck throughout the greater part of the night, but he exhibited no trace of the fatigue you would expect to see in one that was of this earth. Methought, as I glanced at him, that sleep must be a mockery to these men, who, being deathless, stood in no need of that repose which counterfeiting death reinvigorates our perishable frame every morning with a quickening as of a resurrection. What has one to whom the grave is denied to do with slumber? Yet if a whiter pallor was possible in Vanderdecken, I fancied I witnessed it in him now. His eyes were angry and bright. The skin of his forehead lay in folds upon his heavy brows. And yet there was the stillness of a vitality, numbed or blasted by disappointment, or exhausted by passion in his manner. Van Vogelaar did not arrive. Maybe he was sleeping, with Aaron's leave well into his watch on deck. Imogene had a wan and drooping look. She answered my concerned gaze by saying she had not slept, and she smiled as she spoke, but never more sadly to my knowledge. It seemed but as a light playing over and revealing her melancholy. Lovely she appeared, but too fragile for my peace, and with too much of the sorrowful sweetness of the moonily when it hangs down its white beauty and contracts its milky petals into leanness with the waning of the silver orb it takes its name from. Suddenly she pricked her ears. "'What is that sound?' she exclaimed in English. "'It is the seaman pumping the water out of the ship,' I replied. "'Strange,' she said. "'Long before dawn I heard it indistinctly, and have ever since been listening to it with a languid, drowsy wonder, not imagining its nature. It has been working continuously. Is there water in the ship?' "'I have not dared inquire,' I answered, with a sidelong look at Vanderdecken, who ate mechanically without heeding us. "'Captain,' 
she said softly, touching him on the arm with her hand, which glittered with his jewels. The men have been pumping for some hours. Why? Will you tell me? He brought his eyes slowly to hers with a blank look that caused her to repeat her question. Whereupon he answered, The heavy working of the ship in the small hours has caused her to start a butt or hidden end. She's leaking? He answered, Yes, my child. Can the leak be stopped? she asked, encouraged to these questions by my glances. No, tis below her waterline. But it does not gain. Continuous pumping keeps the water level. We shall have to careen to get at the leak.' 